Hello and welcome to the course on Artificial Intelligence A to Z. My name is Kirill Romeko and on behalf of Adlan de Pontevest, the co-instructor on this course, uh, I'd like to welcome you into this amazing adventure that we're about to start. And what's up with this timer? Well, the reason for this timer is this is my third time recording this tutorial and I get so excited about these things and it just goes over, like blows over 10 minutes or 20 minutes. So I decided to limit myself to five minutes to get you excited about this course and why it's the best time to be in AI. So let's dive into it. We've got four and a half minutes left. Why AI? Well, we've all heard about applications of artificial intelligence that are popping up around us. Self-driving cars, medicine, heavy machinery, customer service, the list just keeps going on and on and on. But why right now? Why not 10 years ago or not 10 years later? Well, the answer is hidden in this curve, which is called Moore's Law. It was originally uh, identified in 1965 by Gordon Moore. And what it says is that the power of the average computer, in, like in very simple terms, the power of the average computer that you can buy for $1,000 will double every 18 to 24 months. And that's been, as you can see, that's the law has held constant through good times and bad, war and peace, and the recession, depressions. Uh, nothing stops this curve. And uh, we've already surpassed the brain of an insect for an average computer that you can buy for a thousand bucks. We're uh, sitting at about the speed, uh, the processing power of the brain of a rat. By 2025, we'll be at the brain of a human. As you can see, it's exponentially growing. And so this is a great time to be an artificial intelligence. It's just going to be doubling. The power is going to be doubling every time. All right, three minutes. So what uh, some of my favorite examples are uh, related to games like chess and go so in 1997 deep mind was the first computer to beat gary kasparov in chess uh, it was a huge thing it was like one of the most uh broadcasted chess games on the planet ever and at the same time and so that was like and considered an impossible feat right now on any phone you can install an app with chess which no human player will ever beat because uh, computers are that good now you just cannot beat a computer in chess if you put on the hardest setting uh, and then just recently in March 2016, uh, a computer won against the 18 world times champion, 18 world champion of the game of Go, uh, Lee Sidol. Again, considered an impossible feat, even at the start of the match, it was considered to, hap to be impossible that it's only going to happen 10 years from then, but it happened. And uh, by the way, uh, if you'd like to find out a bit more about the game of Go, uh, it's very, very exciting, very interesting. It's uh, got 40 million players, 3,000 year old game, very popular in China, Japan, and Korea, and it's much more complex than chess. So, just uh, there's many more possible combinations. So, again, something that was considered impossible is happening, and it's happening now and much earlier than it's time. So, how are we going for time? One minute, 52 seconds. So, that's what you'll see from this course. You'll see that we're using games to train AI. Why are we doing that? Because games are a confined environment where we can, if we can beat a game using an artificial intelligence, then we can use the same principles to apply to business. And that's the exact same thing that the team at Google DeepMind who created AlphaGo, who won against the Doll, that's exactly what they did. They applied artificial intelligence to uh, a Google's warehouse to control the air cooling and what they found is this is the electricity bill, uh, electricity consumption. You can see like it's going like this. As soon as they switch on the AI, bam, goes down. And then they switch it back off, goes up. They were able to save 40% on their electricity bill. And I have one minute left. 40%. So you can find the full article on the DeepMind blog. That is insane. Imagine that for a company of Google scale, who, which has millions and millions of servers. So there you go. That's, that's your connection between applying artificial intelligence in games and applying it to business, very, very closely related. And that's what you will be able to do after this course. And finally, uh, one of my favorite blogs, waitbutwhy.com. Check it out, amazing blog by Tim Urban. This is how he describes the situation we're in. This is us and technological progress. We're sitting here, this is what it looks like. It looks very, very linear, but because it's an exponential, Boom, this is what's going to happen in the next years. And there's very strong evidence from the things we're seeing to suggest that we're sitting right over here on the kink of the curve. And that, my friends, in short, is why it's so exciting to be alive right now, why it's so exciting to be and get into and be in the space of artificial intelligence, because the power you'll have, the applications that you will be able to create,
create or the ways you'll be able to apply it is going to be intense and insane. And I can't wait to see you on the first tutorial of this course. Let's get this started. Hi guys, welcome back to the artificial intelligence course. We're going to implement our AI solution in Spider Anaconda, which is an ID that I highly recommend because it's like a studio. You'll have your editor where you implement your code. You have the console to execute your code and some other features like a way to easily look at all your variables that you create during your implementation. So therefore, please all go to Google. And if you don't have Anaconda yet, let's download it. So you just type here Anaconda, just like this. And here we go. You can take the second link, download Anaconda. And now, depending on your system, make sure to choose the right system here. I think it should automatically be detected. If you're on Windows, click here. If you're on Mac, click here. And if you're on Linux, click here. I'm on Mac, so all good. And now make sure to download Python 3.6. So make sure to click this download button for Python 3.6. And now the download just started is right here, 40 seconds on my computer. Here you have the option to get a cheat sheet. You can say no thanks, you can close this. We won't need it for our implementations. All right, so I'll accelerate until the download is over. All right, here we go, download over. So now let's go to our download folder, which is right here. And here is the file that I just downloaded. And so this is the installation file that will install Anaconda. So you just double click on it. Then you click continue, 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 agree and install. And this will install Anaconda. It will just take a few minutes, maybe less and you'll get Anaconda, you'll get the Spider Studio on which we will implement our AI solutions. So again, I'll accelerate until the end. Perfect, the installation is over. You don't have to install Microsoft VS Code, so you can just click continue here. And here we go, let's just close it. You can choose keep it or move it to the trash. And now we have Anaconda. So I'm on a Mac here, so the way to get Anaconda is just go to applications and then double click on Anaconda Navigator. And for Windows users, you'll find Anaconda in your list of programs, you know, by clicking the Windows button and then find Anaconda here, or you can just type Anaconda in the research bar. And again, you have to open Anaconda Navigator. And for Linux users, same, you'll find Anaconda Navigator in your list of programs or applications. Well, I'm sure you'll find that very easily. So let's double click on that. This will open Anaconda and inside Anaconda we'll find several IDEs and we'll choose Spider. Here we go. So we are inside Anaconda and indeed there are several IDEs including Jupyter Notebook which is a very good one and of course Spider which is the one we'll choose for this course as in fact any other of our courses. So to open Spider we just need to click launch and here we go this will launch spider and that is exactly where we're going to implement our ai solution hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence today we're going to discuss the plan of attack for this section we're talking about q learning and we've got quite a few tutorials so i think it's a good idea for us to quickly go through them to understand what uh, to expect in the upcoming videos so here we go all right, what we will learn in this section. First things first, we will talk about what reinforcement learning actually is and what the philosophy behind reinforcement learning is and how reinforcement learning actually can be seen in real life and how it relates uh, to things that we observe in real life or actually things that we do ourselves. Then we'll talk about the Bellman equation, a very fundamental concept underpinning everything or a lot of things that are happening in reinforcement learning, especially in the space of Q-learning and what we're going to be discussing in this section of the course and in the following sections. Then we'll talk about the plan and the plan that an artificial intelligence comes up with in order to navigate inside an environment. And we'll see what uh, that, how that comes to, together. A very quick uh, but quite interesting tutorial. Then we'll talk about market decision processes, a new concept. We're going to introduce 
a very new concept, uh, which will slowly even add a bit, an, an extra layer of sophistication to our Bellman equation, to our whole reinforcement learning, to our Q learning concepts. And that's the way this section is structured, that we introduce the Bellman equation in a very simplistic form, and then slowly uh, throughout uh, the tutorials, we add uh, layers of sophistication to it in order to get to the final version that is our designated destination in terms of Q learning. But we'll get there slowly in order for us to have enough time to process all of the information and let it settle in. And Markov decision processes is an extra layer of sophistication on top of what we've already discussed or what we will have already discussed by then. Then we'll talk about policies versus plans. Another interesting tutorial. They're all interesting. Just another quick tutorial uh, on how policies different from plans and what the differences there are. And these are terms that you will probably hear or read in other literature if you're going to be delving into it to get additional information on reinforcement learning. Then we'll talk about adding a living penalty uh, to our environments. And uh, that's that's kind of another way of adding complexity into the environments that our agents are going to be operating in. Then we'll talk about the intuition behind Q learning. So up until that tutorial, we're going to be talking values of states. And then finally, we're going to switch to talking about values of actions or Q values. And then we're going to introduce the temporal difference. So this is the tutorial where everything that we've learned is going to come together to explain how exactly do agents or artificial, how does artificial intelligence learn? How does it update its values throughout the iterative process that it's going through? And then finally, we're going to look at a visualization of key learning. So we're going to take everything we learned and we're going to look at it happen in front of our eyes and watch an artificial intelligence actually perform key learning and do all of the things that we're going to discuss on an intuitive level is going to actually do in practice. And uh, that will help us even further grasp that knowledge that we're going to be covering off in this section. So hopefully you're very excited about these upcoming tutorials. I definitely am. And there's some very interesting slides coming up. And more importantly, the concepts themselves are very, very interesting. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy them quite a lot. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. I hope you're excited about today's tutorial because we are taking our very first step into the world of AI and today we're talking about reinforcement learning. It's a very important tutorial because it will underpin everything else that's going to be happening in this course. So let's get started. Here we've got a little maze and this maze is our representation of an environment and that's what we're going to be dealing with in this course, we're going to be dealing with certain environments in which our artificial intelligence is going to be performing, is going to be taking actions, is going to be looking to beat these environments, going to be looking to win in these environments. And here we've got an agent. The agent is our artificial intelligence. That's the person or that's the mind that's going to be navigating these environments and learning from the feedback that the environments are going to be giving it in order to perform certain actions. And so the way it works is the agent performs certain actions in this environment, and as a result, the state in which it is in will change. So it might be further or closer or more to the left, more to the right. It might have a certain other, other parameters that describe its state, and those parameters are going to change. So the state is going to change because of the action it takes, and it will also get rewards based on the action. So every time it takes an action, the state will change and it'll get reward. Now, bear in mind, sometimes it might happen that it won't change the state, the action won't change the state, or there won't be a reward for taking that action in that certain state it was in. But nevertheless, the agent is going to keep doing that, it's going to be taking actions, changing the state, getting rewards, changing action, taking actions, changing the state, and getting rewards. And by doing that process, it's going to be learning about the environment. It's going to be exploring the environment, understanding what actions lead to good rewards and favorable states and what actions lead to bad rewards and unfavorable states. And this is a very simplistic representation of a very global problem. So if you think about it, environments actually don't have to be just mazes. It's not just about getting out of a maze or finding a treasure in a maze. An environment can be pretty much anything in life. So imagine you waking up in the morning and cooking an omelet. So in order to make that omelet, you 
need to go through certain steps. You need to get the salt, get the eggs, get the frying pan, switch the fire on and so on. And it does sound like a routine mundane thing, but it's become routine because you've done it so many times. But in reality, it's an environment where you're performing certain actions. You're taking, the, you're putting the fire on, you're putting the frying pan on the fire, you're putting all the eggs into the frying pan and you're putting some salt on the eggs and you're turning them over and so on. So as you can see, there are certain actions actions which you're taking in certain states and those actions lead to certain other states and sometimes rewards so for instance when you put the fire on and you wait 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 you're taking the action of wait 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 too long and then you put the eggs in into the frying pan the reward is going to be very negative it's all going to burn on the other hand if you do all the all the correct actions in the correct times so it's also very important to understand that actions should be taken at the correct points in time so for instance, putting the salt in the frying pan before you put the eggs in might not be the best idea. You might want to take that action of putting the salt into the frying pan after the eggs are in there, so in the in a different state. So it's important to remember that. And at the same time, so if you take all the correct actions in the correct order, in the correct states, your final reward could be that you get an omelet which you can eat. And so that's a very basic activity in your life. But if you think about it, it is actually an environment and you are the agent going through this environment and performing tasks. You don't really need to learn anything because you already know it pretty well. But at the same time, you could learn. Maybe you could learn how to make a better omelet. Or especially if you're, it's your first omelet that you're making, you're probably going to screw it up, but you will learn from that because you will understand what actions lead towards states and rewards. And anything else in life, um, for instance, even trading on the stock market and you know, buying and selling and getting certain feedback from the market in the sense of uh, return, positive or negative returns, that's also an environment. And that's you participating in that environment as an agent. Driving a car is also an environment where you can turn the steering wheel, you can accelerate, you can brake and so on, and you're getting feedback from the environment. And you know, one of those feedbacks is a policeman giving you a, a speeding fine if you're going above the acceptable or allowed speed limit on that highway. And therefore, from there, you learn that, okay, that's not something that should be done because it leads to a negative reward. So rewards don't have to be just at the very end of the process. They can be throughout the journey, throughout the process. So those are a couple of examples. And in terms of AI, the simplest way to think of reinforcement learning is like training a dog. When you train a dog, you t give it certain commands. And if it obeys those commands, then you give it a treat. You give it like a biscuit or something. If it doesn't obey those commands, you tell it that it's a bad dog or you just don't give it a treat. And through that process, it learns what certain commands or what, what it needs to do, what action it needs to take in certain states. And the states are the commands that you're giving it. And based on that, it will get some certain rewards. Of course, in the world of AI, it's not uh, that complex. You don't have to give the AI treats. You don't have to have like a bag of biscuits with you every time. You just give it a plus one or a minus one. So it's a huge advantage that in the world of AI, we've created these AIs ourselves. So the rewards that we're giving them if you think about it, this is really cool. If the rewards you're giving them, they don't actually exist. There's just a plus or a minus one or a, a plus, a, a one or a zero or something like that. So it's all non-existent. It's all imaginary stuff. But at the same time, it leads to great results. We can create these amazing things, these amazing artificial intelligences by this amazing artificial intelligence by just providing rewards which don't really exist, the plus and minus one. It doesn't cost us anything, but at the same time, it leads to results. So... Very similar to real world and, you know, that the example of dogs, but here the rewards are digital and um, just numbers. And with that in mind, we can talk about a little bit about robot dogs. I love this example. So this is just a random picture. It's not necessarily that exact robot dog, you know, that uh, is trained through reinforcement learning. Some robot dogs, especially the older ones, you'd have an algorithm in there. And this is a this is actually a good example of the difference between pre-programmed agents and reinforcement learning agents. So you could have a robot dog which is pre-programmed to how to walk. It will say so in the in the algorithm behind the dog in the software it will say okay so in order to walk you need to move your left leg forward, left front leg forward, then your back right leg forward, then your front right leg forward, then your back left leg forward, and repeat that action. And you know that's that's a definition of walking. It's a function inside this dog. And then it might have um, you know how to sit, how to stand, and things like that. Whereas in a robot dog that is trained through reinforcement learning. 
what happens is you don't pre-program it. This is the key concept to everything here, that you don't have any algorithm inside that is hard-coded into the dog. Instead, you have what we'll be discussing in the future. You have this reinforcement learning algorithm, which is told that, okay, so the goal is from to get from where you are now, not knowing anything, to that to the end of the room, for example. And here are the certain actions you can take. You can move your right foot, you can move your left foot, you can move your right back foot, you light or left back foot. So here are all the degrees of freedom that you can do. You can move them like this, you can move them like that. So it's like a list of actions you can take. And uh, your rewards are every time you take a step forward, you get a plus one. Every time you fall over, you get a minus one. And that's all there is to it. And then they just leave the dog and let it figure it out on its own. So the dog tries to stand up, it falls, and it it realizes that, okay, I shouldn't do that action that led to me falling because every time I fall, I get a minus one, which is not good for me. Then, so it does the other action that helped it stand up. And then it, it figures out, it just experiments, 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 tries things randomly, and then figures out that it can make a step forward by moving its right front foot. And then, and it gets a plus one and it realizes, oh, I should do more of that. Okay, cool. So it now learns that it should do more of this and less of that. And through this learning process, it quickly, very quickly understands how it can walk. And those, those dogs that figure it out on their own can actually sometimes walk better than dogs that are pre-programmed. Because when we pre-program things, we look at the real live dogs and, or, you know, we use our own imagination how to do it. Whereas a reinforcement learning dog, can optimize things on its own. And because it's an AI, sometimes it can get even better results. And that's how they can train these robot dogs, these same robot dogs to play soccer. You can't train a normal dog to play soccer because, you know, simply the whole approach is different and it's not something that, that, you know, probably a normal dog has been trained to do or has ever done in its process of its evolution. Whereas reinforcement learning robot dogs can very easily understand how to play soccer as long as you tell them what the rewards are, what the goals are, what the possible actions they can take are. So that is how reinforcement learning works in general. That's a quick overview of reinforcement learning. I hope that got you very excited about what's going to come next because it's a completely different world compared to pre-programmed solutions or hard program, hard-coded solutions where you have the if-else conditions. This is very different and we're going to be talking more about that. In the meantime, uh, we've got some additional reading for you. So if you'd like to have some supporting materials, here's a great article which you can look in, look into. It's called Simple Reinforcement Learning with TensorFlow. It's got 10 parts. The link is here and you'll find the full the clickable link on in the course resources. Is by Arthur Giuliani. It's a 2016 article. And you can follow along this course and also get additional information from that article. But bear in mind that that article is with TensorFlow, whereas in this course we are using PyTorch. So a different implementation, but implementations, but at the same time you might pick up a few things here and there that might supplement your learning uh, that we're going to be doing in this course. So great article to follow, even if you're not considering following it for sure, just still just in case, check out that that first part and see if you like it, see if you would like to read it a bit more. And then we've got a specific to this tutorial about reinforcement learning. There's a paper by Richard Sutton, which is called Reinforcement Learning One Introduction. It's a 1998 paper, so quite old, uh, but it's at the same time, uh, you can learn a bit about reinforcement learning, uh, some of the examples like that omelet example and other examples of where reinforcement learning can be applied. And just a general overview of reinforcement learning if you are looking for some additional reading. And on that note, uh, we're going to wrap up this tutorial. Can't wait to see you next time. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. Today we're going to talk about the Bellman equation. It's quite a complex topic and we're going to introduce it in a step-by-step manner throughout this whole section of the course. So we're not going to just jump straight into the most complex version of the Bellman equation right away, but instead we're going to introduce it slowly in order to gradually understand how it works. And uh, I hope you're cool with that approach. If you are, if you are, let's get straight into it. So we're going to have a couple of key concepts that we're going to be operating with. And these concepts are... S stands for state, so the state in which our agent is or any other possible state in which it can be. A represents an action that 
a an agent can take. So an agent can have access to a certain list of actions, and actions are very important when they're looked at in a state combination. So when you're in a certain state, and then you look at actions, then it starts to make sense what's going to be the result of those actions. Because if you look at an action by itself without a state, it doesn't really make sense because you don't know where you are and where you can possibly end up in. Then we have, we'll have R, which stands for reward, and that's the reward the agent gets for entering into a certain state. And gamma is the discount factor. And we'll talk about the discount factor in a second. It all makes sense just now. But let's just take a note, make a mental note that we are going to have this letter gamma that we'll be operating with later on. So the person behind the Bellman equation is Richard Ernest Bellman. He was a applied mathematician and came up with the concept of dynamic programming, which we are now, which we now call reinforcement learning, or which we call uh, the Bellman equation. Now, in uh, well, that's what we call it now. And in 1953, he came up with that concept, and that's when the Bellman, Bellman equation came to be. So let's have a look at how this all works. There's our lovely agent in the bottom left corner, and he is in a maze. And this is quite a classical maze where you've got some blocks. The white blocks are blocks in which the agent can step into. The gray block is the one one that is just not accessible. So that's like a wall in this maze. The green is where the agent is should be aiming to end up in. That's where we want the agent to go. That's the finish. And the red is a fire pit. So if the agent falls into the fire pit, he will lose the game. So in the fire pit, the reward, which is R, is minus one. So that's our way of telling the agent that's not something we want you to do. Like remember an example of when we're training dogs, we want to tell them like bad dog if, we, if it's not doing the right thing that we want it to do. Same thing here. We want to tell the agent that this is not something you should be doing. You shouldn't be ending up in the square. So every time it does end up in the square, it'll get a, a minus one reward. So it will be punished with a minus one reward. On the other hand, if it ends up in the green square, it'll get a plus one reward, meaning that that is what we want it to do. So those are the two rewards that the agent can possibly get. And how does it learn how to operate in this maze? Just like in that example of the robot dogs that learn to walk, we're just going to let it know. We'll just tell it that here are the actions you can do. You can go up right, left, or down. Those are the four possible actions that you can take. And that's it. Have have a play around with that. See what you can come up to, with. So the agent might go to the right. Then they might go to more to the right. They might go back to the left. They're just randomly pressing these buttons and, and they're trying to see what happens. Then they go back here. They go up, go up, go down, go up, go right. So for now, they haven't learned anything. They just so far, nothing has happened. They go right and then bam, they end up in the green square. So they realize wow, I just got a plus one reward. So as soon as they stepped into the green square, they got a plus one reward. And that triggers the algorithm to say, okay, that's really cool. Um, I am rewarded for ending up in this square. So I want to end up in this square. So what does that mean for the agent? That means it starts asking the question, how did I get to this square? What, what was the preceding state I was in and what action did I take to get into this square? And then it looks back and it says, okay, so... The preceding state was this one. It turns out to be valuable in that state, the one that's marked with the red arrow, because from that state, you're, I'm, I'm just one step away from getting the maximum reward I can possibly dream of, of plus one, like a biscuit for a dog. From as soon as I know, if I ever am in that state, that square marked with the red arrow, all I'll have to do is press right. So how do I tell myself, how do I remember that that state is valuable? Well, to me, there's no difference, actually, as the agent, there's no difference in whether I am in the green square or in the white square, right? In the green square, I get the reward of one. So I'm going to mark for myself that the white square is got the, for me, it has the value of one because it leads exactly to reward one. So as soon as I'm in the white square, I know I'll just take one more action, I'll be in the green square, and I'll get a reward of one. So that's why I'm going to say that the value of this square is equal to one because it leads directly without any sort of uh, subtractions. As soon as I'm in here, I know my reward will be one. So I'm going to mark this square as V equal to one. That's the value. That's the perceived value of being in this state. Next, uh, the agent's going to be like, okay, so how did I get into this square? And, you know, he might walk around again and so on, end up in this square again and, and be like, okay, how did I get into this square before that? And the way I got into this square was from this square. Interesting. Okay, so as soon as I get into this square, I know that all I have to do is go right 
And then from here, I already know that I'm going to win. I know exactly how everything is going to unravel from here. And I know the value of being in this state is equal to one. And since there's no, nothing is stopping me from growing here, from here to here, the value in this is going to perceived value. I'm going to value being in here as V equal to one as well. Because as soon as I'm in here, I know I'll be here and I'll be here pretty quickly. So I'm going to win. And then how do I get into this square before that? Well, I got into this square from this square. So the value, a similar approach, the value of being here is also equal to one and so on. So the value of being here is equal to one and the value of being here is equal to one because each one of them leads to the next one and leads to the finish line. So that's all like pretty logical at this stage. This is us pretty much designing the Bellman equation right now. So this is we could possibly think about designing an equation that helps an agent go through the maze. So look at the reward, then the preceding state, give it a value of equal to reward, the preceding state, and so on. So it kind of like creates this pathway. It's all great and well, but the problem here is, okay, what happens if our agent, for some reason, starts in this state? Instead of starting here and taking these actions, and but it actually starts in this state. How does it know how does it remember which action to take? Should it go right or should it go down? Or should it maybe go left or should it go up? How does it remember which is the next continuation from here? If the only values it has is these values of equal to one. So it, can't, it cannot see what's further away. It can only see, all right, what I have here and what I have here. How does it know which way to go? Well, at this stage, it doesn't. It's, uh, it's pretty identical for the agent, which way to go. And so that's why this approach doesn't really work. Uh, it's a very it's a very simplistic explanation. Of course, there's much more to it, but in an intuitive way, that's why we kind of just assign, just carry on this value backwards like that, because one of the reasons is once um, the agent is in between these two values, which, where is it going to go? It doesn't. It can get confused like that. And so, how do we solve this problem? What are we going to do here? And this is where we're going to start introducing the Bellman equation in its actual form, slowly, step by step. So the Bellman equation looks something like this. So we've already talked about V, the value of being in a certain state. S is your current state or any given state. And there is S as well. And S prime is the state, the following state, the state that you will end up in after this state and by taking a certain action. But we know that there's many actions that a agent can take. And that's why we've got this max over here. So by taking an action, what will happen to an agent? So let's say we're in state S. By taking an action in state S and we take action A, what will happen is we'll instantly get a reward by getting into a new state. And remember that reward can be one or plus one or minus one if it's at the end of the game. Or it can be a zero if it's throughout the game. In this case, our reward throughout the game is zero. So that that's the reward. plus we will get into a new state which has value of uh, S uh, prime. So that's the, the value of the new state. And gamma, we'll talk about gamma in a second. But the point I'm trying to raise here, or the point I'm raising here is that we've got many different actions that we can take. And that's why we've got the maximum. So by taking an action, we get a reward, plus we end up in a new state. And so for every out of the, in our case, we have four possible actions. For every one of the possible four actions, we're going to have a equation like this. So this is going to have a value for, they will have a different value for every one of the four actions. And we're going to look at only the maximum because of course the agent wants to take the optimal state. So if he's in state S, he's going to look at these values. He's going to look, find the maximum based on the action and going to take that action that leads to the maximum of these values. So hopefully that uh, makes sense why we're taking the maximum here. Then once we've got the reward and the value of the state, why do we have this gamma parameter here? Well, it's there exactly to solve that problem of where the agent doesn't know which way to go because it cannot, uh, it's comparing the values of two states on the on both sides and they're the same. So that's why the gamma is called the discounting factor. So we're going to have a look at that in practice now to better understand it. So let's take our formula. We'll put it here on the top right. And now we will analyze what the values of the different states are. And every state here is a square now made. So one of these, any one of these white squares is a state and we were going to calculate the value of being in that state. So let's start with this square. What is the value of being in this state? Well, we need to take the maximum of this value across all actions. And we know that this value represents, is maximized as we get closer to the finish line. That's how it's constructed. And by just by looking at it, you can see because here it's got the reward and here it's got a discounting factor multiplied by the value of the next state. 
And it just makes sense that that's how we would construct that equation. So it makes sense that from here, the maximum of this value will be if we move to the right. So that's how we calculate the value of the state. This value of this state is equals the maximum or equals to this value if we move to the right, if we take an action of moving to the right. So what will this value be? Well, the reward of moving to the right is equal to one. And regardless of what gamma, gamma is, we don't have a value in the state because we are already in the best state possible. So this is the final state. It won't have a value. We just get a reward here and that's the end of the game. So the value will be of this maximum will be equal to one. And that's why value of state S here is equal to one. Now things get interesting when we move to the left, when we move backwards a bit. So now let's calculate the value of this, of being in this state. And for that, we're going to need gamma. So let's say our discounting factor is a 0.9. And it'll make sense what a discounting factor is once we calculate this. So from here, just based on our intuition and based because we know how this maze is working, how this maze works, we know that the best possible action is go to the right because from here we go here. So that means a maximum will be achieved when in this state you go to the right. And so let's see what happens if we plug it in here. So if you go from here to here, you don't get any reward, it'll still be a zero, but then you'll get gamma, so you get 0 0.9 times the value of the new state, which is one. So in this case, the value, the whole result of this is one times zero, uh, 0 0.9 times one equals 0 0.9. So that's our value 0 0.9. So if we calculate this now, you'll see that from here, we know just by looking at the maze, we know because we as humans, because we're understanding how this equation works, of course, an, uh, an AI, the agent would have to experiment with these things. But because we have like a crystal ball, we can see this whole maze. We have like the bird's eye view right now. We know that the best action is go to, to go to the right. So if we plug it all in here, it'll be zero, no reward, plus 0 0.9 times the value in this state, 0 0.9 is 0 0.81 and so on. So here it'll be 0 0.73 and here will be 0 0.66. So you can see that the way the discounted factor works is it discounts the value of the state as you are further away. So if you're familiar with finance theory, then it's something similar to time value of money. Like, what would you think about it this way? What would you prefer to have $5 today or $5 in 10 days from now? Just if somebody was to give you a choice, I will give you $5 today or I'll give you $5 10 days from now. Well, of course, you would choose $5 today. Why is that? Well, because you can take those $5 and you can invest them at a certain interest rate, which is very similar to gamma. And your $5 in 10 days will actually grow into uh, maybe $5.73 or something like that. And that's how time value of money works and very similar he uh, concept here. And the, the important thing to understand here, this is just a theory, a way that reinforcement learning works. So Richard Bellman came up with this equation and from then, now that's how we use it. So, so you could go ahead and come up with a different equation. It doesn't have to have gamma. It might have some other factor. It might not even have a factor. But this approach works and that's why we're using it. And this, this is what it visually looks like. So the further away you are, the less value of this being in this state. And in terms of time value of money, if I could say to you, where would you rather be? Would you rather be here? Or would you rather be here? You would say, I would rather be here. So we're creating that whole, that same phenomenon as in time value of money. We're artificially creating it through gamma so that in order to incentivize agents or inspire agents to be closer to the finish line. So if an agent were to be asked, would you rather be here or here? Because of the way this equation works, it would choose to be here. There's nothing more to that, nothing less. It's not something that the world works this way. No, it's just something that we're artificially creating in order for our agents to understand that this is this is good, this is good, this is good. They're all good, but this one is better than this one, and this one is better than this one, and this one is better than this one. And that way, you can see the old agent can see in which direction it needs to go. So it can see that if I'm standing here, remember that problem that we had, or was he standing here? Yeah, so if he's standing here, do I go down or, or like if I'm standing here, do I go up or do I go down? Well, now there's no, it's not a problem anymore because you can see that it's actually better to go up because the value is bigger here. And then from here, it's better to go right because the value is bigger here than here. And then from here, it's better to go right because the value here is bigger than here and then here. And then from here, he already knows that he needs to go right because he'll get a reward here of one. So that's how this uh, whole approach works. Now let's have a quick look at the rest of the square. So how do we calculate the value in this square? Well, here is where things get a bit tricky. So from here, you might not actually go left, 
right? You might actually go right. So we can't just keep going like that because it might actually be shorter to go this way. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the value in this square first. And because obviously from here, the best way is to go is up. Again, that's because we see the crew, we have the crystal ball, we can see things. And you'll see further down in this section, you'll see how the agent actually explores this, understands this on their, like through experimentation. But for us, we know that it's better to go this way. So we're going to calculate the value here. And that's why we're going to calculate the value in this square first. So here we have three possible actions. In reality, we actually have four. We can also go left. The agent could hypothetically press left and bump into the wall and stay here. But for simplicity's sake, we're just going to uh, show the actions that we, knowing what we know and having the crystal ball, we know which actions are the ones actually to lead, lead to something other than the same state again. And so here, from here, we know that the, again, just because we have a crystal ball, we know that the best way to go is this way. An agent, of course, would have to experiment and find the best way. And you will see how that happens further down in the section. You'll see actually how an agent walks around and how you would experiment trying to find these values. But for us, we know it's that way. So here, if we plug everything in, one, so the maximum, the best output is when you go up, here's a one, 0 0.9, zero. So you put plug that in, you get 0 0.9. Okay, so we calculate that one. Let's calculate this one. Same approach. This is, uh, you have three ways you can go. Actually four for the agent, but for us, we can see it's only three. So 0 0.81. From here, you have 0 0.73. And it actually ties in nicely with this value because then you, if you discount again, you get 0 0.66. And here you have 0 0.73 because this is the optimal route. So there you go. That is the values of all of these states. And now you can see that because we've created this equation and we've created synthetically this whole concept of the closer you are to the finish line, the more valuable that state is. Now, because we've created that, now it's pretty obvious for the agent which way it should go. And we'll talk more about that in the coming tutorials. I hope you enjoyed uh, today's uh, session. And I know it's a bit, it might be a, sound a bit very basic at this stage, but as we go through this section, we will add a bit more complexity to it. At the same time, if you cannot wait, if you want to jump into it, then there's a paper which you can look at. And it is the original paper by Richard Bellman. It's called The Theory of Dynamic Programming from 1954. And you can find it at this link. And uh, there you go. So you can jump straight into it and read from the author of the Bellman equation. But uh, just bear in mind that this is quite a mathematically heavy paper. And on that note, I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. So we've talked about the Bellman equation and we've analyzed our little maze. Let's have a look at the plan. What is the plan? Well, here is our maze analysis, and we know that we can see, actually, the states, the values of each state. We can see what the value of being in every single state is, and therefore, the AI can, or the agent can navigate this maze. So what is the plan? Well, the plan is simply like a treasure map for the artificial intelligence. Uh, instead of looking at these values, let's just replace them with arrows, which indicate in which direction the agent should go because of those because it knows those values. So an ideal scenario after it's, it's explored this environment, it knows the values of being in each state and therefore it can come up with this map. So let's have a look again. We know the, that here value is one. So if you are here, out of the two, the better one is this one. So you go right. out of From here, out of the two, this one's a better one. This one's a better one. This one's a better one. Or actually from here, you have two options, right? So here is kind of like a tie, so you just pick one at random. Doesn't matter which one because you the value in these in either case is the same, and more so even if we look through, it'll take the same amount of steps, same number of steps to get to the end. From here, you've got three options, but this one is the better value. From here, this one is a better value. From here, obviously, this one's a better value because here the you know you just get a minus one reward right away. Uh, and here, from here, you have like three actually. So, but this one is the best one out of them, best value of the state. And so, therefore, if we replace them with arrows, it makes sense that this is how the agent would go. If it starts here, or if some, for some reason it ends up in this square, it knows how to get out of here. It starts in this square, it knows how to get out of here, and so on. So that is what a plan is. And don't confuse plan with policy, because we're going to be talking about policies further on. Policies are very similar to plans, but they have a little trick to them, because the environment is going to be a bit different it's going to be stochastic. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next tutorial. So I can't wait to see you. 
on the next one. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. And today we're talking about Markov decision processes or MDPs. Let's have a look what we've got today. So last time we stopped on the concept of a map. So because we've calculated the values based on the Bellman equation, we can derive this map for our agent of this maze. And basically what that means is wherever the agent starts, so let's say it starts over there, it knows exactly which steps to take in order to get to the finish line. So it just goes up, up, right, right, and done. And so the question here is, is that it? Is it really that simple? Is reinforcement learning really that, you know, for the lack of a better word, boring? It's, it's uh, you, once you have the map, that's it. All you have to do is you're done. You just follow the map. Well, the reality is that it's not actually that all simple. And that's a good thing because it makes this course more interesting for us and we can actually solve much more complex problems. So this is where a mark of processes come in. But first we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about deterministic search versus non-deterministic search. So let's talk about the concept of deterministic search. This is our agent in the maze and deterministic search means that if the agent decides to go up, then what will happen is with 100% probability, it will go up. That's exactly what will happen. There's no other options. Once, once it says go up or clicks the up arrow, it will go up. There's no other options. Now, on the other hand, non-deterministic search is when our agent says it wants to go up. There are actually a couple of options. For example, there could be three options. And we're going to be looking at an example where there are three options, but it doesn't have to be limited to three. It could be four. It could be, you know, different, depending on, depends on the problem, the randomness could be different. But in our case, there could be three options. With an 80% chance, he does go up. But then with a 10% chance, when he wants to go up, he'll actually go to the left, just because, because that's how the environment works. That's the world that he lives in. And with another 10% chance, he'll actually go right. And in this case, he'll fall into the fire pit. So that is how it all works. That's an example of a non-deterministic search, a stochastic process. And what the point of this is, is to make a more realistic model of what could actually happen in a, in a real world, in a real world type of problem. Because very rarely do you get situations like this when, when you do something and it happens exactly that way. And even if you think about it in terms of games, let's say you've got an agent playing Pac-Man, well, not always is it the case that if he's standing in the square, he goes up, he will get the same exact result every time. He will, he will indeed go up, but it may be in one case, he won't get eaten by a ghost. In another case, he will get eaten by a ghost. So as you can see, there's some randomness to it because it depends on how the ghosts are moving and they don't always move the same way. They don't always start in the same locations. So it's, it's very logical. It's very, it's fair that there is some randomness. There's something that is not under the control of the agent. And that is, this is just a way for us to represent that in order for us to learn how we can deal with it and how that affects the Bellman equation, how it affects the whole reinforcement learning process. It's, but at the same time, the randomness is of course not limited to if you go up, there's a 10% chance you'll go right or 10% chance you'll go left. Or if you go down, there's a 10% chance you'll go right or left. Or if you go right, there's a 10% chance you'll go up or down. It's not limited to where you're going to end up. Sometimes you might have a problem that is, is exactly like this. Sometimes the probabilities might be different. Sometimes the randomness might boil down to something else. It might be bo boiled down like in that example of Pac-Man of the ghosts eating you or not eating you, or it might boil down to something different. For instance, like there's, there's like if the agent is playing Doom and then there's something uh, like a, a monster which is going to shoot him in one case, another case, there's like there's a probability with which it will get shot and with which it won't get shot and so on. So something that is out of the control of the agent, something that it cannot predict, that's what we're modeling here in non-deterministic search. And this is where we have directly approached two new concepts, Markov processes and, or mar a Markov process and mar a mark Markov decision process. So let's have a look at these. And you know how much I don't like to put definitions and lots of text on the slides, but in this case, it is necessary for us to uh, go through them. So let's have a look. A stochastic process has a mark of property if the conditional probability distribution of future states of the process, conditional on both past and present states, depends only upon the present state. 
not on the sequence of events that preceded it. A process with this property is called a Markov process. Very complex definition, and it kind of like even a little bit, not contradicts itself, but feels like it contradicts itself. So here it says conditional both for past and the present state, depends only upon, but at the same time, it only depends upon the present state. So don't get too bogged down in that. Uh, I'll, I'll break it down in simple terms. So a mark of property is when your future states, so not just your choice, but the whole thing, your choice and the environment, it will only, like the results of, 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 the, of the action you take in that environment will only depend on where you are now. It will not depend on how you got there. And that's it. So that's a Markov property. And a process which has this property is called a Markov process. So in to put it into an example, so if your agent is here and if he goes, if he decides to go up, he might go, He in our case, in our non-deterministic search example, he actually might go left and right or the right. That's because we have that stochasticity inside our environment. We have that randomness inside our environment. So any one of these three might happen. But the key here is, that this is a mark of process because we don't care how he got here. He could have come from the top, ended up here. He could have come from the left, ended up here. He could have come from the bottom, ended up here. He could have like play, moved around here like 100,000 times and then got here. It does not matter what happened before. Only what matters is what which state is he in now. And so the, the probabilities of going left or right or up, they will always be the same if he's in this state now. And so that's basically just saying, it doesn't matter what happened before. We're here now. This is the state you're in. And don't, don't forget that state doesn't just mean where he's standing. The state is the state of the whole, of the whole, uh, of the agent in the environment. So is there like monsters on the right or are there monsters on the left? Or, uh, you know, is the ghost coming from the top of the bottom? Whatever state you're in now, it doesn't matter how you got there. It doesn't matter how it, how it all came to be that you're there in that state now. What will happen in the future is only determined by the state you're in now plus the actions you will take. Then plus, of course, the randomness that is overlaid on top of that. So that's a Markov process. And a Markov decision process or an MDP uh, or Markov decision processes provide a mathematical framework for model modeling decision making in situations where outcomes are partly random and partly under control of a decision maker. So important to understand uh, that Markov decision process, processes are different, a different whole concept to Markov process, to a Markov process. They're kind of like a mathematical framework. So, but at the same time, I thought it was important for us to understand what a Markov process is because I think it still helps in, in understanding of a Markov, Markov decision process. So, a Markov decision process is the, is exactly what we've been discussing up till now. So that the agent lives in this environment where it has control, like remember previously, it had full control of the of what's going on, but now it has a little bit less control. It can decide to go up, but it actually knows, okay, so if I go up, there's an 80% chance I'll go up, there's a 10% chance I'll go left, 10% chance I'll go right. So not everything is fully under its control. There is some randomness in this environment. And that's exactly what a Markov decision process is. A Markov decision process is the framework that the agent will use in order to understand what to do in this environment. So we've got an environment with some stochasticity, some randomness, and now the agent has to choose, for instance, should go up, down, left, or right. It has to make that decision. It doesn't know what to do. And in order to make that decision, it's going to apply a framework. Uh, it's going to be using a mark of decision process in order to make that decision, what, what's going to happen, where it's going to go. And so basically this environment that poses this problem, it is referred to the mark of decision process. So um, it's the framework that agent using at the same time, the environment is re referred to that the agent is operating in a mark of decision process environment. And so basically here we've got two concepts. We've got the mark of process is the way this environment is designed that the part, the, it does the work, what happens from where you are now doesn't depend on the past. And at the same time, we've got the mark of decision process is the framework that the agent is going to be using in order to, to solve this environment. And the good news is that the mark of decision process or that framework that we're talking about is actually just an add-on to our Bellman equation. It is the Bellman equation, but just a bit more sophisticated. So uh, let's have a look at that. This is our Bellman equation so far. It's the maximum of all possible actions. So the value of a being in a state is the maximum of all possible actions that you can take from that state. The maximum is taken from the reward that you would get by taking that action in that state plus a discount factor times the value of the next state, which is S prime. So that's what we've had so far. And now because we have some randomness in our whole process, 
this this part will change because we don't actually know which state we'll end up in. We don't know what S prime will be. Will it be, if we're going up, will it be up or will it be left or will it be right? So we actually have to place this with the expected value of the next state. So here we're going to replace this. So there's three possible states we can end up in. And so we're going to replace that with that's a value. That state has a value of S1 prime. That state has a V of S prime two, S2 prime. And this state has a value of V of S3 prime. So now we're going to multiply the uh, state that we actually are intending to go into by 80% because that's our probability of getting into that state plus the probability of getting into this state, 10% plus probability of getting in this state. So um, this is just our expected value. So if uh, from statistics, if we take the expected value of uh, getting into, of, of the state that we'll get into, so kind of like the average. What's what's the average of, of what we'll get? And then we replace that over here. Then we get this equation. Now, it jumps very quickly just because this equation is bigger. But if you look at it carefully, you'll see it's exactly the same thing. So you've got max here, you've got max here. Then you've got R of S and A. You've got R of S and A. Here you've got gamma, you've got gamma. And then finally, here you've got V. So you knew exactly it was a ter deterministic search. You knew which state you'll get into. Now you don't know which state you'll get into, so instead of taking V, you're taking the expected value of the state you'll get into or of the future state, or just in simpler terms, you're just taking the average of what you'll get into. So, you know, if like it was a, in a, in a, like for us a 33% chance, then it'll be like this plus this plus this divided by three, basically. But in this case, it's, it's not, it's not exactly like average, average. It's, it's a weighted average because of your probabilities here. So here you've got the probability of, when you're in this state, you take this action of getting into state S prime times the value of S prime and summed across all S primes that you could possibly get into over here. So exactly what we had three here, one, two, three, add them up, multiply by probabilities, add them up. Same here, one, two, three, multiply them by probabilities and add them up. And that is your new Bellman equation. Congratulations. This is what we're going to be working with going forward. And that is the framework that is used in market decision processes. So that is the framework that solves this, that agents use to solve this whole stochastic, non-deterministic search problem where there's random events that are happening that they cannot control. So it's it's much more complex, but as you can see, because we built up slowly to it, now we already know about this, we already know about this, we already know about this, uh, we know about this, we know about this. So all we did is we just introduced this part over here because there are probabilities involved in the action or the consequences of your action are non-deterministic. They are based on certain probabilities. And so there we go. That's how a Markov decision uh, process works and the underlying equation behind it. Uh, once again, it is something that is more that more closely resembles real world problems, real world scenarios, or even game scenarios, because not everything is straightforward. There is some randomness involved and not always will taking an action in a certain state will always not will not always will it lead to the same outcome and so this is what we're going to be dealing with going forward and that's going to make things way more interesting so hopefully you're excited for that and excited to see what's going to come next and in the meantime i found a really cool paper for you to have a look at this time, it's a very applied paper. So this one's actually really interesting to read through. It's called A Survey of Applications of Markov Decision Processes, uh, Processes, and it was written by White in 1993. There's a link, and it'll show you examples of where Markov Decision Processes actually are used to model real-life scenarios. I think I, I was very excited by this. I was impressed by some examples. So population harvesting, for instance, so let's say you have some fish and you know what the population of a fish is. You need to decide how many fish can we fish out this year. And what? so that's your current state. That's the action that you're taking. How many can we fish out this year? So that what are the op, what are the possible outcomes of that? How many fish will we have next year? How many fish will we have the year after and the year after and so on? And it's not deterministic because it's not like if you take out, I don't know, 90% of the population, then next year you will have you know, back to 100%. It's not, not exactly deterministic. There are certain random factors involved which are out of our control. And therefore, we have to understand what, what, uh, what's going to happen. We have to model what's going to happen. 
that's where a market decision process is used. Agriculture, there's an example, like same thing, like harvesting crops, how much crops do we harvest, how much, uh, how much do we not harvest? Another one which I looked at, finance and investment, um, like an insurance company needs to decide uh, how much of its funds it will invest in any given, I think, day or year or, or some period of time. And it, there are certain factors that are out of its control. For instance, you know, the market movements, it doesn't know what can happen. So it needs to actually model that somehow and a market decision process is used for that. So here you can see lots and lots of examples. And this is the number of examples given, I think, for each one. And so, yeah, even sports, two examples for sports and epidemics and motor insurance claims, inspections and maintenance and repair and so on. So very interesting. Have a look at that just to give you an understanding of, hey, this is not just all made up stuff, hypothetical, the matrix type of thing. This is actually a real world scenario. So it will give you a better understanding. And, and this is what we talked about in the promotional video for this course that uh, or the description of the course that we're going to inspire you and your intuition to give you ideas for how to use AI in real life. This is your opportunity. Uh, look at this paper to understand, okay, so we're going to be dealing with mark of decision processes going forward. That's really cool. What do they look like in real life? And this possibly could trigger some ideas for you how you could apply AI in the future to make the world a better place. And we'd be super happy about that. We'd be super happy if, uh, if you could use what you learn in this course to make the world a better place with AI. How fantastic would that be? So on that note, I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. Previously, we had quite a strenuous and long tutorial on Markov decision processes. And hopefully you got along well with that. And hopefully I could explain things in a approachable and engaging way. And today we're going to talk about policies versus plans. It's going to be a quick and fun tutorial because now we're entering into a new world. We're entering into a world of stochastic search, non-deterministic search. When you, It's not just about getting through the maze, but also accounting for random factors that might just hit you in the head when you're going through this maze and you need to be prepared for them. That's the world our agent is living in and it's more fun but it's also more dangerous it's more it's less predictable so how is our agent going to behave let's have a look there's our mark of decision process framework which is once again our favorite bellman equation however the the more advanced version of uh, the bellman equation we were working with so from now on we're just going to call this the bellman equation and here we've got our maximum across all actions so the value of a state any S state S is the maximum across all actions that an agent can possibly perform in that state. And the maximum is taken from the reward that the agent will get by performing action A in state S plus a discount factor multiplied by the expected value of the new state it will be in. And the expected value is taken here because they are, it doesn't know exactly what state it'll end up in. There are some random effects that are present in the environment that might alter the state and not uh, he might not end up in the desired state he might up, end up in a different state and that's why we're taking the expected value over here this sum over here so let's have a look at um, this as our example uh, or in our example of the maze so this is what we had previously so previously we we're dealing with with deterministic search so we knew that all right so if i'm here I definitely need to go here. If I'm here, I definitely need to go here. If I'm here, I definitely need to go here. If I'm here, I'm here. So it was all pretty straightforward. Once you have this map, and remember we called it a, uh, we called it a plan. Once you have the plan, it's pretty straightforward what you need to do. There are our arrows. So that's the plan with the arrows. And from here, it was very straightforward. Where this is, these are the routes that the agent would take. Wherever you start on this blue line, that's that's exactly the way you would go. However, now we don't have a plan anymore. We can't have a plan because you know, whatever we plan might not happen. It's not under our control. A plan is when you know exactly what you need to do next. You know the steps. So you have a you have a starting point, you have a goal, and you know every single step so you can plan them out. You're like, I'll do this one, I'll do this one, I'll do this one, like in life, like a plan. But at the same time, there's so much uh, now randomness going on, you can't have a plan because what if you get here and then you click to the right and actually takes you down. So that's not part of your plan. So that's why it's not called a plan anymore. And here we're going to calculate the values or we're actually going to just look at the calculated values for this same problem. But 
based on um, based or given that we have this randomness inside. So these are the new values. And so why are these values different? So let's just compare it to what we had previously. This is what we had previously. These are the new values. So once again, we had previously, you can see 1, 0 0.9, 0 0.81, 73, 66. And this is what we have now, 86, so less than 1, 74, 71, 63, and so on. And by the way, these are not exactly the uh, correct values. These are off the top of my head. But if we were to run an agent, some values would be something similar to this. And the values could change because depending on the gamma that we choose, 0 0.9 or other value. But nevertheless, for the for argument's sake, these are the values that we're dealing with now. And they're approximate. They, they convey the whole notion in, in the correct way. So let's have a look at them. Why have they changed? Well, why is here, let's start with this one. Here the value was 1. Why is it all of a sudden 0 0.86? Why is it less than 1? Can't we just go from here here? Well, we actually can't because... From here, uh, if we go right, which is our intention, if we go right, we could, we would actually, with a 10% chance, we'd end up here. So we'd hit the wall and we'd be back in this state. And remember, we have a gamma, so the value would be discounted. And, or with, or with a 10% chance, we'd end up here in this state. So it's not 100% probability that we'd get here. So therefore, this value can no longer be a one. It's something less. And it's, let's say it's 0, 0 0.86. So that's an example of why it's like this. And you could get the exact value if you calculated the Bellman equation, the full Bellman equation that we have now. The only problem is that there's, there'd be some recursion because you would need to know the value for this and then you would need to know the value for this. It's quite complex and that's why we're not doing the calculations manually here. That's why the AI, but the AI can do them as it's going through through all of this. It's, it's, like, um, it's like nothing co too complex for the AI to calculate these things. Um, so that's our value here, but now let's look at a different one. So here it used to be 0 0.9, just because of the discounting factor, remember, from here to here. Again, now from here, we can't just jump from here to here, simply because even if we jump, if we go like this, we might end up back here, back here, right? There's 20% chance that we'll still stay in the square because we'll hit a wall. And again, and so on. So the value of being here is 0 0.71. Again, this, the discounting factor, you know, this might look odd to you that this is, even with the discounting factor, this is too high. Maybe the discounting factor in this example is not 0 0.9, maybe it's 0 0.99 or something like that. So uh, don't worry about that. Just kind of like focus on that the values have indeed changed, that the values are now less, mo mostly because it's not a 100% probability to get to the state that you want to get. And what you will find an interesting one is here, that here it used to be 0 0.9 and it actually has dropped very much. It's dropped substantially. Why is that? Well, because if you go from here up, which is our intention, there's a 10% chance of hitting the wall, but there's a 10% chance of actually ending up in the fire pit and losing uh, minus one uh, to reward. And basically that means for the agent, that's uh, that's uh, end of the game. And so this is a very bad state to be in. So all of a sudden, remember, we had 0 0.9 here, 0 0.9. So they were equivalent. It doesn't matter you here or here. They're pretty much equal in terms of value of being in each of these states. But now all of a sudden, bam, this state is like nearly twice as good as this one, simply just because here, if you go straight, to, you go right where you want to go, the, you know, the consequences of the randomness occurring is you just stay here. Here, the, one of the consequences, the 10% chance, is you end up in the pit. So as you can see, this is no longer such a good state anymore, uh, simply because of something, that fluctuation that could happen. As you can see, this one is also very bad because it's it's as bad as this one in terms of, you know, there's only a 10% chance of ending up in the pit and 10% chance of ending up in the wall. But at the same time, there's the discounting factor. So first of all, the discounting factor. And also... After this one, you'd have to go here. And even if you hypothetically went here, you could end up in the pit again. So that chance would also be taken into account because remember this value is derived from this value and this value is derived from this value, right? And therefore it's smaller. But in reality, actually, that what I said there was wrong. This value is not derived from this value. So if you just have a look now, you will notice that this value, V over here, is actually greater than this one you will notice that for the agent, uh, it's better to go around this way than this way. And it makes sense, right? Because this way, it doesn't lose. It, there's no chance of getting in the pit. Yes, it's a bit longer, and therefore the discounting factor has a, a bigger effect. But at the same time, simply because there's a chance of getting in the pit here, if it goes straight, it will. there's a chance of jumping in the pit. So it'll take, it'd rather take its time 
and it'll just like go around because that way there's a much lesser chance of it getting a pit. There still is. So if uh, from here it goes there, if from here it goes there, it could potentially get into the pit because it could end up there and then it could end up in the pit. But nevertheless, it's a lesser chance. So it would just go around like that. So very interesting to see how the route changed. Remember previously from here, you'd go like that. From here, you'd go like that. And from here, you'd go like that. And now all of a sudden you can see it's changed. So let's draw the arrows and see what it looks like now. And voila, you see even a, a, a more random thing, right? So yes, this is true, but look at what happened here. Look at this one and look at this one. Were you expecting that? That's something definitely like when I saw this for the first time, I was was very impressed. I was not surprised. I was not uh, I was surprised and I was not expecting this at all. And this is this is an example of you know when AI can outsmart a human. It's sound like something you can't even you could can't even predict, but the AI through reinforcement learning, remember that example of the dogs that can actually sometimes walk better than normal real life dogs or pre-programmed robot dogs or can play soccer simply because they come up with these ideas that even we can't see. And so that's a great example, right? So you probably weren't expecting that as well, that the agent, instead of going up, it's like, why would I, like if I go up, then there's a 10% chance I'll jump into the pit. But what does it achieve by going into the wall? Well, 80% of the time it'll bump back and stay in this state, but 10% of the time it'll go here and 10% of the time it'll go here. So all of a sudden you can see that now it's actually in this new approach of jumping into the wall, there is a 0% chance it will go into the fire pit from this spot. So And it's like it really doesn't want to go into the fire pit, so it rather bounce into the wall a couple of times and then it will go either right or left at some point because that randomness is going to happen. And so it learned that through experimentation. It learned that, okay, when I go forward, the results are not as good as when I go to the wall. And if you think about it, it's like this this robot, if you think about it like there's a fire pit, there's a very this is the this is like a this square is like a very tiny ledge. And then this is like a mountain, like a cliff, and this robot is just hugging the cliff and just, you know, like trying to waiting until it like pushes it right or left. Because, well, as a human, you'd probably do the same. You wouldn't be standing facing that way or that way. You'd be hugging the, the cliff, right? Or something like that. And hopefully you never need to end up in a, you never end up in a situation like that. But it, like visually, just visually, if you think about it, same thing here. And so that's pretty intense, right? So that, that the AI came up with this idea. And same here that instead of going left and risking getting a fire, but I'm just going to try bounce off the wall, like, you know, hug the wall, try to jump into the wall. And at some point I know that, you know, just there's a probability, there's a 10% chance every time I do that, I'll go here and sometimes it'll happen and I'll end up here and I'll be safe and then I'll just keep going like that. So very, very interesting approach that uh, the AI took here. And as you can see, the the routes are like this. So from here, it might go right and then it'll go right to the exit or here it'll go left like that. And here it will, uh, at some point, it will go left and it'll go like that. Again, this is important to understand it's not a policy. So even when it jumps from here, it will go here as maybe and then from here it might actually instead of going straight it might actually go back to the right and then from here it might go to the left it might go to the right so there's lots of different options for it to go so it might not follow exactly this arrow it might go the other way this is just the desired routes that it's designed for itself but the way it'll work out is actually could be different it depends on the real world so there we go that's the world of artificial intelligence that's what a policy versus a plan is and uh, hopefully you're getting slowly getting excited by what uh, the AI can do, especially given what we saw over here. These are some very virtuoso type of decisions that the AI is coming up with. And as you can see, when you apply AI, even from this small example, you can see that even when you apply AI in the real world, maybe you'll come up with ideas and decisions that even sometimes humans can't come up with. And that's exactly kind of like what happened in those games where the Google AlphaGo was playing versus Lee Si Dole, the champion of Go in Korea uh, back in, um, or oh, the world champion of Go, and they were playing in Korea back back uh, in 2016. I think it was March 2016. It came up with some moves that humans had never played in 3,000 years or humans were not used to playing. And this is this is exactly an example of that. So once again, hope you're getting excited and pumped about this course and about what we're going to create. And... I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. Today we're talking about the living penalty. All right, so here we've got our Bellman equation. And as we've been going through this course, we've been slowly 
making it more and more complex. So, so far we've already added these probabilities in here and also we've added the discounting factor. Now we're going to look in more detail at this side of the equation where we have the reward. Now, remember previously when we talked about how reinforcement learning works, we said we have an agent and it performs actions in the environment and in, in exchange, or as a result of that, it gets a new state in which it's now in and a reward for that action. Well, so far in our example, we've only been getting rewards at the very end, either if we get to the finish line or if we, for the agent ends up in the fire pit, he gets a plus one or a minus one reward. But that is a very simplistic approach to reinforcement learning. And in more realistic scenarios, you will likely have rewards throughout the journey, not just at the very end. You might have rewards throughout the journey. For instance, if it's uh, an AI playing a game and if, for example, it's um, like shooting somebody in Doom, it might get points for killing that enemy, or it might be in a different other game if uh, it um, overtakes another car or something like that, just because of the rules of the game, not because of its uh, way of analyzing the game, but actually the game is structured in a way that it's reinforcing, it's giving points for doing certain actions even before the game is over. So scenarios like that are very common, not just in games and also in real life. And that's why we're going to introduce something similar into our example, a simplified version of that, but nevertheless, a reward that is continuously given to the agent throughout the game, not at just at the end. And the way we're going to do it is by looking at the other tiles. So right now we only have reward plus one at the final tile and reward minus one at the other final tile, the fire pit. But now we're going to add rewards in every single tile. We're, we'll add a very small reward. It'll be minus 0 0.04. And as you can see, it's negative. So every time the agent moves, he'll get a negative reward. And that's why it's called a living penalty because no matter where he goes, he will always get this negative reward, except for these final tiles because that's the end of the game. And so here you can see the reward even on this tile is minus 0 0.04, but that doesn't mean that he starts with that reward. He only gets this reward, and this is important to Remember, he only gets this reward when he enters a tile. So whenever he, he performs an action, he goes here, then he will get this reward minus 0 0.04. And then if he comes back to this tile, he'll get another minus 0 0.04 reward. And so the longer he walks around, the more he accumulates this negative reward. And therefore, it is an incentive for him to finish the game earlier, as quickly as possible. And so now let's have a look at how our policy or how the agent's policy is going to change depending on what value we set for this reward. So here are four environments, and in each one, we're going to explore a different reward. Now, we're not going to do the calculations. We're just going to project the results, and you will see that intuitively they make total sense. So here we've got a reward for any step or for, any, for getting into any state is equal to zero, just as what we've seen before. Here, the reward is going to be minus 0 0.04, what we just introduced now. Here, the reward will be minus 0 0.5, or the living, living penalty will be minus 0 0.5, so much higher, you can see, than here, more than 10 times greater. And here, the living penalty will, will be minus 2, so even more than the reward you get for uh, jumping, or even less than the reward that you or the agent gets for ending up in the fire pit. So let's have a look at how the actions or the op the optimal policy for passing this environment will change depending on this reward. So this is our original policy. And as you can remember, we had these two very interesting and even a little bit weird decisions by the agent, but which totally makes sense if he can live for as long as he likes, if he can just travel around for as long as he wants without being penalized for staying alive very long, he, why not, why wouldn't he just go into the corner here, into the wall, and just keep doing that until it happens, it so happens that he goes this way, and then he will walk around. And same thing here, it's much safer for him to jump into the wall, hoping that one of these will come up eventually, and then he'll go to the finish line anyway. Because in the, by choosing these two actions, he doesn't risk getting into the fire pit. Now let's see what happens if we add a reward uh, a negative reward for just being alive, for making a step, for making a move. So here you can see that 
instantly, these two changed. Now the agent doesn't want to jump into the wall. He is more likely to risk getting to the fire pit, having that 10% chance of jumping in here, but he will go forward. Because every time he jumps into the wall here, if he was going to be doing it here as well, every time he jumps into a wall, he performs an action, he ends up into in this state with an 80% chance, and that means with an 80% chance, he will get a minus 0.04 reward, meaning that a lot of the time he's going to be getting this, accumulating this negative reward. Same thing here. If he jumps into the wall, waiting for that uh, moment when he will actually be randomly moved to the right, if he keeps doing that, he will accumulate this negative reward. And that the result of that, if you perform the calculations, you'll see that the result of that, the expected value like of that approach, jumping to the wall, is worse than taking the risk of going forward and actually uh, ending up in in the fire pit. So he changes his decisions in these two blocks uh, to instead move forward and here move to the left, even though there's a risk of jumping to the fire pit, simply because now the longer he's alive, the longer he will accumulate this living penalty. In the next environment, now we're increasing the living penalty to even a greater number, minus 0.5. And let's see what changes here. So now you can see that compared to this environment, the only thing that changed here is that this arrow is pointing to the right. And what that means is that now it's no longer a good option for the agent. Oh, actually also this arrow is pointing was pointing to the left and now it's also now it's pointing to the upwards. So now it's no longer a good idea for the agent to go around from here, go around all the way, because if he goes around all the way, yes, he's safer. There's a lesser chance, there's no chance of getting to the fire pit. But at the same time, or there's a less chance of getting to the fire pit, but at the same time, he will accumulate quite a substantial negative reward as he walks around. So it's just, it's the path is too long. So that forces him, even whether he's here or here, to take the shorter route to get here, even though he has a much higher risk of getting into the fire pit, because as soon as he ends up in the square, there's a 10% chance of getting to the fire pit. According to his calculations, it's just the expected value of this approach is better than the expected value of going around, simply because we've increased this living penalty. And finally, we're getting to the example with the living penalty of minus 2.0. So here, I will encourage you to pause the video now that you've seen how the policy has changed as we increase the living penalty. I encourage you to pause the video and to think for yourself, what will happen in this scenario? What do you think the optimal policy will be, given that the living penalty is so high. So I'll let you pause the video if you'd like to. And now I'm going to jump into showing you the solution. So in this case, if you increase the penalty to minus 2.0, it's so high. Remember that the penalty here is only minus 1.0. It's so high that the agent just wants to get out of the game in any way possible. Even if it's just by jumping to the fire pit, he will do it. He will be like, Every time I make a step, every time I end up in a new uh, in a new state, or every time I make an action, I end up uh, getting a minus two reward. So, what's the point of trying to get to the finish line if from here it'll take me two extra steps? I'm just going to go here and then straight into the fire pit because that way my reward is going to be less. The negative reward is not going to be as bad as in the case of just making an, an additional steps. So you can see that adding this living reward and uh, depending on the value of the living reward that we're adding, the results are going to be different and the agent is going to select different policies. And that's basically what how the reward value can be is incorporated by the Bellman equation, even when it's not just at the finish line or at the end of the game, but even throughout the game. And again, once again, it doesn't have to be on every single uh, in every single state. And depending on the environment itself, it might be given to the agent at certain specific states, not at every state. But in our simplistic example, we're just using rewards at every given state uh, to illustrate this concept. So I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. And as you can see, we've already made our Bellman equation quite sophisticated, and now it can be applied to many different scenarios. And I can't wait to see you in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. Today we are finally talking about Q-learning. All right, so we've already got this equation, the Bellman equation, which we've added lots of components to. We've got 
the reward here, which can be not just at the very end, but it can be at any given step. Uh, we've got the discount factor. We've got the probability uh, because now we're looking at Markov decision processes. And here we've got the probability of ending up in a different states, regardless of what action we take, or actually given the action we take, they can be uh, multiple states that we can up, end up in. And then we've got the value of the next state. So you can see it's kind of like a recursive function and so on. But you probably still have one question. The question is, where in all of this is the letter Q? Why is it all called Q learning? So where's the Q? And that's the question that we're going to be answering today. So far, we've been dealing with values, the value of being in a certain state. And now we're going to look at how Q fits into all of that as well. So here we've got two examples. On the left is what we've been doing so far. Our agent has been analyzing, okay, I'm over here. This is a mark of decision process, so it doesn't matter how I got here. The rest of the environment doesn't care uh, of the steps that it took me to get here. From now on, the I have to make the optimal decision where to go, here, here, or here, based on the current state and all the future states that come from here, but not from the past. And so he can see that there's three options. There's uh, state one, state two, state three. And based on his experience, he has calculated the values in these states and now he's going to, using the Bellman equation, so even that though this is a stochastic process, so he knows that he'll go here, but there's a chance that he'll go left or right, and so on. So based on these values, he's going to make a decision. That's what we've been doing so far, and that is totally the legitimate approach here. But now we're going to modify it a little bit. We're going to take the same exact concept, same exact problem, but here, instead of looking at the values of each state that he can end up in, we're going to look at the values or the um, value of each action. So we're, we're not going to use the letter V anymore because V is for the value of the state. We're going to use a Q. And the you might have a question, why the letter Q? Well, Q, some people speculate that Q, well, I read this, I think, um, on Quora. Somebody mentioned that Q is because of quality. But at the same time, I couldn't find any other references to that. So it might not be because of that. It might be just because uh, that's the letter that was used at the time. And now it became super popular because it's all called Q learning because of that. So no exact reason why it's called Q, but nevertheless, at least it helps us uh, distinguish between V and Q. So Q here represents, rather than the value of the state, it represents, let's go with quality. It represents the quality of the action. It represents, okay, so I've got four actions. What are the different qualities of these actions? What, what is the or, or the value of the action or the quality of the action? Which action is more lucrative? So I need a metric telling me, all right, how do I quantify this action? And then I can compare them. And that is exactly what Q is. And so here he's got four possible actions. As always, go up, right, left, or down. And based on the action, there's going to be a formula which tells us the quantifiable value of that action, which we're calling the Q, the Q value of that action. So let's have a look at how we're going to derive this formula for Q. What, How does it actually relate to V? Because as you can imagine, because actions lead to states, there has to be some sort of link between the two, right? We've got, we've already determined how to cal calculate this and we're pretty good at it. We know how to use the Bellman equation in very different environments with lots of different complications. Well, let's leverage that knowledge to understand how we can now calculate Q in order to make the same predictions. Because as you can imagine, the env environment doesn't change depend depending on what approach we use. The environment is going to be the same regardless. So therefore, this approach and this approach should always give the same result. And therefore, that's another reason why these two should be linked. So let's have a look. So here's our V approach where we're just going to look at the value of a, any given state, this state, any other state. And here we're going to, we're just using the letter S here because that's the current state. And so therefore the terminology will be the same in both equations. And here we're using QSA, Q is the of the state S and the action A because action is up, but in which state did we perform that action? We performed that action in state S. Okay, so now we're going to write out the Bellman equation for the first approach. As you can see here, we've got uh, V of S, so the value of any given state S is the maximum of the reward that you get. So maximum 
based on the actions. So you have three, uh, in this case, you actually have four actions. So maximum out of all the possible actions. And then of this part, which we've already discussed many times. So this is our reward that we get from performing that action in that state plus a discounted factor multiplied by the expected value of uh, the new state that we're going to be in. An expected value because it is a stochastic process. We don't know exactly for sure that we're going to end up over here. We might end up on the left or the right with certain probability. That's why these probabilities are in here. All right, so that's our value. And now let's look at Q. So Q is going to be defined. We're going to use this to define Q. So let's say the agent from this location, from this state, performed the action up what is the Q value going to be equal to? Well, first of all, let's see what he'll get in return. For performing this action up, first thing that you'll get is a reward, right? That's no, no doubt about it. There's going to be some sort of reward. It might be zero, but we know that the whole, this the way this reinforcement learning process works is that sometimes for performing certain actions from a given state, there's a reward. So we're going to add that in here. And then we're going to add, what are we going to add? Well, let's think about it. What is the next thing that happens after he's gotten the reward? Well, the next thing that happens is that now the agent is in a certain state. He could end up here with a 80% probability or some probability, but actually he could end up here or here. But wherever he ends up, now there's we already have a quantified metric for that state he's in, and that is actually the V value of that state. But because he can up in many different states, in three of the possible different states, we have to look at the expected value of the state that he'll be in. And so we're going to add that in. We're going to add, of course, the discounted factor as we previously had, because that is somewhere in the future. And then we're going to add the sum of across all possible states, across all possible states that he could end up in by taking this action times the probability. So what we're saying here is that, okay, so by performing an action, you're going to get a reward plus, which is a quantified metric, plus you're going to get, you end up in a state. We don't know which one. It could be here. It could be here. It could be here. But here is the expected value of the state that you're going to end up in. And now we're going to multiply it by discounting factor because that is one move away. So that is our Q value for this, for performing this action. And what you will notice here right away is that Q, the Q value is actually exactly identical to what's inside these brackets over here. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, here we're taking the maximum of the result we'll get, the maximum across all possible actions, so we've got four actions, and we're taking the maximum across all possible actions of the result that we'll get by taking each of those actions. And in Q, we're defining, interesting, what will we get by taking a certain action? So if you think about it, it makes sense that the value of a state, so for instance, this state, is the maximum of all of the possible Q values, right? So here in this state, by being in the state, the agent has one Q value, two Q value, three Q value, four Q value. So he has four possible Q values. Well, the value of the state, it makes sense that the value of the state is the maximum of all of those four Q values. And that is exactly what we can see here. That's a good confirmation of this new formula that we derived. If that wasn't the case, if that if that didn't match up, then we would have questions. We'd be like, so why why doesn't it match why doesn't it match up if Q value is a quantified metric of performing an action and V depends on the four is like is the maximum of the possible results of the four actions that he can perform. Hopefully that makes sense and that confirms the formula that we've just derived. And now we're going to make it even more interesting. We're going to get rid of the V entirely because you can see here you got V is a recursive function of V. So, and then we got V and then V and then V and then V and so on. So you can express this V through all of the following Vs, the most optimal Vs that will come up. Here, we're expressing Q as a, fun a recursive function of V or as a function of the next V. And then we'd have to plug in this V and then we'd get back to the V. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this V and we're going to, we're going to replace it with a Q, right? So let's have a look at that. We're going to take this V of the next state and we're going to plug this into that formula over here. And as you can see now, 
So this part doesn't change, this probability doesn't change. But as we just discussed, V of S is the maximum by all actions of Q of S and A, right, over here. So that's what we're going to replace in here. So we're going to say a maximum of, of course, it's the new action, the action that we're going to take because here we've got V, v of S prime. So here now we've got... Uh, the maximum across all a, a prime, so the actions that we're going to take from this state or from whatever, whichever other state we end up in, but the action that we're going to take from there and a maximum across all those, and the maximum is of all of the Q values that will that are available to us in that new state S prime, comma a prime, and that's the action. So that's the so there's going to be another four Q values there. So now, as you can see, let's go through that again. So as from what we derived, as from what we discussed, just through logic and intuition, so that we can see that V and S are actually, V of S and Q of S and A are linked. V of S is the maximum across all actions of Q of S and A. You can see it right here. So this, this part is identical to this part. And then we're going to leverage that and we're going to replace this bit with V at S from here, but not this exact formula. We're going to take this internal part and we're going to replace it with Q of S and A. So we're going to plug that in here, and this part is going to be Q of uh, S prime A prime. So maximum of Q uh, by across all A primes of Q S prime A prime. And now we have our formula. So now we have a recursive formula for the Q value. So now the agent can think, what's the value of this action? What's the quality of this action? What's the Q value of this action? Well, it depends on the reward I get in the immediate step after that. Plus, it depends on the discounted factor times the maximum of all the possible Q actions in that state. But I don't know if I'm going to get there. So I need to also look at that state and that state. And that's why we have this expected value over here. So we have this sum, probability times the maximum, and that's our expected value. So very similar formula, as you can see. But this time, we're expressing things through the Q values. And that's why uh, this whole algorithm is called Q learning because... This is what is looked at. This is what the agents actually use. They don't look at the states. They look at their possible actions. And then based on the actions, on the Q values of the actions, they will decide which action to take. So they'll just look at the maximum Q value in this given state. It has four actions. What is the best action to take? So it can compare. Instead of comparing the different states, it can end up, end up in. It's going to compare the possible actions that it currently has. Then by finding the optimal one, it's going to take that action and then it's going, to, it's going to repeat that process, repeat that process, and so on. So now you can see how all of this comes together, how the reward, the discounting factor, the stochastic uh, mark of decision processes, and uh, the V values and the Q values all come together in order to give us this one super powerful Bellman equation for Q values, which we can now apply and let our agents learn how to beat the environment. And so that is a intuitive explanation of what's going on. I know we went through the formulas, but it is necessary because this is like our formula that we've been going through this whole chapter. And I think it's a good transition from V to uh, Q and it illustrates how they're linked between each other. And if you'd like to get a bit more of a rigorous approach, mathematical approach, and uh, like you see the mathematics behind it and learn a bit more about Q values and how they work, then we've got some additional reading for you. Uh, this paper is called Mark of Decision Processes, Concepts and Algorithms by Martin van Otterlo, 2009. So you've got the link here as always. And here you can read in a bit more detail to understand all the nitty gritty behind Q values and so on. And now that we've discussed all of these things relating to the Bellman equation, now we are ready to look at something more complex such as this paper in order, if, if we want to get some additional information on this, in order to uh, kind of get a deeper understanding. But even if you don't uh, read through this paper already, you should have a good working knowledge of what Q learning is all about and how agents come up with the actions that they need to take in a certain environment. So I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. Today we're talking about the temporal difference. Now it's a very important tutorial because temporal difference is the heart and soul of the Q learning algorithm. This is actually 
how everything we've learned so far comes together into play inside key learning. So let's have a look. Remember the time when we talked about deterministic versus non-deterministic search? And remember how we said, in this case, it's when uh, the agent wants to go up, he definitely goes up. And when, in this case, he wants to go up, there's a 10% chance he'll go left, 10% chance he'll go right, and an 80% chance he'll go right, uh, go straight up. Well, it, these numbers are, of course, arbitrary and can be different. And this whole concept is it could be different in different uh, problems. So it doesn't have to concern which way he's moving, just that there's some randomness, something that's out of the control of the agent happening inside this environment. And what effect that had is, as you remember, was that in the deterministic example, it was very easy to calculate the V values. Well, not necessarily always very easy, but in our case, we could just simply calculate them by using the Bellman equation, and we, we had the exact values. And then, as you remember, I very carefully uh, mentioned that these values for the non-deterministic search example are off the top of my head. They're not calculated. We not, last, at that time, I said, we're, not, we're just not going to calculate them because it's very complex, but the computer could do it. And we just went along with these values that are just values that I made up, but they did get the job done. They helped us understand the concepts. Well, now we're going to return to that a little bit and understand what exactly is going on here. Why is it so much harder to calculate these values in the non-deterministic example? Or generally speaking, in these problems, in these environments and the agent going through them, why is it? Why can it be so hard to calculate these values? Well, when you think about it, because when the agent moves, for, for instance, from here to the right, he doesn't necessarily always move that way. Sometimes there's a chance that he'll go to the, to when instead of going straight, so let's call these northeast, southwest. So instead of, not, instead of going west, the agent might sometimes go south. And for instance, from here, instead of going north, he might sometimes go east. So, sorry. So here, instead of going east, he might sometimes go south. And here, instead of going north, he might sometimes go east or west. And here, instead of going north, he might sometimes go west, uh, east or west, and so on. So, And therefore, so in order to calculate this value, you would need to know what this value is. But the interesting thing is that in order to calculate this value, you need to know what this value is. So there's a lot of recursion happening here. And therefore, you cannot just de to define what these values are. And on top of that, this recursion is not deterministic. It is sometimes it happens this way. Sometimes instead of going up, he'll go right. Sometimes instead of going up, he'll go left. Sometimes instead of go, it, when he wants to go up, he will go up. So it is subject to chance. And so maybe many times the agent will go through this path and he'll go up, 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 up. And he'll think that from here, he always kind of goes up. And so the value of the state will go uh, will be good. And then all of a sudden, he'll drop into the pit and this value will go down. And so, therefore, you can see how there is some stochasticity or randomness to this whole calculation of these values because they're all interlinked. Plus, on top, you've got that randomness in that's inherent in the environment because there's a mark of decision process. So that's where all of this comes together, and that's where we're going to introduce the concept of the temporal difference, which will allow the agent to calculate these values. And here we were dealing with V values, and since then we've already moved on to Q values, so that's what we're going to be working with. We're going to be looking at Q values. So as you recall, this is our Bellman equation for Q values. So a Q value uh, or the, the value of performing a certain action a in state S is equal to the reward that you get after performing that action, so immediately after performing that action, plus you get the maximum, you get the gamma of the sum of all the possible, so you kind of get the expected value of the state that you will end up in. So as you recall, that was our formula for the Beldman equ equation. And now just for simplicity's sake, we're going to rewrite it in the old-fashioned way, in the in the way that we used to talk about the Bellman equation before we knew about the stochasticity. So as you remember, this was our Bellman equation in the sense of a deterministic search example, because here you don't have that expected value, you don't have the sum across all probabilities, you just have that as if it's determined where you're going to end up, what state you're going to end up, and then you're taking the max in that one state. And the reason we're rewriting it is simply, the only reason is because it is just 
easier to write it and it'll be easier to us to follow along with the formula. So we're going to just remember that we replaced this part with this part. And also you'll find this uh, notation in a lot of literature. So it'll be easier for you to follow along with other sources if you're studying those. But do remember that in fact, what we mean is this probabilistic approach here instead of this notation. It's just easier for us to operate this and understand what's going on and just kind of like look at the equation so that they're not too cluttered. But once again, just remember that in fact, what we mean is this probabilistic approach over here. And so we're actually nearly done. So let's have a look at what's going on. So here is our blank state of the maze. We don't have any Q values. Let's see, or we, we may, but let's, let's just keep it blank for now. Let's just look at one of the states, or one of the cells, this one specifically. And here we have, for instance, for the action of going up, we have a Q value that uh, we've calculated. So it's not that we don't have any Q values yet. We've already, we do, but we're just not illustrating anything. We're just keeping it blank for simplicity's sake. But we have, the age has been walking around for some time, and let's say hypothetically somehow he's calculated this Q value of going up or north from this state, from this specific cell. And the value is Q, S, and A. And so now what we have, so he is currently where this blue arrow is pointing. The agent is sitting in this cell. And now he needs to make a choice. Where is he going to go? And he knows the value of this, of the action going north. And that is Q, S, and A. And here I'm saying before, and the reason for that is because he that is before he takes action. He hasn't taken the action yet, so he's still in the cell. And before he's taken the action, the value here is Q and S and A. And now he actually takes the action. So let's say he decides this is the best one. He takes the action and he moves up to this cell. Well, now what happens is now comes after. So after he's taken action, we can measure what is this value. Let's just calculate this value. The value of the reward of for taking that action plus gamma times the maximum of this new state that he's just gotten into S prime. And so the maximum across all possible actions in S prime. And so what we have here is the value before in the, of that action. And then we've calculated this metric afterwards. But as you can recall, from the previous formula, so if we go back very quickly, from the previous formula, what we just calculated is indeed the val that is how Q of S and A is calculated. So this right part, we've just calculated it separately, but after we've taken the action. So as I, once again, before we knew a Q of an S and A value, something that we've calculated through our iterations previously. So something so a value that's stored in our memory, so just like a number that we know. And now after the action's be been performed, we know what reward he actually got, what reward the agent actually got, and we can calculate this new value. So in essence, we're kind of recalculating this value, but now with new information. The new information is the reward that we got. And, and plus what state we ended up in and what the maximum across that state, for what that this new value is for that specific state that we're looking at. So what um, the value of that being in that state is. So basically the Q of an SNA, but given new information. And now the temporal difference is defined as TD of A and S of these two, of the difference between these two. So here the first element is your after value. So the kind of like Q of S and A, but calculated afterwards. And the previous Q of an S and A, which you had stored in your memory. And so the question is, are they different? So ideally, they should be the same. Ideally, this should be the same as this, simply because this is the formula for calculating this. But the thing is that this is not something we calculate. This is something that we have from empirical evidence, something that we have from just going through the maze many times and calculating. So this is something we've come up with so far. It's not related to the current iteration. It's something that we came up with previously, a long time, not a long time ago, but in one of our previous iterations going through the maze. Whereas this is something we've calculated just now. And there is no guarantee that they're going to be the same because of the randomness that exists in the maze. Because this could have been calculated and some certain random events were triggered and this can be calculated different random events have been were triggered. 
And so now let's rewrite that over here. Let's just move it up there. So how do we use this? The question is, okay, so we have this temporal difference. How do we use this? And why is it called a temporal difference? Well, the reason it's called a temporal difference is because you're basically calculating the same thing. You're calculating Q of S and A. So the Q value of that action, you're calculating here and you're calculating it here. But the difference is time. This is your Q of S and A previously. This is your Q of S and A now, your new Q of S and A. And the question is, it has there been a difference? Have there been a shift between them in time? And how can we use this to our advantage if there is indeed has been a shift in time? Well, one thing what we could do is we could say, okay, well, you know, our Q of S and A doesn't, this new value doesn't equal the old. So we're going to get rid of the old. We'll forget about the old and we'll just use this as our, our new value. But that would not be smart. And the reason for that is that in our environment, random events can have, sometimes happen. And what if our old QS of S and A was something that, you know, consistently happens like 80% of the time. And then like was represented by what happens 80% of the time. And then this new one, just what happened due to randomness. In that case, we're going to throw away the, the one that is responsible for the bulk of the situation, and we're going to replace it with something that happens only 10 or 20% of the time. That wouldn't be the best approach to go. And that's why, that's exactly why we don't want to completely change our Q values. We want to use, like change them step by step, a little bit by little bit. And that's why we're going to use this temporal difference in a specific way. So we're going to say, here's a formula. We're going to take our Q of S and A, and we're going to update it in such a way we're going to take the old value of QSNA and we are going to add alpha times the temporal difference. So alpha is going to be our learning rate. That's a new parameter that we're introducing. That's how quickly is the algorithm learning. So basically we're taking this difference and whatever it is, we're adding it on to our previous Q of SNA. Now, this formula probably doesn't make any sense, or like just by looking, it doesn't make any sense because you've got Q of SNA here and Q of SNA here. It's the same thing, so it probably should uh, negate each other. But we're going to rewrite this in a bit of a different way. So I'm just going to show you again. So I'm just adding time to these formulas. So here is Q T minus one, the previous. Here's Q T minus one, the previous. Here's Q T, the new. There should be a circle here, a red circle here as well, but never mind. And here we've got alpha temporal difference, the, the new, the current temporal difference. So you can see what we're doing. We're saying, okay, let's take our current Q is going to be equal to our previous Q plus whatever temporal difference we found times alpha. This formula over here is the heart and soul of the Q learning algorithm. This is how the Q values are updated. And it's good that we've already learned what... Q values are, what gamma is, what R is, and what all of this stuff is. And now all we need to see is that you have a previous Q value. Yes, that's good. And then what can happen is that when you take an, when you actually do take the action, when the agent takes action, he will know he'll get a reward and he'll end up in a state. And so based on that, he can calculate uh huh. Okay. So what is, what would have, what should have been the Q value of that move that I made? And now that is this part of the equation. Subtract the old Q value, gets you temporal difference. And now you need to take a alpha times temporal difference. And that's how you're going to adjust your Q value. That's what you're going to adjust your Q value by. And now just to finish off. This, this is kind of like, this is sufficient to understand what's going on. But just to clarify things even more, or perhaps maybe confuse things even more, what we're going to do is we're going to take this temporal difference or this temporal difference over here, and we're going to plug it into this formula. So we're going to take all of this part and plug it into this formula and get, end up with a huge equation. So here we go. There's our equation. So this is the full equation with uh, the temporal difference written out completely. And the reason I, I wrote this out is, well, first of all, you'll probably find this in other literature if you uh, study it. And the second thing is that it makes some things a bit more complex. Yes, the formula is longer, but it also makes some things a bit clearer. So for instance, you can see here the role alpha plays. You can see it better because look at this. Here you've got QT minus one, and here you've got QT minus one with a negative sign. So if you plug in alpha equals to one, if you put a one in here, then this 
will negate with this. So they'll destroy each other. And all you'll have left is this part. And what that means is exactly that situation where we said, all right, so you, we've got a new value, which it should have been. Let's update our Q value with the new value and forget about whatever we had previously. And as we discussed, that's not the best approach because there are random events here and we want to update things step by step. And on the other hand, if you set alpha equal to zero, what happens then is that you completely forget about this whole part and your QT, the new one or the current one, is going to be always equal to the previous one. So you're not going to be learning anything. And that means whatever is happening in the maze doesn't matter because you, you've decided on your QT value a long time ago and you're just going to keep it. And so that's why alpha shouldn't be zero or shouldn't be one. It should be somewhere in between and it's going to allow you to learn slowly step by step. It's going to allow you to, as your or the agent, as it goes through the maze, is going to get this temporal difference and slowly but and surely this value is going to get updated and updated and updated. And what will happen eventually is that at some point, hopefully, the algorithm will converge. And what that means is that this temporal difference will start becoming closer and closer to zero and eventually will be just, well, very close to zero or even zero, 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 zero. And what that means is that every single time your, your new QT value or your new calculated value, uh, what it should have been, so not this one, but what it hypothetically should have been after you take the step will be just equal to your previous QT value. And then one, and then it's zero. And that means when your temporal difference is zero, it means your algorithm has converged and it's not really necessary to continue updating what's going on. It's not necessary to continue updating your Q values. The caveat here is that the only time, yeah, probably one of the only times when you would still want to continue performing this whole, uh, you know, updating of your Q values if the environment is constantly changing. If not just, the, it's not that it just has some random stochastic events in it, but the environment itself is modifying, is is morphing, is changing with time. So you continuously need to learn because it's not possible for you to learn everything and come up with the optimal policy because the optimal policy is also changing with the environment all the time. In that case, you will need to continue calculating temporal difference and calculating the Q values. But other than that, that's kind of like an extra complication. Other than that, this is how Q values are updated. So this is the main formula of the Q learning algorithm. And this is kind of like the expanded version of that. And now it should all come together and make sense why we have the Bellman equation and not only what it represents, the Q values, but also how the agent goes about updating its Q values and finding exactly what is going on in that environment so it can come up with the optimal policy. So I know this is quite a lot to take in, but hopefully you enjoyed today's tutorial and hopefully you were able to take away uh, the underlying concepts and uh, intuition behind Q values and what the whole notion of temporal difference is and why it's important, why it helps us slowly train our agents and get them to understand their environments that they're operating in. And if you'd like to learn a bit more about temporal differences, then a very popular paper is Learning to Predict by the Methods of Temporal Differences by Richard Sutton of 1988. Uh, we've already had a reference by Richard Sutton as well, but this is, a, this is another one. And actually he has a book, so if you, if you get into you know, his writing style and his uh, style of communication, then uh, check out his book as well. It's, it's kind of like a more expanded version of all of these things. I, I haven't read the book, but uh, that's what I'm imagining. At the same time, uh, this is the link to the, to the paper and you can learn a bit more about or <laughs> probably a lot more about temporal differences there. And I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, enjoy AI. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. In the next lecture, you're going to be working on the grid world demonstration. And as an update, this lecture is to help set you up with an environment to run that without any issues. And this is because the original grid world program or files were released with Python 2.7. As we know, Python now has Python 3 available that most of us are using. But these files were originally built for more of a pure Python purpose. So you don't really need to set up or install anything. So the best option, barring any customizations or changes to the algorithm, and the grid world visualization for our demonstration purposes 
we can set up a new environment. It's really simple and this is also something really powerful to use when you're working on any projects because you can set up multiple virtual environments within Anaconda. And we're going to go through the steps so that you can set it up for this demonstration if you want to run it. Again, in the next video, you will see the demonstration. You don't need to set this environment up because it's just for grid world. But for those of you who want to follow along and want to run the commands, I would highly recommend this approach. In order to do so, please launch the Anaconda Navigator. Once you have the Navigator up, you're going to go to the Environments command. When you have the environment set up, you can find the Create option. Click on Create, and here you're going to name your environment. So we can use, let's say, Grid Test. Once you have the name, you can select the Python version. Also, quickly, as a reminder, you could have any Anaconda version. If you downloaded the most recent Anaconda, that's absolutely fine. You can set up versions within it. As you'll see, we have 2.7, the version that we want to work with in this environment. This is a separate from your root environment. You can see, as an example, I have quite a few environments set up. For any projects or applications that I'm working on, it's nice to have because you can have the version and specific library versions contained to that environment. It's highly recommended. So what we can set up is 2.7. Once we have 2.7, we have our grid test. Let's do grid test one, because I do think I already had a grid test uh, as I do. So let's do grid world test. As we have grid world test, we're gonna click on create. Let that create for a moment. While that's creating, you can have two options. You can launch an environment from here. And if you want to install, let's say Spider or Jupyter or anything like that, once you go back to the home, once it's loads, you can select the environment. So we want grid world test, and then you can install the applications on that. We don't need that right now because we're gonna be working straight from the terminal, as you'll see in the next lecture. If you go to your environment, you can click on the grid world test, click on the green arrow, and select open terminal. That is one method that you can do. We're going to open the terminal here in a second. Just give my computer one moment since it's still building. And we have it open. And you'll see that it's activated. Another option is to bring up a terminal. Let me launch this. For Mac and Windows, or excuse me, for Mac and Linux, you can use the source activate command. And then you're going to use the name of your environment. So we're using grid world test. And this would activate that environment. If you're on Windows, you do not need the source command. You would just use the activate and the environment name. So we could run this. And as you'll see, we're in the environment. Next, you can find the files for the next lecture attached to this lecture and the next lecture. I'm going to grab the files and bring them into this folder. I'm going to CD to change the directory to the location of those files. And I'm going to drag and drop them into this folder. Give me one second. Let me just bring this over. CD into this and I can always check the files. There we go. I'm going to clear this so we have the files cleared and we can see into the terminal. Now this is only for demonstration purpose just to demonstrate that it is running and executing. In the next lecture, Kirill is going to explain all the details related to the grid world visualization. But in order to run it and test it, I just want to issue the command that we were working with in the next lecture. And that is the Python gridworld.py k10 a flag and the q flag I actually don't need the flag there and the q i just want to verify that this runs so we can run a test and it is running so i'm going to exit out i'm going to clear this because we only want to make sure that the files are executing in the next lecture you're going to see the demonstration of gridworld.py and you'll see how, what the flags mean. Kirill is going to go through and explain the grid world pie setup and information. This is to just set up your environment for Python 2.7. And you can do this for as many environments or other environments that you're working with. It's just extremely helpful. All right. Hope you found this helpful and enjoy the grid world visualization coming up. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. In today's tutorial, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have a look and an artificial intelligence actually going through that maze that we've been talking about so long and is going to use key learning to navigate its way and find the way out and we'll see what happens to the Q values, what's going to happen to the policy and so on. So let's have a look. 
We're going to be using some materials kindly provided by the Berkeley University. So if you go to ai.berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y.edu, if you just go to that link, click enter, you'll see this website. And here, what we're going to be looking at is, we need to go to, where do we need to go to? Pacman Projects, I think. Yeah, Pacman Projects. And here, if you scroll down, and you look at reinforcement learning, this is what we're working with. So here you can download the zip archive. So that's if you want to. So don't you don't have to. This is We're not going to go through the solution together in this tutorial. I'm just letting you know where this is all from because we're very, like, we really appreciate that UC Berkeley has made these materials available. But if you do wish to experiment with this on your own, just bear in mind, this is not part, it's not going to be part of our course. This is part of the Berkeley course. I'm just going to show you how it works for illustration purposes. But if you do want to experiment with this, you can find it here, the zip archive and all the instructions as well. And we're just going to go into Python right away. And first thing I wanted to show you is that here we've got the um, licensing information. So this is what I mean. We're very lucky that they said we are free to use or extend these projects for educational purposes, provided you not distribute or publish solutions, which we're not going to do. You retain this notice, which we have and you provide a clear attribution to UC Berkeley, including a link to which we also have. So once again, if you'd like to learn more, there's a link, you can have a look. And thank you very much to all of these people who have worked on this project. So here's the, the grid world that we're going to be working with. There's a solution there. You would have to, in order to make it work, you'd have to either solve it yourself or possibly find a solution. Maybe some of your, some people, somebody you know might help you out with that. If, again, you want to, you don't have to because we're just going to look at it on this screen right now. So after we've created all those files, we can just launch it over here. So there are some parameters that are involved in this whole world. And now I'm going to just show you how what it looks like if we launch it. So let's try launch it in manual mode. So if I go minus M, one of these parameters here, manual. So I can manually control the agent. So here you can see our grid. So I can go up, up. So you can see that it's taking action, starting and started in state. So where I was, and then you saw you saw that I pressed up, took action north, and first time I ended up in zero one. So I did go up, but second time I took action north and I ended in the same state. I didn't move. So something happened. You know the randomness happened. I either went left or right, and by default the parameters are set. You can see here by default they're set to exactly what we discussed that um, how often action results in unintended direction 20% of the time, 10% to the left, 10% to the right. So if I go up, you see I went up, I go right, I went right, right, no, didn't happen, right again, and right, and I'm finished. But in the, in this implementation, you have to click again to get out of this final output. So you, in, out of the exit, you just click again and you're finished. That's a terminal state. So we can run again manual. You can see that if I go right, 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 left, up. So here, what we saw previously that the agent wouldn't go straight up, right? What's the point of going up if there's a chance of going into the pit? So let's see what the agent would do. It would go left, it'd go west here. So it'd go west and you see I clicked left, but it went up. And here I would click right and I end up in the final exit state. And you can see got reward equal to one. So that's what it looks like manually. Now let's actually hook up an AI to this and let it go through this. So let's do an H here and let's add some parameters. So let me just see what I typed here. So so hopefully you can see Python grid world dot py. Then here minus R means that's the reward for living. So I've got my two of them. So I probably should remove this one. So minus K is how many iterations? That's way too many iterations. Let's do less. Let's do like 10 iterations. That should be enough. Minus A is agent. What type of agent do I want to do on a random agent, some value agent or a Q, Q. So by I want a Q, uh, Q learning agent doing this. Uh, minus S is what is S speed. So that's way too th too fast. Let's just use default speed for now. Minus R is the living penalty. So by default is zero. So remember at the very start we started with zero living penalty. So let's call it also zero here or we can just remove this parameter and d is what is d discount so our discount factor so let's keep it at 0 0.9 so very similar to what we were starting off in this section of the course so let's run that okay way too fast again 
I think, oh, actually, it's so pretty okay. So you can see how he's exploring. And so, so far, he's hit the negative three times. And you can see how the Q values are being updated in these squares. So th these are Q values. They start with zero. You can see now the Q value. So he's learned that, again, this one is a bit differently implemented because once you get to the final stage, you have to get out of it. You have to just click one more button to exit. And so it's very close to one, but not exactly one. But at the same time, you can see that here, you know, the value is slowly kind of crystallizing in 0 0.8. It's slowly getting somewhere. But the rest, so far, they're kind of zeros because he doesn't have enough information to understand what's going on. Um, okay, so let's let's see. Let's see what happens here. Exploring, exploring, exploring. What's going to happen? Whoa, it's been a while. And don't forget there's some randomness involved here. So there's hit that good one a few times now. He only gets 10 iterations, so he's got to learn fast. Okay, Nini there. Let's see what's going on. Come on, get out of that maze already. And yes, 10 episodes. So average returns, uh, That does. Uh, that's, we're not really interested in that. So here, let's let's see, I, I've never seen that before. If I click right, there we go. So you can see this is the, the policy that he came up with. Even through just 10 episodes, he's already got a policy. Okay, I'm going to go boom, 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 boom. And here I'm going to go down, here I'm going to go down, here I'm going to go into the wall, and then I'm going to bounce over here. That's pretty cool. Okay, so now let's increase the speed. What was the parameter S there? And let's like double... Well, let's, let's quadruple the speed and let's increase the number of iterations. So let's say 20 iterations this time. And let's see if he can get through a bit more now. So you can see he's going a bit faster and he's learning. He's learning that it's not really, you know, out of this state, that's, there's not many good actions or, you know, these actions that the right and straight are not that good. Definitely, this one's definitely not good. He still needs to learn that. So from here, it's also not good. You can see that this action is pretty good. All right, what did he get? Okay, so interesting policy here. You, he decided to go up. Just not enough information. So let's uh, let's redo that. And let's increase the speed to like 100. So it's super fast. And the number of iterations will give him 100 iterations this time. Let's run that. See, the C is like crazy fast. And you can see that because there's so many more iterations, He's got more information, more opportunity to experiment and to actually build out this, this matrix or not matrix, these Q values for every single state he now knows. Okay, you can see that 0 0.89. What did we say in our example? It was like 0 0.86. Another thing to remember this, that re the value of any given state, remember that formula we had, is the maximum of the Q values. Remember that thing that we came up with, shortcut formula? So what is what would the value in this state be? The V of this state. It would be 0 0.89 because that's the highest out of the four. Here, the value of this state is 0 0.71. The value of this state is 0 0.61 and so on. So that's something to remember. So I remember in our example, I think we had like 0 0.86 or something. So pretty close. And so if we go next here, oh, it just disappeared. Where did it disappear? Let's do it again. And let's make it come back. Okay, okay. Slowly, slowly, slowly filling up some spaces. I see, and it's also pretty random because not only the environment has randomness, but also the way he explores at the start when he doesn't know the policy is he's exploring at random. It just keeps disappearing. I don't understand why. Anyways, let's see what happens if we increase the number here and here. Should pretty much take the same amount of time if the speed doesn't have a cap on it. Okay, so you can see it's like he has more opportunity to explore things. Okay, let's see how it all goes. And you can see the values are converging. They go up and down depending, you know, because there's some randomness and he might end up like in the pit, even though he goes like this way. But at the same time, they're slowly starting to converge to some sort of end values and Q values. Okay, probably a thousand is a bit too much in terms of time. It doesn't look like the speed is proportionately increasing as well. So it might cut that part. I mean, like reduce the speed. Yeah, wow, this is very long. You don't have to watch to the end of this tutorial. I just want to experiment with quite a bit. So to give you some like examples of what we've been working through, but you, you get the point that it goes through all of this. It has some randomness, like randomness built into its behavior. So even when it has like a policy, it will still continue exploring. So it won't just like 
once it has a basic policy, it won't just continue following its policy. It will still experiment with other variations once in a while in order to enhance its policy. Maybe it hasn't found the best policy already right away. Maybe it can improve the policy. And that's why even after so many iterations, you can still see some random effects. It's, uh, it sometimes jumps into random states, not just because of the randomness in the environment, but also because there is some level, like a parameter which you could control, which you could set up for your agent, saying that you know most of the time, 80% of the time, do whatever your policy tells you to do. But 20% of the time, you know, just have some fun, experiment and see what happens, and uh, use that information that you gather to update your policy. Okay, this is taking way too long. Let's try that again. Yeah, so that's how the agent learns in uh, in different states. Maybe let's just run one more just out of curiosity. So is there anything else we can change about it? Iterations. Da -da -da. Okay, okay, let's have a look. Yeah, well, we could change the discount, for example. So in this case, we could say K minus 100 minus a q minus s to the minus r okay 2000 so reward we want to keep it maybe let's keep it at 0 0.04 but let's say so that again let's keep the reward at minus 0 0.04 every time and then here we're going to say that d the discount is not 0 0.9 but it's like 0 0.5 so it gets discounted quite a lot as you go through the game so it actually, now it will be incentivized to be closer to the finish rather than further. Well, the states close to the finish will get high value. So you can see that the values is quickly drops off. It's not as, as green as it was before. So here you can see that the, this is the policy now. So it goes like that, like that, like that, like that. Very similar to what we saw before. Just uh, probably the only difference is from here is jumping straight into here. So that's that one. And... Okay, let's just run one more. This is so much fun. Let's just run one more. So K minus K100, AQ, discount, keep it as it was, original. So like just run this this basic vanilla setup. Okay, okay, okay. It's going, let's see if it will show us the policy at the end. Yes, we got the policy. Yes, good finish. So here we've got the policy. You know, this is familiar. Remember that time when we saw that the AI outsmarted the human, went boom into the wall to go there and boom into the wall to go like that um, to increase the probability. So there we go. That is uh, an example of artificial intelligence in action. Very, very basic, simple cue learning. So no deep learning at this stage. But at the same time, it's already pretty smart. And I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. And once again, thank you to UC Berkeley and I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello, and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. In today's section, we're tackling the topic of deep Q learning. So let's see how we're going to attack this. In this section, we will learn a deep Q learning intuition, the learning side of things. So we're going to separate deep Q learning, uh, the intuition behind it, into two parts, the learning and the acting. And we're going to have two tutorials on that. So first we'll understand how the neural networks actually learn and how they update their weights based on what we are feeding them in and how the whole concept of cue learning works. So how we're going to take the temporal difference concepts that we discussed in simple cue learning, we're going to apply them into deep cue learning. And then we're going to talk about how deep cue learning algorithms actually decide what action to take in what state. Uh, then we're going to talk about experience replay, a very important addition on top of deep Q learning, uh, which actually enables deep Q learning to work properly. And you'll see why it's important from that tutorial. And then we're going to talk about action selection policies. Uh, we're going to talk about how deep Q learning agents are able to combine exploration with exploitation. So once they found something, a good approach, they can use that approach, but also they need to explore so that they don't get stuck in a local maximum. And one more thing I wanted to mention about this section is it is highly beneficial if you have a look at annex number one, artificial neural networks. So if you go and explore all those topics, we've got some very powerful intuition tutorials prepared for you there. Uh, if you haven't done, of course, if you haven't done the deep learning course, if you've done the deep learning course, then you already know all of these things and you can proceed with the section. But if you want to get that additional knowledge about neural networks before you proceed 
with uh, this part of the course. This is highly advisable because it will help you understand exactly how neural networks work and why they're so powerful, why we're leveraging them in this deep Q learning algorithm. And once you've uh, refreshed your knowledge or uh, gained that knowledge on uh, neural networks from that annex, then come back here and we will proceed with the deep Q learning. If you're pretty comfortable with neural networks, then let's get straight into it. Let's start talking about deep Q learning intuition. And I look forward to seeing you on the first tutorial. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. And finally, we're on to the fun stuff. We're on to deep Q learning. All right, so let's have a look. Previously, we spoke about Q learning and what it's all about. And we learned about the agent, the environment, and how the agent will look at the state uh, he or she is in, take an action, get a reward, enter into a new state. And based on uh, that feedback loop, they will continue taking actions and they will learn from that, understand uh, what are the better actions to take. And so we looked at this basic example of a maze. We understood that as the agent explores the environment, it understands what the values of the states are. Then we moved on from dealing with the values of the states to dealing with the values of the actions or the Q values. And then based on that, we understood how plans in a non-stochastic environments work and uh, how policies work in stochastic environments. And this is an example of a policy. So that's a quick recap of everything we discussed in the basic Q learning. And now let's have a look at how this can be taken to the next level through deep learning, through adding deep learning. Okay, so this is our environment. And what we're going to do now is we're going to add, instead of just doing basic uh, calculations in this matrix that we have, which is pretty, pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to add two axes. We're going to add an X and Y axis, or we'll call them X1 and X2, just to make things even more general. And here we've got, to, we'll number the row, the columns, one, two, three, four. He'll, here we'll number the rows, one, two, three. And so now every single state can be described by a pair of two values, x1 and x2. So any one of these squares in which the agent can possibly be in can be described by x1, uh, x2. So for instance, right now he's in um, the square with uh, x1 equal to 1 and x2 equal to 2. And therefore, that's in, the same, in that same way, we can describe any square, meaning we can describe any state. And of course, this is a very simplified version of an environment of uh, describing states, but nevertheless, it works in this case. And that means that now we can feed this, these states into a neural network. And by the way, here, I would just like to mention that at the end of the course, we've got annexes. We've got annex number one and annex number two. In order to proceed successfully with this section, it's highly advisable that you check out annex number one, which is on artificial neural, neural networks. So you understand how they work so that we can, uh, we don't have to delve into that here and we can just use the benefits of the knowledge of how artificial neural networks work. And so we feed in this information on the state into a neural network and then it will process this uh, information, so x1 and x2, depending on the structure of the neural network, it might have multiple hidden layers and so on. So that's something that you'll figure out in the practical tutorials. But at the end, we will structure in such a way that it spits out four values. And these four values are actually going to be our Q values. So the values which dictate which action we need to take. And further down in this tutorial, we'll see exactly how these uh, Q values are used to decide which action is taken. But the main point here is that we no longer look at just uh, this maze from a Q learning perspective. We're now taking the states of the maze and we're feeding them into a, a deep neural network in order to get these Q values. And and at the end of the day, we're still going to come up with an action. We're still going to understand how what action we need to take. And we'll discuss all this in more detail. But the question right now is why? Why are we doing all of this? Why are we, why are we making things so much more complicated when that initial approach of Q learning was working already? Well, the reason for that is the Q learning was working in this very simplistic environment. And we're continuing to deal for now with this very simplistic environment in order to better understand the concepts. But at the same time, that simple Q learning will no longer work in more complex environments. And we're talking about, uh, for instance, the self-driving cars, which you'll be creating or playing Doom uh, when the, uh, the artificial intelligence is playing Doom or other Atari games like Breakout or even self-driving cars and more advanced 
a reinforcement learning things such as like robots walking around and performing actions. In all of those cases, basic Q learning is insufficient, is not strong, is not powerful enough to be able to master those challenges. And just like we've seen in the uh, deep learning course, if uh, you've been in our deep learning course, or if you've uh, done the annex sections, annex number one and annex two, you will already know that deep learning is by far superior to any type of machine learning, let alone based simple Q learning. And that's why we're leveraging the power of deep learning here. So we're feeding in the information about the environment as a vector of values. So in this case, just two values into a deep neural network. And then we're using that to perform the actions that we want to, to decide which actions the agent's going to take. So that's kind of like a high level overview of why we're doing this. And now let's have a look at in a bit more detail at what happens to the concepts of Q learning when we trans when we make this transformation from or transition from simple Q learning into deep Q learning. So as you saw in the previous intuition tutorials, uh, we had a slide like this, which is the foundation of uh, temporal difference learning. Uh, this is the formula for temporal difference, and basically, so let's go through this. So basically we had an agent who was in uh, this state over here, which is indicated by blue arrow. And we were understanding how temporal difference works for this Q value of, for instance, going up. And so what we saw here was before, this is in the simple Q learning, not the deep Q learning, this is in the simple Q learning. What we saw was before the agent had a certain Q value that he had learned about this action of going up. And so then he decides to take this action to go up. And right after he takes this action, he gets a reward for taking this action in this state. And that is the, that reward. Plus, now he can evaluate the value of the current state he's in, which is the maximum of all of the new Q values of all of the Q values of the new actions he can take a prime in the new state S prime. And we uh, multiply it by the decay factor of gamma. So that is essentially the Q the new Q value or kind of like the the empirical Q value that he has just received for taking that action. And ideally, these two, sh two should be the same. So the, act the Q value that he had in his memory about this action in this state, it should equate to the actual reward plus the gamma times the value of the state that he ended up in. And therefore, that's how we calculate the temporal difference. We take what he got after minus what he got, uh, what he had in in mind, what he was expecting. You subtract one from the other. And that's your temporal difference. And then you use your learning rate alpha to adjust your Q value, your your new Q value by the temporal difference, but with a coefficient of alpha. So that is the essence of the simple Q learning. Now let's have a look at how it changes in deep Q learning. And so we're still going to work with this slide, but we're going to just see exactly what's happening. So in deep Q learning, the neural network will predict four values. As we saw in the previous slide, and as we'll see further down this tutorial, the neural network will predict four values, or it might predict more values if there's more possible actions uh, in a given state. But in this case, we, kn we know that there's only four actions, up, right, left, or down. And so the neural network will predict four of these values. So there will be no in, in a deep Q learning situation, it's important to understand there's no before or after. And this is how we'll, we'll get to know this a bit better. So the neural network will predict four of these values. And it will compare not to what will happen after, but the neural network will compare to this exact value, but it was the this value which was calculated in the previous step. So in the previous time when the agent was in, in this exact square, so let's say... I don't know, uh, some time ago, uh, the agent was again, was in this exact square as well. And it calculated this value previously. So in the previous time, long time ago, the agent calculated this value, then the agent stored this value for the future. And now the future has come. So now he's in the square again. And now he's got these Q values, which is predicted. And one of them is for the for going up. So now what he's going to do is going to compare the predicted value of Q to this value which he had recorded from the previous time. And we'll understand exactly why this is important right now. So just important to understand here is, is there's no before and after in this specific square, this specific time. We're taking the Q value that he's predicted using the neural network this time and we're comparing it to this value which he had from 
the previous time, from the previous time he was in this square uh, assessing all of the situation and, um, you know, like uh, the previous time he actually performed this action. So there we go. Now let's have a look at how this all works out in the neural network and why why is it um, like that? I know it sounds a bit complicated right now, but we'll break it down into simple terms right? just in a second. So this is our neural network. We're feeding in the states of the environment into the neural network. It's going through the hidden layers. Then it's coming out with these outputs, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. In that specific state, these are the Q values that the neural network is predicting for the possible actions. Those are the QVLs. So then we're comparing to target. And these targets is exactly, so if we go back here, this is the target. So this is the value that was predicted. And then, but also we know that we have a target from the last time we were in the square. We have a target for this same uh, action, which is up, for instance. So here we've got a target and we're going to compare. So we're comparing Q1 versus that target. We're comparing Q2 versus that target, the target that we had from previously. Uh, Q3 versus the target, Q4 versus the target. And so this is the part where the neural network or the agent is now learning through deep learning how to better go through this maze. And the key point here is that we're still applying Q learning, but the concepts in, si in simple Q learning, you learn through temporal differences, which are pretty straightforward, which we've already discussed and we know quite well by now. But at the same time, in deep learning, how do neural networks learn? Well, neural networks learn through adjusting their weights. So we have to adapt the concepts of reinforce uh, the concepts of simple Q learning to the way neural networks actually work, and that is through updating their weights. And so this is what we're trying to figure out here: how do we adapt that concept of temporal difference to a neural network so that we can? Uh, leverage the full power of neural networks. And so far we've gotten this. So we enter our uh, environment state here as a vector, goes through a neural network, we get predictions of Q values, and then from the previous time the agent was in that state, we have these Q target, Q target one, two, three, and four for each of these respective actions. And so now we're up to, okay, let's compare each one with each one. And from here, it's uh, it becomes pretty straightforward if uh, you're up to speed with neural networks. Once again, that's all in a annex number one. We're going to calculate a loss, which is L here, and we're going to be Q target, this one, minus Q, minus this one. Uh, we're going to square that, so the square difference of the of each one of these, and we're going to sum them. So we're going to take the sum of the squared differences of these Q values and their targets, and we're going to sum them up, and that's going to be our loss. And so ideally, just as we had in, te in the temporal difference learning, so if we go back for a second, remember we said, ideally, we want this to be equal to this. So we want the temporal difference to be zero. So that's that means basically the agent uh, is predicting exactly correctly uh, what, you know, the Q values that the agent is predicting are exactly, or that he has in memory, are exactly descriptive of the environment. Uh, and therefore, the agent can navigate navigate the environment pretty well, right? There's no surprises. There's no there's no if as, as long as this temporal difference is uh, po highly positive or highly negative, then then we've got some surprises. But if the temporal difference is zero, then he knows the environment so well that he can predict what's going on, and he can and therefore his policy is going to be very good, and he's going to be able to navigate it. So here, same thing. So we want this loss to be as close to zero as possible, as small as possible. And that's why now we're going to, this is the part where we are going to leverage the real true power of neural networks. So we're going to take this loss and we're going to use backpropagation or uh, stochastic gradient descent to take this loss and pass it through the network. Pass it back or back propagate it through a network and through stochastic gradient descent, update the weights of these synapses in the network. So that next time we go through this network, the weights are already a bit better descriptive of the environment. And that's exactly how it works. So here you have, if we go back, this is calculated, loss is calculated, and it gets propagated for the network. The weights are updated. Then the next time we get here, this happens again. And we get here, this happens again, and so on. And so, and it keeps happening, and that's how this agent learns, or basically now it's a neural network, which is the brain of the agent, is learning, is becoming um, more and more descriptive of the environment, and therefore the agent is able to navigate the environment better. When we say descriptive environment, basically means that when we put in the 
states of the environment that the agent is in, um, we are more likely to get closer and closer to the actual Q values. And that happens because the Q values that we want and find the right action. And that happens because these Q targets are actually empirically derived. So he, every, how does he find these Q targets? That's because that's actually this. So he actually observes, okay, so once I do take this step, what's the reward I get? And then what's the value of this, of this state? So same thing as we saw previously in Q learning in the simple Q learning intuition. So he learns this through trial and error, and then he constructs his network or updates the weights of his network in such a way that the predicted Q values are closer and closer approximating the target Q values. So very similar uh, to the concept we discussed here in the simple temporal difference learning of uh, the simple Q learning algorithm. So there we go. That's that's how the agent learns. So we're up to here. That's the learning part. Hello and welcome back to the course on AI. Uh, in the previous part, we talked about the deep learning, Q learning intuition. We started there. And in fact, we actually got all the way to this part and where we talked about learning. And now we're going to move on to the actual acting part. So there's in the, there's two parts, two distinct parts that we have to remember. So that's the learning part. But now he actually he's done all of this. That's beautiful. Now he actually has to take an action. He has to decide what is he going to do. He's going to do action one, two, three, or four. And so how does he do that? Well, the way he does it is now given those same Q values. So the Q values don't change. After we've, we have these Q values, we've compared them, we've calculated the loss, we've backpropagated the error, we've updated the weights, but the Q values don't change in that whole process. So after we've got the Q values, they're, they're fixed. We, we know what they are. So all of this happens, the network's updated. And now using those same Q values that we had, what we're going to do is we're going to pass them through a softmax function. And again, softmax is described in, I think, in Annex 2. And we'll talk a bit more about softmax further down in, or we'll talk about this action selection policy further down in the rest uh, of this section. So just in a few tutorials. But for now, we're just going to say we're, we're passing it through a softmax function. And basically what it does is it allows, it helps select the best one. It selects the best action possible. And there's a small caveat to that. It's not just the best one possible. Uh, we'll talk about that in the action selection policy tutorial. But for now, let's just say it selects the best action from here. It says, okay, so Q1, uh, you know, the likelihood, you know, basically we know the Q values. So it's predicted the Q values. So it's, it can look at them and say, okay, so the highest Q value out of these, just as we did in the simple Q learning algorithm, it'll just look at all these four, say the highest Q value is this one, and I'm going to select that action. I'm not going to take those. And that's pretty much it. That's how it chooses which action to take, takes the, uh, takes the action. And then all of this process happens again for for the next state the ad agent ends up in, in our case, in the next square of the maze. But generally speaking, it's the next state. So there we go. That's uh, how we feed in a reinforcement learning problem into a neural network through a vector describing the state that we're in. And once we feed it in, there's two parts of the process that happen. Uh, part one is the learning. So remember that part where we compare each of the Q values with the targets, and then we backpropagate the loss through the network to update the weights so that our network is learning as we go through this maze uh, or through this environment. And also the second part is, of course, we have to act, we have to select an action. And that is where we pass the Q values through the softmax function, and or basically an action selection policy, which we'll talk about further down. And then we simply select the action that we want to take, and we perform that action. And then this whole process starts again. And then maybe the agent gets to the end, maybe the agent doesn't pass the, uh, the game, in, in any case, the game ends. And then once again, the whole the whole process repeats. The agent plays the whole game again, and then the, that uh, stops. So basically, that's that's another epoch. Every time the agent, uh, you know, the, every time the game ends, whether favorably or unfavorably, that's the end of an epoch. And then he starts again, and then he starts again, and then he starts again, and so on. So that happens, and this process happens for every single time the agent is a new in a new state. So the state is encoded here. So that's that's important. So not just for every single game that he plays, but for every single state. So he's in a state, it goes through this process, updates and so on, and it happens every single time. And so the learning happens and then the acting happens as well. Um, so that is deep Q learning in uh, or the intuition behind deep Q learning. We've got lots more to cover off. And then of course we've got the practical. And in the meantime, if you'd like to get uh, some additional information on deep Q learning. We've got 
uh, a recommended reading. So we've already spoken about uh, Arthur Giuliani's uh, series of blog posts. If you look at uh, Simple Reinforcement Learning with TensorFlow Part 4, uh, you will find the part that's relevant to what we discussed today. Uh, note that here uh, he talks about convolutions. We are not covering convolutions in this section. We're going to be talking about them in the next section of the course. So the difference here is that, so just kind of skip the convolutions part for now, and we'll talk about them in the next part of the course. But the difference is in convolutions, you're like looking, your agent is looking at the image and and therefore, he has to process an image, so an additional complication. For now, we're we're slowly, gradually building up to that. For now, we're encoding our uh, environment through. So, if you look here, we're encoding our environment, or maybe like look at this one, probably uh, encoding our environment as a or encoding a state the agent is in as a vector. So in our case, it was a very simple vector of two values. Sometimes people, even in that in that simple maze, sometimes, or as you'll see from this blog post, sometimes people prefer the one hot encoded version of that state. So basically where every single box of the maze has a, so you have like a vector of, for in our case, it would be 12 values, three by four. So it's like either, either one or a zero, depending on which element, in which box you're in, in the environment. So in a, whichever way you decide to encode your environment and the state of your environment, that's how we're encoding it. So it's basically a vector. The key here is that it's not a convolution. So it's not like an image and there's no convolution involved. So this part will come later. For us, it starts over here. And that just simplifies the process for us to gradually understand better. And of course, don't forget that uh, this blog post is written in TensorFlow and we're using PyTorch in our tutorials. So hopefully you enjoyed this uh, quick intro into a deep convolutional uh, deep, uh, not convolutional yet, uh, deep uh, key learning. And um, on that note, I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, enjoy artificial intelligence. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. All right, so I hope you're enjoying the tutorial so far. We're nearly done with the intuition. You'll soon, very soon get to the practical side of things. We've just got a few little things that we need to cover off. All right, so previously we talked about uh, how we add neural networks into this whole equation of Q-learning and take Q-learning to the next step and uh, turn it into deep Q-learning. And today we're going to add a an extra uh, important feature which you will uh, be coding in the practical side of things. So uh, Hadlan and I decided that it's important for us to cover it off in, in the intuition side of things so that you're more prepared for it when it comes in the coding side of things. So uh, as we discussed, we've got the um, network there, there's two parts that happen. First of all, it's the learning. So uh, the network actually learns with every new state. It, it uh, slowly updates its weights to get better and better and better at dealing with this environment. And then there is the acting inside the state. So after um, the Q values have been counted in the state, then one Q value selected. So today we're still going to talk about the learning part. We're going to uh, come up with a uh, interesting feature that's going to, well, we're not going to come up with this feature ourselves, but we'll talk about a feature that is uh, very important for deep Q learning, and that feature is called experience replay. All right, so here is our network. So we've just uh, uh, copied it over here. We've got that a loss that is calculated at the bottom is back propagated through a network. And let's have a look at an example of what happens to understand the problem that we're dealing with a bit better. So here is an example actually from this course. This is a screenshot shot exactly from uh, this course. This is what you'll be programming. Uh, this is a self-driving car that is driving through this uh, through this, along this road and it's it has to learn how to navigate this road. And so what is, as we discussed previously, what is this in this state? And of course, the state is not just going to be x1 and x2. Adlan will desc describe a bit in a lot more detail what the state is. It is going to be a couple of parameters uh, which um, relate to the angle of the car how, and uh, some relative uh, parameters, what the sensors are reading and so on. So there's going to be more parameters than that to describe the state. But nevertheless, it's going to be a vector of values. It's going to go through a, a neural network. And then on the output, you're going to have uh, some Q values. Again, there will be a different, uh, depending on this environment, there can be a different uh, number of uh, actions, possible actions. But we're just going to, for simplicity's sake, leave it at four just for us to be able to understand a bit better what's going on here. So 
in this case, what is the question is so far, what is this this input into this um, neural network? Or more specifically, how often do we trigger this neural network? How often does this neural network go through? Well, every time the car ends up in a new state. So the car makes a move, it ends up in a new state, and then everything goes, all that data, all that information from about the state goes through the network, Q values are calculated, error is, this error is calculated uh, based on what we discussed in previous tutorials. Um, this error is backpropagated through the network, weights are updated, then the car selects which action it wants to take, makes that move, ends up in a, in a new state. In the new state, everything starts over again. And so basically this happens every time the car is in a new state. Well, have a look at this example. I, I specifically took this screenshot because it looks, it's very well illustrates the problem that is addressed through experience replay. And experience replay is not just something that we use in this course or in this specific problem. It is something that you will see used throughout, uh, like on and on and over and over again in artificial intelligence algorithms because it is so powerful and it's so important. So look at this car. This car in this um, problem or in this environment, it, its goal is to come from, go from here to here and back. Its goal is to navigate its way here, here without crossing these walls which are made of sand. And so the car started over here, it went down and like the, its reward is based on you know how close it is to its target. So the car went from here, it went down and kept going like this, like this, like this, like this, like along this wall, along this wall. And what it's going to do next is going to turn, is going to keep going. Well, what it, we want it to do is keep going here. But let's think about it for a second. Once it got to this wall, every single time it moves forward, 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 and so on, it moves forward. So there might be like, depending on the structure environment, it could be like 100 moves here or 50 moves here. Uh, it just keeps moving forward, 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 forward. And nothing changes. Nothing really changes. Yes, it gets away further away from this target, closer to this target. That's lovely. But in terms of the surrounding environment, not many things are changing. It's still that same wall. If you're sitting in the car, you, you've probably seen this situation. When you're driving and the, the whatever you're seeing is like the environment is so monotonous that you're just seeing kind of the same thing is just passing by. But it, like, is that, imagine you're di driving through a desert and you're just seeing the same thing. It's the same sand. It's the same sand. Nothing is happening. Nothing is changing. And so basically, but every single time we're putting that state, that new state into here. Y yes, of course, uh, something might be changing. For instance, you're driving the car and your GPS is showing you're closer to your destination. So one of these uh, inputs is changing. But a lot of these other inputs, the sensors, for instance, which are on the car, uh, they're not changing. And therefore, as you're driving, so in this state, you put input the inputs into your neural network here, 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 and here, and here. All the time, the inputs are pretty much the same. And so if you keep inputting the same inputs, the same values, the same vector, or very similar vectors into your network, because there is no variety, the car will learn very well one thing, you'll learn very well how to drive along this wall, which is on its right. And so that's how the network will update. And it will get rewarded. It will slowly start getting rewarded for driving so well. It will be like, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll from here, it'll be start learning. Oh, I'm doing so good. I'm doing even better. I'm doing even better. It will it will have this uh, this false perception that it's actually doing very well, even though it only learned how to drive along this wall. And so the neural network will become very adapted to driving along this wall. And then all of a sudden there's this curve and the car doesn't know what to do. And it completely doesn't fit in with this neural network. And even if it does adjust somehow, uh, let's hypothetically say it passes this part and then it ends up on this wall, same thing is going to happen. It's going to drive from here, here, here. Okay, now the neural network is restructuring itself to adapt to this wall. And then bam, this thing happens. And then even if somehow it gets past that, it'll drive past this thing. And then same thing along these lines. So basically, it's like a very vivid example of the problem that we're ha what we have is that because the way we're using the neural network, updating it with every single state, once we have lots of consecutive states, they don't even have to be the same, but there is in, in environments, it's normal that consecutive states are somehow correlated or somehow interdependent. And we don't want that interdependency to bias our network. We don't want the car to just learn uh, how to drive along 
like a straight line or along a curved line or um or, or like anything that you think uh, that you can think of in uh, in life where an agent would be navigating an environment wherever you can think of correlated or uh, interdependent states that come after another that can really mess up your neural network if you're just going to let the agent learn from that and that's where experience replay hap- comes in what what happens in experience replay is these experiences so these states that it's in one two three however many 50 states here in a row they don't get put through the network right away they're actually saved into memory of the agent um, and so, for instance, it saves all these, it saves all these, and some at some point, once it ge- reaches a certain threshold, which you'll be able to code, and Adlan will show you how to do that, once it reaches a certain threshold, then the agent decides for itself, okay, it's time to learn. I have, I have this batch of experiences that I have, and now I'm going to learn from that batch. And so it randomly selects a uniformly distributed, and uniformly is key, is important here because that's something we'll, we'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll mention that, but it takes a uniformly distributed sample. Uh, so basically all experiences are considered to be equal. It takes a uniformly distributed sample from that batch of experiences that it has. And then it, uh, goes through them and it learns from them. So it, it doesn't, take all the experience it just takes a uniformly distributed sample so it might take a couple from here a couple from here a couple from here and it and each experience is characterized by the state it was in uh the action that it took the state it ended up in and the reward it uh it achieved uh, through that action in that specific state so four elements in each experience state one action state two and reward and so it takes all those experiences and then it passes them through the network and it learns. And that way it, um, it breaks the pattern of that bias, which comes from the sequential nature of the experiences. If you were to put them through the network one after the other. So that's the main focus of experience replay. That's, that's what the problem it addresses. And another benefit of experience replay is that sometimes in an environment like this, you might have very valuable rare experiences. So for instance, I don't know, let's say, let's look at this corner, right? This is a, this is a right corner, right? And a very sharp one. How many sharp? So it'll be coming from here. Um, assuming it's going to be hugging this corner. Um, so how many sharp right corners do we have in this, in this whole environment? We only have one right corner here and one right corner here. Uh, right? So when it's coming this way, that's a right corner. And then when it's going back, it's a sharp right corner here. So, and this one's not sharp. This one is sharp. So there's only one opportunity in the whole environment to uh, learn from a sharp right corner. And, um, that, that's a very, that's an important experience because it might get really good at driving along straight lines, get really good at doing like soft corners like that, like that. But, and then it will keep messing up this sharp right corner simply because, um, simply because is only, it doesn't have that much opportunity to learn from it. And so therefore it will learn everything else pretty quickly, but it'll take a long time to le- learn this right corner. It's, it's a very simplified example. It's a very simplified, um, explanation, but it, it illustrates the concept that sometimes there are rare experiences, which are, which can be valuable. And if you're just doing a simple neural network where you're putting in your values here and, you know, they're going through, and, you know, like, even if we forget about that problem of the sequential nature of experiences and how they can be interdependent or correlated, even if we forget about that for a second, what happens is once you put an experience in, it goes through, the network's updated, then you instantly forget about, forget about that experience, you move on to the next one. That's just how the neural network works. Then you move on to the next state, the next state, the next state, the next experience, next experience, next experience, and so on. So this right corner, as soon as it goes through the network, it's gone. And you don't have any memory of that valuable experience. Whereas with experience replay, because you're putting these experiences into batches, um, you can organize your batch as a rolling window. So for instance, you could have like a hundred batches. So hundred L experiences in your batch. So when it's coming back from here, it's, uh, as soon as it has this, uh, recorded this experience in its batch, then like at some point it ru- runs, it uh, takes a uniform distribution from its batch of experiences. And then there's a rolling window. So it forgets these experiences, but then it keeps these experiences. And then again, it, it learns from, once it's here, it learns from this batch. And then once it's here, it forgets all the way up to here, but then it 
uh, has a batch of experiences like that. So therefore, now it learns from these experiences. And that way, uh, what you're getting is that this right-hand corner, it might come up several times in its learning process because it was in that batch when the batch was like this, around there, then it was in the batch here, in the batch here. So it came up in several batches because a batch might be updated as a, a rolling window of experiences. So the older experiences get kicked out, the newer experiences are added, and then again, older experiences get kicked out. So an experience uh, it stays in the batch for quite some time, and the car or agent can learn from that experience several times. So that's another advantage of experience replay. And of course, the final advantage is experience replay gives you an opportunity to learn from more experiences uh, than if you were just learning from one at a time because you have that batch and therefore, and, and it's a rolling window. And therefore, even if your environment is limited to experience, your experience replay approach can help you learn faster. And uh, instead of just redoing the environment many, many, many times, you can learn faster because you, you don't have to redo it. You have those experiences saved. So those are the main advantages of experience replay. Let's recap on them. We've got the, uh, we're breaking the pattern of independence and correlation of uh, sequential experiences. Uh, we save rare experiences, which might be important, and therefore we can learn from them more often. And uh, we can learn in environments, we can learn faster environments, which are experience, um, which, which have shortage of experiences or which uh, don't have that many experiences that the agent goes through and still we can be able to learn that. So that is what experience replay is all about. Um, if you'd like to read a bit more, then this is, there's an interesting article published by DeepMind in 2016. It's called Prioritized Experience Replay. And it talks about uh, why, why are we using a uniform distribution to select our experiences from the experience batch. Why don't we find a better way to select our experiences and prioritize some of the experiences which we feel that are important? And so it's quite an interesting thing. So in this case, you will be able to not only reinforce, <laughs> not only reinforce your knowledge on uh, experience replay, but you'll actually be able to move with the cutting edge of technology. So this is 2016 and published by DeepMind. So it's a very recent, very uh, powerful paper. So you'll be able to actually explore um, the limits or explore even further this algorithm and take it to the next level. So I'll leave it up to you to find out why and how we can um, change the uniform distribution to a different approach to experience replay from this paper if you'd like. And I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial and uh, now we know what experience replay is and we can uh, confidently use it in our practical tutorials. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. I hope you're enjoying the course so far and today we're talking about action selection policies. All right, let's dive straight into it. Previously, we talked about adding a neural network to our simple Q learning and so far we're getting quite into deep Q learning. We've talked about the learning part quite a bit, uh, including adding some elements to it and today we're talking about this part. We're talking about the acting. So let's have a look. So here we've got what we discussed about the acting that once you input the values, uh, the parameters or the vector describing the state the agent is currently in, in that environment, then uh, that is after all the learning is done or be even before the learning is done, basically we get all the Q values. So we're not interested in the learning right now, we're interested in the acting. So once we have these Q values, how do we understand which one we need to use? Well, if you think about it, Q values are simply, these are the predictions for the Q values. So as we did in the simple Q learning algorithm, what did we do? We just selected the one with the best with the highest Q value. Once we have the one with the highest Q value, uh, we just take that action because it just brings us the highest Q value and, the, and that we know that Q value is calculated as the re immediate reward that we expect to receive plus the decay factor times the value of the next state and it's, it's a recursive calculation. So why not? Why wouldn't you take the best Q value and that's kind of the, the end of it? But uh, as you can see here, it's not as simple. Here we're using a softmax function. And this is where we're going to talk about action selection policies. So here, in reality, we don't have to have just a softmax function. We can have different action selection policies. Uh, for example, we've got epsilon greedy, uh, epsilon soft, and we've got the softmax. And those are kind of like the, the most commonly used action selection policies. Of course, there are others. For instance, the most basic one is 
here's a, a very simple action selection policy, just select the best, uh, the one with the highest Q value. But why doesn't that action policy fly? And why do we have different types of action policy, action selection policies? Well, it all boils down to exploration versus exploitation. And that is the the core of reinforcement learning. Because we've already talked about this a little bit, that your agent, when it's operating in an environment, it might predict certain Q values, which which might be good, and it might and, and it might not turn out great. It might turn out that those Q values are bad, and it'll be forced to explore. So, if we, for instance, in this case, predict that Q two is the best one, and then it takes Q two, takes action two, and it it uh, so from here it takes action two, and then it gets uh, it gets a very negative reward. Then the environment is forcing the agent to go and explore because now it's going to learn that oh actually. Uh, I thought Q2 is going to be very good, but it turned out very bad. Uh, so, so the result turned out very bad. So the network is going to update itself. So next time he's in this state, he's going to probably, he might still choose Q2 if it was, you know, like, uh, if it was very, very favorable. So you might think that that's like, uh, you know, he might need a couple of times, a couple of penalties, uh, or punishments in order to learn that Q2 is a bad action. But maybe he'll already soon learn that, okay, I'm going to take a different action. I'm going to take uh, the, this action because now it has the best Q value. So sometimes the, the environment forces the agent to take different, uh, to explore different actions. But sometimes the agent might get it, find itself stuck in a local maximum. It might find that it found like through through its initial exploration, it found that oh, this is a pretty cool action. Like I'm going to go right here, and that that's a pretty cool action. But the problem is that it thinks it's the best action simply because it hasn't explored. It's explored going up. It's going explored going left. It's explored going right, but it hasn't explored going down from that specific uh, state that it's in. And now that it's uh, kind of like biased towards this action, it thinks it's a good action. It's going to keep taking. It's going to keep getting. Uh, it's going to keep taking this action. It's going to keep getting a good reward. But what if this action would have been even better? If this action would have been so much better uh, that if it knew about this action, it would actually switch to this action. But the, because it got stuck in a local maximum and it's getting these good rewards, it's just going to be reinforced. It's just going to keep reinforcing itself that, or the environment is going to reinforce it that this is a good action to take, keep doing that. But real, the reality is that there's this other action that it hasn't found yet or hasn't ex even explored that would have been much better. And so what we want to do is we want to come up with an action selection policy that allows our agent not to get stuck in a local maximum. Yes, it's important to you know keep doing the good actions. That's the exploitation part. We want to exploit what we've found. But at the same time, we still want to explore. We never want to stop exploring. It's like, like in life, you never want to stop learning. You stop learning, you die. That's, that's There's a saying like that, that when you're not growing, you're dying or something like that. So you want to keep learning and your agent wants to keep learning. And that's where these action selection policies come in. So we've got three listed here. So the first one is epsilon greedy. It's it's a very simple one. It sounds pretty complex in the in the sense that oh, like it's got a cool name and usually things with such cool names are complex. It's not. It's actually not. So basically, what it does is it will select the one with the best Q value, and and uh, epsilon like epsilon greedy. You might hear it in other places. It's it's just like a, a selection policy. So in this case, we're using it to select uh, select uh, our out of our Q values out of our action. So you'll select the one with the highest Q value all the time, except for epsilon percent of the time. So for instance, if you set epsilon to ten percent, then uh, you're going to or zero point one, then ten percent of the time, the action is going to be selected at random. So ninety percent of the time, you're still going to be selecting the best action based on the highest Q value, but ten percent of the time is going to be selecting a random action. Uniformly, just going to be absolutely randomly taking an action. Or if you set epsilon to zero point five for zero point zero five, that means that ninety five percent of the time the Agent is going to be taking the action with the highest Q value, but 5% of the time, it's still going to be selecting a random action. So it's going to be uh, going out there and exploring. So Epsilon Soft is very similar. Oh, by the way, that, that's kind of like why it's called Epsilon Greedy, because the uh, you're greedily selecting the action, the good action, except for that little Epsilon percent of the time. So the, the lower the Epsilon, the lower the Epsilon, uh, the more greedily you're selecting that uh, kind of the action that is the optimal action, and the less you're leaving, less chances you're leaving for exploration. Epsilon soft is the opposite. So basically, uh, you're selecting 
at random, you're selecting one minus epsilon percent of the time. So if your epsilon is like 0 0.1, so 10%, then only 10% of the time you're taking this action and 90% and of the time you're selecting a random action. So very, very simple, just inverted algorithms. And softmax is kind of like the next step from, or it's, it's a more advanced version, I would say, of epsilon of the epsilon greedy algorithm, although they both have merit and they both have place, uh, we're, we're going to be using softmax in our coding, in our uh, practical side of things. So that's why we're going to talk in a bit more detail about softmax. So let's have a look. So let's move on to softmax. Hopefully it's pretty clear about uh, epsilon greedy. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward algorithm. Select the, uh, this one uh, most of the time, except for sometimes go and explore. And, and now we also see why it's important to do that exploration so that we don't end up in local maximums in our in our optimization process. So now we're going to talk a bit more about softmax. Um, there's a tutorial on softmax at the end of the course in, I think it's in annex number two, where we talk about the concept behind softmax. I'm just going to refresh a little bit here. So there we're talking about convolutional neural networks. And by the way, we aren't going to be covering convolutional, we're not covering convolutional neural networks in this section of the course. In this section, we're still using a vector, uh, but in the next section of the course, when we're uh, we're creating an AI to play Doom, we are going to be using convolutional neural networks. So it uh, could be beneficial for you to look at convolutional neural networks uh, and then, take the softmax function, or you can learn a bit more about softmax after you take the convolutional uh, neural networks annex of the course later on. But uh, here's a quick refresher. So here we've got a convolutional neural network, which decides whether it's a dog or a cat. So here we've got um, uh, the voting process between these neurons. And this one says that it's a, it's got the features, you know, the fluffy ears, uh, what's uh, the pointed, pointed face type of thing. And um, the kind of like the features, the other types of eyes, the, eye, uh, the, the way the eyes look, all these features that belong to a dog. So it's a 95% chance that it's a dog and a 5% chance that it's a cat. But the question is, how did we get, uh, and in that uh, tutorial, we're talking about how did we get these values to add up to one? Well, whatever the convolutional, uh, our whole neural network, so the convolutional neural network plus the fully connected layers, whatever it's spat out, whatever the values it spat out, we applied a softmax function over here. And this is where we introduced the fa uh, formula for the softmax function. This is what it looks like. And then we got these values. And so basically that's a quick uh, refresher. This is the, the formula for the softmax. It's, what it does is it takes however many outputs you have, doesn't matter, uh, it will take them and it will squash them all into values between zero and one, regardless of how big they are. Just by looking at this formula, you can see that the, there's a total sum at the bottom. So these values are going to be zero between zero and one. And also the, all these values are going to add up to one always. And so that's, uh, that's very beneficial for us uh, because when we're using the softmax function, uh, what happens is uh, we get these Q values, we, we select this best Q value, but in reality, what happens is these Q values that we get, they're, they're actual numbers, right? So there's some kind of numbers. Uh, they don't have to all add up to one. They don't have to be between zero and one, just some numbers. But when we apply softmax, we don't just select the best one. We actually get numbers like that. So we get numbers in the range between zero and one. And that are also that also add up to one. And so, what other thing do we know that adds up to one? Well, probabilities. We know that probabilities always have to add up to one. So th that is why we can say here we've got Q values, but here all of a sudden we've got soft uh, or we've got probabilities. So we can say that the likelihood of this being the best action is ninety percent. This best being the best action is five percent, two percent, three percent. Because we know the higher your Q value, the better the action. And so if we squash them to zero to one, then these become probabilities and we can deal with them as such. And therefore, now is when uh, the action is selected and that's how we come up with Q2. But if you look at it closely, this isn't a strict 100% and these are not strict 0%. So this is a 5%, 2%, 3%. So the, the most natural way to apply the soft max in order to preserve exploration in the algorithm is to use these exact probabilities as uh, how often we're going to be taking that action. So these probabilities actually represent the distribution of 
these actions that we're taking. So basically, Softmax makes it very easy for us to come up with a way to combine exploitation and exploration. So the be the best action will always have the highest probability because it has the highest key value. And therefore here, we're going to be just we're going to use these as our distribution. And we're going to say, okay, we're going to be taking Q2 90% of the time. But 5% of the time, we're still going to be taking Q1. And 2% of the time, we're going to take Q3. And 3% of the time, we're going to be taking Q4. And the beauty here is also that as these values update, as the, as the agent goes through the network more and more and more, it uh, becomes uh, more familiar with, uh, with the environment and therefore these updates. So this value, for instance, might become uh, like it might, might ascertain that this value is actually less or this actually is higher. And so these probabilities will uh, also change as an uh, agent goes through. So even though here we've got Q2, nobody is to say that sometimes 5% of the time, to be more precise, we'll be selecting Q1 as the action to take. And sometimes, or action one will be taking action one. Sometimes we'll be taking action three, two, uh, action three, two percent of the time, and action four will be taking about three percent of the time. So every action has a chance to play uh, in this process as long as we have enough uh, iterations and the agent goes through lots and lots of times through these uh, states that they're in. And that's that's how this that's how any kind of um, uh, deep learning algorithm works. That you want to do this many 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 times so that. Uh, you learn from experience and uh, therefore as you can see here it's a very natural transition to we're not just randomly like an epsilon greedy algorithm we're not just randomly selecting um, the actions we're selecting them based on their softmax values which makes it uh, makes it like has some logic behind it not just not just at random 10 percent of the time we're selecting a random action but there's some logic behind how we're doing it and based on their the q values that we've explored and so that's uh, the action selection policy that we're going to be using in this course. You're welcome to definitely check out the Epsilon Greedy action selection policy if you like, uh, but we're going to be predominantly using uh, the Softmax uh, action selection policy. And I've got an interesting reading for you. So this is called Adaptive Epsilon Greedy Exploration in Reinforcement Learning Based on Value Differences. It's a 2010 article. And it's interesting because uh, Mike Michel, I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Michel or Mikel, Tokik introduces a different type of algorithm, so an adjusted epsilon greedy algorithm and uh, called the VDE, VDBE algorithm um, or epsilon greedy VDBE algorithm. You can see it over here. And he actually compares, uh, compares it to the epsilon greedy and softmax and it's an epsilon greedy algorithm which uh, basically the main idea behind it is to um, adjust the value of epsilon depending on the state the agent is in. So if the, if the agent is very certain about the state they're in, then epsilon should be smaller. So there should be less exploration. If the agent is uncertain, epsilon should be higher, should be more exploration. So it is a 2010 article. Um, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if this, um, a new proposed algorithm is widely used or is has been accepted um, in the community or or the, if artificial intelligence has moved kind of away from uh, this this suggestion but nevertheless it will definitely help you reinforce your knowledge about um action selection policies which we discussed the epsilon greedy and the softmax will help you it'll give you an opportunity to compare them side by side and also see in which direction people actually think when they want to improve artificial intelligence so if you're ever planning on creating really uh, interesting algorithms that are pushing the edge of artificial intelligence and pushing the envelope in this space, then this could be a good way for you to see in, in which direction people think sometimes when they're trying to improve uh, the norms of artificial intelligence or the norms that existed back then in 2010. So there we go. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, today's tutorial about the action selection policies. We learned about Epsilon Greedy, Epsilon Soft, and the Softmax. And now you're even more prepared for the practical side of things. And on that note, I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello, and welcome to the first module of this course, Self-Driving Car. Now that you have PyTorch and KB installed on your system, we are ready to start implementing the self-driving car. And I can tell you we have an exciting adventure ahead of us. So the first thing we're going to do now before we start is set the right folder as working directory. That's very important because we are going to have three files to implement this car and all the cars are connected to each other. 
So when you execute a file, it will take the classes, functions, and objects from another file, and this other file has to be in the same working directory as the file that you're executing. That's why it's very important to have one same folder with all the files, and that is your working directory folder. So let's just get this done, and then we will be able to start. So first thing you do is go to File Explorer here. That's this window, and then you will probably be on your desktop, so right now, as you can see, I'm on my desktop, or maybe you'll be in your documents. But anyway, you have to find the folder that contains your artificial intelligence A to Z template folder that you downloaded from the SDS website that Kirill walked you through. So just find this folder, then open it from File Explorer, then go to Module 1, Self-Driving Car, and then there you go. This Module 1 Self-Driving Car folder contains three files, that's the three files that are connected to each other to implement not only the self-driving car on the map, but also the brain of the car, that is the AI that will be integrated to the car. And so this folder containing these three files is your working directory folder. And now to make sure that this folder is set as working directory, you can click on the tool button here and then restart kernel. Then you can click on yes, and there you go. Now you are sure 100% that this folder containing your three files is set as working directory. Okay, and so now before we start, I would just like to explain quickly what are these three files. So as you probably recognized, the first one here, ai.py, is the file that contains the brain of the car. So you know that's in this file that we will implement the artificial intelligence that will be integrated to the car. So that's why I'm calling it the brain of the car because this artificial intelligence is based on a neural network. So it will be like the car will have a neural network inside of it. That's why I like to call it brain. Then the second file here is a kiv file, car.kv. And you cannot open it here in Spider, but you can open it from a text editor. And actually, that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm opening it with Sublime Text. There we go. That is Sublime Text. And this is this car.kv file opens in Sublime Text. For those of you who are on Windows, you can open it with Notepad++. So here is what the KV code looks like. We're not going to focus on it in this course because this is only related to KV, but basically to understand what's going on here, well, as you can see, we create several objects that will be on the map. So for example, this first object here is the car. And for this car, you can define some variables like the angle, that is the angle of rotation. Then you can define the shape that you want your car to have. So it will be a rectangle, like the basic shape of a car. Then you have some other objects, ball one, ball two, and ball three. So these three balls here will be, as you will see later, the sensors of the car, because the car will have sensors that will detect if there are some obstacles around the car. So these three balls here are just to highlight the sensors on the car. So we will see them. And besides, I set a different color for each of them. And then we have a last object, which is to connect all the previous objects together to make the car, because the sensors will be attached to the car so that when the car moves, well, the sensor moves as well. All right, but this is not the most important here, so we're gonna move on to Python. This is just to show you what KV looks like, and this file, of course, will be connected to our other files, and mostly it will be connected to the third file, mat.py, which is this one right here. And mat.py, what is it? Well, this is where we make the whole map, and also the whole game, because you will see that we will be playing some games with the car. You know, we will give it some challenges, like avoiding some obstacles or doing some round trips between two destinations on a more and more difficult road. So we will make a game, and that game happens in this big file here. So this file is important, therefore we're gonna see it in details. However, since this is not directly related to AI, we will not code it line by line. I will just explain each line of code. Besides, in the template folder you'll find the same code as this one, but commented. So each line of code will be commented so that if you're interested in knowing how to develop a game within a KV application, well, you will be able to understand everything that we do here. But what's important also is that not only we make the map and the game, but also we make some important connections between the map and the future AI that we will implement afterwards. And by the way, this is much more important and therefore we will implemented step by step. We will write together each of these lines of code. But for the map, I will just describe all the code sections here. 
And that's what I will do in the next section, right after this tutorial. I think the next two tutorials are important for you to understand the connection between the map and the AI. All right, so I will be explaining all this in the next tutorial, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello, and welcome again to our self-driving car module. So in this tutorial, I'm going to explain the environment on which we will implement our artificial intelligence, and that will contain, of course, the car that we will train to drive itself and to avoid obstacles, and on which we will draw some roads and some blocks for our car to navigate around them. So we will later build this artificial intelligence to train this car to drive on the road, you know, without crossing the limits and avoiding some obstacles that we will put inside the road. So this is a pretty exciting challenge. And actually, there are two separate files, as you can see. There is the AI Python file. That's our artificial intelligence that will do all the training to train the car how to self-drive. And we have the map.py file, that is the code that makes all this environment. So here is that code that's actually 200 lines of code, a little more. So this code is not typically related to AI. It is just the code to make the environment, to make the map. So I'm going to go through each of the sections one by one to explain, but we're not going to implement this code line by line from scratch because we want to focus on artificial intelligence. But let's still go through the sections one by one to understand what's happening. So first, we import the essential libraries. That's for any code. We need some libraries to perform some tasks more efficiently. Then we import all the KyV packages. So that's not very important because this is all specific to KyV. We're using KyV to make the map. And so we're importing a lot of classes and objects to be able to make this map and add some tools in the map. All right, then this line is important. This line is AI related because basically this is where we import our brain, the brain of the car, which will be an object of this DQN class. And the DQN class is our artificial intelligence itself. You will see we will implement the DQN class in the following tutorials. And as you might have guessed, DQN stands for Deep Q Networks. So we will implement a Deep Q learning network. And then once it's ready, we will be importing it here with this line from the AI. And the AI is, of course, our AI Python file. All right, so can't wait to implement this. This is going to be quite a journey, but you will see this is going to be very exciting because thanks to the AI, the car will be able to drive itself. All right, and now before I move on to the next sections, we have to explain how we will train this car. I'm not going to explain the neural network right now, but I'm going to explain the idea of how we're going to train the car to drive itself and to avoid obstacles. So you know in real life, if you want to train a real car to avoid some walls or some obstacles, well, what would you do? You would definitely not take real walls or real big obstacles and smash your car onto them. That would cost you a lot of money. Instead, a more intelligent idea would be to punish your car not when it smashes a wall or an obstacle, but when it goes onto some sand. So it's like you have a field, this field has some roads on which the car has to stay, and the roads are delimited by some sand. And each time the car goes onto the sand, it's like it's going onto an obstacle. Because once the car goes into some sand, it will be slowed down, and we will make sure that the car is penalized, is punished for that. And that is one essential point of our artificial intelligence. The bad reward comes whenever the car goes onto some sand and is slowed down. All right, and therefore, here I'm introducing last x and last y, which are the coordinates of the last point in memory when we draw some scent on the map. All right, and then we get our artificial intelligence, which we call brain, and that contains our neural network, and we will call it brain because this is actually the brain of the car, and that contains our neural network. All right, so in this line of code, as you can see, I'm creating an object of the DQN class. I will remind what classes and objects are, but brain is the object, DQN is the class, and 5, 3, and 0.9 are the inputs of the class. So that's very simple. 5 corresponds to the states that are encoded vectors of five dimensions. We will see what they are, perfectly describing what's happening in the environment on the map. Then 3 is the number of actions. There will be three possible actions, go left, go straight, or go right. And 0.9 is the gamma parameter in the deep Q learning algorithm. 
All right, and then we have the action to rotation. So action to rotation is a vector of three elements, 0, 20, and minus 20. And so we have to do this because the actions are encoded by three numbers, 0, 1, and 2. And that corresponds to the indexes of this action to rotation vector. So for example, if the action that is selected at time t is 0, well, 0 corresponds to the index of this action to rotation vector. And the value of index 0 is 0. And therefore, we will go straight. Then, if the action selected is 1, well, 1 corresponds to the index of this action to rotation vector. And the value of this vector that has index 1 is 20. So 20 corresponds to a rotation of 20 degrees. And that means the car will go 20 degrees to the right. And then, if the action selected is 2, well, 2 corresponds to the index 2 of this action to rotation vector. And therefore, the car will do a rotation of minus 20 degrees. And therefore, it will go to the left. All right, then, we introduce the last reward variable because at each state we will be getting the last reward so remember if the car doesn't go onto some sand then the reward will be positive and if the car goes onto some sand well it will get a bad reward and at each time this variable will contain this reward that it gets at each time t and then we initialize the scores which is a vector that will contain the rewards not all of them but the rewards onto a sliding window so that, you know, we can make a curve of the mean score of the rewards with respect to time. All right, then in this code section, we initialize the map. So we initialize, for example, the send variable. So that's important. The send variable is actually going to be an array in which the cells will be the pixels of the map. And in each cell, we will have a 1 if there is some send and a 0 if there is no send. At the beginning, we will not be drawing anything, so there will be no send at all. And therefore, all the cells of the send array will have a zero. So there will be zeros everywhere. And as soon as we draw some send, well, the cells on which we draw the send will get a one. And we initialize the arrays with all the zeros right here. Send equals np zeros. Then we have this important thing, which is the goal. So the goal is a point in the map, which we will train the car to reach. So it's like a destination. So what is this goal going to be? Well, this is going to be the upper left corner of the map. So we will train the car to go to the upper left corner of the map. And then once it reaches the upper left corner of the map, then we will train it to go to the bottom right corner of the map. So we can imagine the following scenario. The upper left corner of the map is the airport of a city. And the bottom right corner of the map is the downtown of the city. And we will train a taxi or Uber to do some round trips between the airport and the downtown. And of course, we'll make the task difficult to this taxi by drawing some more and more difficult roads and adding more and more obstacles on the street to see if the taxi can still manage to go from the airport to downtown. So this is going to be fun. And so that's why here I'm setting the coordinates of the first goal, that is the airport, which is at the upper left of the screen. So the map will be like a square like this. And the coordinates of the origin that is the coordinate 0, 0, is right here. And then larger is this distance here. So the coordinates 20 and larger minus 20 will therefore be right here, the upper left corner of the map. And why did I choose 20 and not 0? Well, that's because we want to train the car not to rush into the walls. You know, we want to train it to avoid the walls as well. And therefore, the goal must not be 0 because we don't want the car to touch the wall. We want to touch the goal. So we have to put it right here. And then I'm just introducing the last distance variable, which just gives the current distance from the car to the goal and that I'm initializing to zero. All right, and now time to make the car and the game. So we're gonna make two classes, one class for the car and one class for the game. And inside these classes, we will already make some connections with our AI. So we'll do that in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this tutorial. In the previous tutorial, we initialized the map and now time for the exciting stuff. We create the car and we do that with a class. Of course, you will see that the class is very practical to create some things that have a lot of properties, because as you can see, not only I'm defining some variables for my car, but also some functions, which of course is the function that will make the car move to the left 
to the right or going straight. So we have a couple of variables that are important to describe the environment. We have, for example, the angle, which is the angle between the x-axis and the axis of the direction of the car. Then we have the rotation, which is its last rotation, which remember is either zero degree, 20 degrees or minus 20 degrees. Then we have the velocity, the x coordinate of the velocity vector and the y coordinate of the velocity vector, and then the vector of coordinates velocity x and velocity y. Then we have the centers and the signals, and that's very important. The car that we're making will have three sensors, sensor one, sensor two, and sensor three. Sensor one will be detecting if there is any scent in front of the car. Then sensor two is the sensor that will detect if there is any scent at the left of the car. And sensor three is the sensor that will detect if there is any scent at the right of the car. And then from these three sensors, we get the signals. That is the signals received by each of the sensors. So signal one is the signal received by sensor one, signal two is the signal received by sensor two, and signal three is the signal received by sensor three. And so how does it work? Signal one is the density of sand around sensor one, signal two is the density of sand around sensor two, and signal three is the density of sand around sensor three. And how do we compute this density of sand? Well, that's very simple. We take some big squares around each of the sensors. These are actually squares of 200 by 200. And for each of the squares, we divide the number of ones in the square by the total number of cells in the square. That is 20 times 20 equals 400. And that gives us the density of sand because the ones correspond to the sand. We do this for each sensor and that gives us the density of sand around each sensor, that is, the signals. All right, so now we have everything to detect the sand, and then we have the move function. And of course, the move function is what will allow the core to go to the left, going straight, or going to the right. So let's go through it quickly. We have here the update of the position of the car with its last position, which is self.pos here, and the velocity vector. So thanks to the velocity vector, the position will be updated in the direction of the velocity vector. Then we get the rotation, which we will get further down in the code right here. Rotation equals action to rotation action. Here we will select the action and then getting the rotation. And so this self rotation equals rotation here is this rotation that we get to know how we need to rotate the car that is going to the left or to the right. Then we update the angle which I remind is the angle between the x-axis and the axis of the direction of the car. And then once the car has moved, then we have to update the sensors and the signal. Because of course, when the car has just rotated, well, the sensors have rotated as well, and therefore we need to rotate them by using the rotate function and to which we add the new position. And why do we have this vector of 30, zero? Well, that's simply because 30 is the distance between the car and the sensor. You know, it is the distance between the car and what the car detects. And then once the sensors are updated, well, then it's time to update the signals. And so here we do exactly what I explained to compute the signals. We get the X coordinate of our sensor. Then we take all the cells from minus 10 to plus 10. Then we do the same for the Y coordinate, taking all the cells from minus 10 to plus 10. So therefore we get the square of 20 by 20 pixels surrounding the sensor and inside this square we sum all the ones so basically we sum all the cells because the cells contain either zero or one and since in a 20 by 20 square there is 20 times 20 equals 400 cells well we divide it by 400 to get the density of ones inside the square and that's how we get the signal of the density of sense around the sensor and we did the same for the second sensor and the third sensor to get the second signal and the third signal. Okay, so that's to detect the send. And then the three lines of code here are very important. It's another bad reward that we want to give to our car when it is reaching one of the edges of the map. You know, we don't want the car to rush into some walls and therefore we want to penalize it, to punish it when it's getting too close to a wall. And therefore that's what we do here. If the first sensor is larger than longer minus 10, that is larger than here because longer is this distance here so longer minus 10 is right here 
So if sensor one X larger than longer minus 10 concerns all the points that are here, that is if the car is getting closer to the right edge of the map, or if cell sensor one X lower than 10, so that's right here, if the car is getting closer to the left edge of the map, or if sensor Y is larger than larger minus 10, that's the upper edge of the map, and or if self sensor Y is lower than 10, that is the lower edge of the map. And so if the sensor one is reaching any of these four edges, well, we will put the signal of the sensor, signal one is the signal of sensor one, we will set it to be one. And what does that mean? That means full send, like a full density of send. It's like the worst send you could get. There is so much send that it's going to stop your car. So signal will be one, and therefore the car will get a terribly bad reward. All right, and then we do the same for signal two and signal three from sensor two and sensor three. All right, and then we create the game class. So that's basically the class to create the game because so far we have only created the car. And now, of course, we have to create the map. We have to create the game itself. So we will not be playing the game. It's our AI that will be playing the game. And the game is actually to avoid the obstacles and to go from the airport to downtown and vice versa. So in this game class, we need to create some objects like the car. Then we need to define the update function. That is the most important and actually we will focus on that right now because that's in this update function that we will select the action that the car has to do at each time to accomplish its goal. And this action is exactly the output of our neural network the neural network that will be at the heart of our artificial intelligence. And so this action is returned by the brain of the car, which I remind is the object of our DQN class that we'll be making in our AI file. And this object has a method that is called update, and it takes as input the last reward and the last signal. So the last reward is of course the last reward obtained by the car, and the last signal is of course the last signal of the three sensors. Signal 1 from sensor 1, signal 2 from sensor 2, signal 3 from sensor 3. But then I'm adding two other inputs, which is the orientation of the car with respect to the goal. So for example, if the car is heading towards the goal, then the orientation will be equal to 0. If it goes slightly to the right, then the orientation will be close to 45 degrees. And if it goes slightly to the left, the orientation will be close to minus 45 degrees. So that's the fourth input of our input state. And then there is a last input, which is minus orientation. So usually the inputs of a neural network are independent. There is no multicollinearity, but it doesn't really matter if we add this because the neural network will just fix that with the weights. But still, I noticed that by adding this minus orientation, well, that allows the car, the training of the car to stabilize the exploration. You know, we're doing this so that the AI doesn't always explore in the same direction. By adding this minus orientation, we make sure that it explores in both directions, right or left. And so this, the three signals plus the orientation and minus orientation are the five inputs of our encoded vector, which will go into the network. That's our input vector that will go into the network. And after it goes into the network, well, the network returns the output, which is the action to play at each time. And the output is returned by this update function that contains the network itself and the outputs of the network. And therefore, that's why we have to input the last signal, that is the input state, and also the last reward because the action to play also depends on the last reward. All right, and then we update the mean score of the rewards. We update the rotation. We use the move function to rotate the car according to the action that was selected. We update the distance of the car to the goal and we update the positions of the sensors. Ball 1, ball 2 and ball 3 corresponds to the balls that will represent the sensors on the map. You will see that very quickly. And then here, that part is very important because that's where we penalize the car if it goes onto some sand. Because as you can see, this means if the car is onto some sand, well, it will be slowed down. So that's where we reduce its velocity. You know, its velocity is usually 6, as you can see here. And if it goes onto some sand, it will be 1. So it will be slowed down to 1. You will see how the car will be slowed down once it goes onto some sand. So it is slowed down, and besides, it gets a bad reward. It gets a minus 1 reward. And that's actually the worst reward you could get. 
the best reward is 1, the worst reward is minus 1, and the reward is between minus 1 and plus 1. And then otherwise, if the car isn't onto some sand, well, it keeps its usual speed, speed of 6, and then we add something else. If it's getting closer to the goal, then it will get a slightly positive reward, and if it's getting further away from the goal, well, it gets a slightly negative reward, minus 0.2. And then, last conditions that are related to the reward. Well, that's if the car is getting too close to one of the edges, as we spoke of earlier. Remember when we talked about full sand? Well, if the car is getting too close to the left edge of the map, it gets minus one reward. If it gets too close to the right edge of the map, it gets rewards minus one. And if it gets too close to the bottom edge of the map, it gets reward minus one. And if it gets too close to the upper left of the map, it gets rewards minus one. So that's a terrible punishment. And so you will see how it will learn fast not to rush into some walls. All right, and then this is to update the goal when the goal is reached. So, you know, when the car reaches the airport, which is the first goal, that is the upper left corner of the map, while well, the goal changes to the bottom right corner of the map, which is downtown. And that's exactly what we do here. We update the X coordinate of the goal and the Y coordinate of the goal. And then we update the distance from the car to the goal. All right, and then that's less important. That's just a class that will add the painting tools, you know, for us to be able to paint some roads or some obstacles on the map. So that's more related to Kyv. You can have a look if you want. I'll provide the commented version of this code and I'll provide some reference if you want to go deeper on how to do that with Kyv. But we're getting further from artificial intelligence, so I'm not going to go into the details of it. And that's the same for the last code section here with the car app class. That is just to add the API buttons, clear, save, and load. So that's what we do here, clear canvas, save. And that's actually very important. That's for us to be able to save the AI, you know, to save the brain so that you can reuse it later by taking the load function, which is another tool we add on the map to load the brain of the car. That is to load the memory of the car, how to navigate in the map. And then finally, we have the last of the last code section, which runs the whole thing, that is, which runs the map and the AI itself. And actually, that's what we're going to do right now. Let's have a look at everything we make in this code. So right now, the AI is not implemented. So the car will have a very random movement. It will actually look like an insect. But don't worry, we will fix that. Not only we will train it to move like a real car, and train it to navigate following some roads and avoiding some obstacles. So let's do this. I'm going to select everything and execute. And here is the map and here is the car. All right, so that little thing here that you see that looks like an insect is our car. So as I told you, the actions are totally random. So at each time the car selects randomly an action whether to go straight to the left or to the right. So that's why it is making some nonsense movements and that's why it's looking like an insect. So we will fix that, of course. And of course, since the AI is deactivated, well, it is not going to the goal, which is the airport here, or to downtown at the bottom right of the map. And we will fix all this by making the AI. So we will implement the AI into this car or this insect. So you can see the three balls here, the yellow one, the red one, and the white one. That's our three sensors. So that's what will detect if there is some sand around it. And speaking of sand, well, let's draw some. So to do so, I just need to do a click left here and, you know, drawing some sand by still clicking left. So right now I'm adding some sand. We can add some more. So each time I'm adding sand, as you can see, that's putting ones in the sand array. That's the sand array. That's the zero, zero coordinates of the origin. And here there are a lot of ones. And as you can see, well, that's good to see the car just went onto the sand and was slowed down. So as you can see right, right now, it is really slowed down because it's going onto the sand. And right now it's trying to escape. And so, you know, what we'll do is we will draw some roads and uh, we will draw some roads from the airport to downtown. 
and we will train the car to stay in the road and to avoid the obstacles. All right, and as you can see, there is the clear button to clear the sand. There is the save button to save the brain of the car. And actually there is the score curve that we spoke of. So that saves the AI, that saves your model actually, the brain of your car. And then you can, you know, when you leave your code or turn off your computer and you want to go back to it again, you can use the load button to load your model, that is to load the brain, and that will get the trained AI of your car. All right, so now I can't wait to start making the AI. This will be a lot of fun. We will make our neural network and we will punish the car as soon as it doesn't do what we want. So let's do that from the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this tutorial. All right, so now we are going to implement our artificial intelligence from scratch. We're going to code it line by line. And in this first code section, we're going to import the libraries. But before we start with this first code section, I would like to explain the connection between the AI and our map.py file. That is, why are we implementing this for the map? What is the purpose of our AI and where will we be using it? So it's actually very simple. We're only making our AI to select the right action at each time. So, okay, we import the DQN class from our AI file. So we will be making this DQN class in this file. But then we import it only to select the right action to play at each time. And we select this action exactly at this line. Action equals brain update, last reward, last signal. Last signal will be the input of the neural network. You know it's composed of the three signals of the sensors plus the orientation and minus orientation. So that's the input. But then the output is the action to play and that's only what we'll be taking from our AI file that we're about to make. So keep that in mind, it's very simple. We first import the DQN class from the AI, then we create the object brain from the DQN class, which takes as input the encoded vectors for the states of five dimensions, the three signals plus orientation plus minus orientation, the three actions, go left, go straight, or go right, and then this gamma parameter. That's the only parameters of the DQN class that we will be making. And then, once we create that object, we select, in the game class, the action to play at each time. And that depends on the last reward and the last signal, which is the input. And that's all. That's the only purpose of making this AI. That's in order to have a real artificial intelligence playing the right actions at each time, the right move, instead of having random actions like we observed in the previous tutorial. All right, so let's do this. Let's implement our artificial intelligence. And as we said, we're gonna start by importing all the libraries that we'll be using to implement it. So that way we will have all the tools we need. All right, so let's start with the first one. The first one is the inevitable, the NumPy library. The NumPy library, I always recommend to import it. It's the library which allows us to play and work with the arrays. And this NP here is just a shortcut more convenient when we want to use NumPy. All right, then the second library is random. So this is just because we will be taking some random samples from the different batches when implementing experience replay. So we have to import this random library as well. Then we will import OS. That will be just useful when we want to load the model because you know, once the model is ready, we will implement some code to save the model and then another code to load the model. That's when we want to, you know, save the brain and load the brain. Whenever you want to shut down your computer and reuse the brain that was trained before for some new experiment. So that's important. Then we are going to import the torch library essential. That's because we will be implementing our neural network with PyTorch which I recommend much more than the other ones for artificial intelligence because it can handle dynamic graphs. So there we go with Torch. Then from Torch, we are going to import torch.nn. The nn module is the most essential one. That's the module that contains all the tools to implement some neural networks. And of course, there will be a deep neural network that will take as inputs the three signals of the three sensors plus orientation and minus orientation, and will return as output the action to play. 
Well, actually, it will return the Q values of the different actions. And using a softmax, we will return the action to play. Only one, the most relevant one to accomplish the car's goal. So torch.nn, most essential one. Then we're going to give a shortcut to the functional package from, here we go, the functional package from the NN module. So this functional package contains the different functions that we use when implementing a neural network. So typically the loss function, we will be using the uber loss because that improves convergence and the uber loss is contained in this functional submodule from the NN module. And since all this is pretty long, we're going to give it a shortcut and we're going to call it F simply. Then only three modules to import left. So the next one is another essential one, which is Optim. And we take it from still the torch library and then Optim. There we go. And let's just call it Optim instead of torch.optim. So that's of course for the optimizer. We will be importing some optimizers to perform stochastic gradient descent. So we will definitely need it. And then we need to import Autograd and that's only to take the variable class from Autograd. So the purpose of it is a little bit technical. Basically, we need to import the variable class to make some conversion from tensors, which are like more advanced arrays, to a variable that contains a gradient. So it's like we don't want to have only a tensor by itself. We want to put the tensor into a variable that will also contain a gradient. And to do this, we need to use the variable class to convert this tensor into a variable containing the tensor and the gradient. So that's a little bit technical, but that's what we have to do when working with PyTorch. And we do this thanks to the variable class, but before getting the variable class, we need to import torch.autograd and let's give a shortcut as well, autograd. And then from torch.autograd, we import variable. There we go. And now we have all the libraries that we'll be using to implement our AI. So we won't bother importing any other library. We have all the tools we need. And now we're ready to create the architecture of the neural network. So that's exactly what we'll do in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so we have very exciting tutorials ahead of us. We are going to start by creating the architecture of the neural network. That is, we will make the neural network that will be at the heart of our AI and that will return the action to play at each time t. So let's do this. So since we want our neural network to be an object, we're going to make a class and that's because it's much more convenient. You know, a class is the model of something we want to build. We want to build a neural network and we need to make some kind of instructions which will all be contained in a class. And in this class, we're going to make two functions. First, the init function, which is the function that comes up all the time when making a class. And that basically defines the variable of your object. That is the neural network. You know, the variables attached to the object as opposed to the global variables. And so this is in this init function that will define the architecture of the neural network. You know, defining the input layer, which will be composed of five input neurons because we have five dimensions for the encoded vector of input state. Then we will define some hidden layers. Maybe we'll start with one hidden layer and then you will be welcome to try some other architectures of the neural network. And then of course we will end up with the output layer that will contain the possible actions that we can play at each time. So that's exactly what we'll do in this init function. And then we will make another function still inside the class, which will be the forward function. And that will be the function that will activate the neurons in the neural network, you know, that will activate the signals. And so we will use a rectifier activation function because of course we're dealing with a purely nonlinear problem and this rectifier function breaks the linearity. But mostly we're making this forward function to return the Q values, which are the outputs of the neural network. But we have one Q value for each action and later on we will be returning the final action by either taking the max of the Q values or using a softmax method. We will see that afterwards. So in this tutorial, we're gonna start by implementing the init function, and in the next one, we will be implementing the forward function. So let's do this. First, we need to introduce our class, 
So we start with class, then we give a name to our class, which is, well, we can call it network. And then in this network class, I'm going to use an object programming technique, which is called inheritance. And that is just to inherit from all the tools of a parent class. So our network class that we're about to make is a child class of a larger class, which is nn.module. So that's just to inherit from all the tools of this module class, which are of course the tools to implement a neural network. So that's a very powerful and efficient trick in object-oriented programming. That's called inheritance. And right now we are inheriting from this module parent class. All right, and now we're ready to go inside the class. So I'm pressing enter twice actually, because we'll be making two functions. And we're starting with the init function. So the init function, we have to name it this way with two underscores, then init, and then again two underscores. That's just Python syntax. That is just how we have to do it. And then we need to input the arguments. So we have three arguments. The first one is a compulsory argument. That is actually self. And self, there is no mystery about it, that refers to the object that will be created from this class that we're about to make. You know, we're making this class. It's like some instructions, some model of this neural network we want to build. And then once the class is ready, we can make as many neural networks as we want. And each of these neural networks will be some object of this class. And since we'll be using the object for some other purposes, we need to spot what are the variables of the object. And to spot this, we are using this self here to specify that we're referring to the object. So whenever I want to use a variable from my object, I will use self before the variable to specify that this is a variable of the object. All right, so that's the first argument. And then we have two other arguments, which are, of course, the number of input neurons and the number of output neurons. So the number of input neurons, we're going to call it input size. And that's actually five, because our input vectors have five dimensions, the three signals, plus orientation, plus minus orientation. That's our vectors of encoded values that describe one state of the environment. These five values are enough to describe a state of the environment. We could have thought of less values or more values, but that's what I tried. And it actually makes sense because we actually need one signal from the left, one in front of us, and one at the right. You know, when we're driving a car. We could have gone for a 360 signal, you know, like the signals at the top of the Google cars, but we can totally self-drive with three centers. And then we have this orientation and minus orientation to, you know, keep track of the goal that we're trying to reach. And then we have, of course, the output neurons of our neural network, which correspond to the actions. And we have three possible actions, going left, going straight, or going right. And therefore, I'm going to call it NB action. And there will be three of them. All right, but so far we only have to give names to the inputs and then we'll use these variables to do the computations inside the neural network. All right, then I'm going to start by using another PyTorch trick. This trick is the super function. That's a function that actually inherits from the NN module. So that's why we had to use inheritance to inherit of the module tool. This is the first tool we use. And so basically, we're only using this super trick, this super function, to be able to use the tools of module. So that's much more efficient. And inside this super function, I just need to specify first the network. So that's our network child class, you know, because this is inheriting from the module parent class, and then our object. And then I'm just adding dot and our init function, like this, exactly how we named it. All right, so that's just a trick. That's just to use all the tools of nn.module. Then we can move on to the next step, which is to specify the input layer. So basically what I have to do is introduce a new variable that will be attached to the object. And this variable will contain the number of input neurons. So not to be confused with input size, input size is the argument of the init function, but that's not the variable that is attached to the object yet. The variable that is attached to the object, well, as I just mentioned, we need to specify that it is instead attached to the object, so we use a self. 
dot, and now we give a name to this first variable attached to the object. And so we can simply give the same name as the input. We can call it input size. And we will say it is equal to the argument of the init function, that is input size. All right, so each time I'm creating an object from the network class and I'm specifying the input size, like for example, I'm inputting five, there will be a five here. And therefore, the input size variable of our object will have the value of five because this input size here will be five. And therefore, our neural network will have five input neurons in the input layer. All right, and then that's the same for the other variable that we want to attach to our object. And as you might have guessed, this is going to be a variable for the number of output neurons. And so same, we take our object, self, and then we give a name to this second variable of the object. We're going to call it nb action. And this will be equal to this argument here, giving the number of actions, that is the number of output neurons. And so we set it equal to nb action. So actually, nb action will be equal to three. Therefore, the variable nb action attached to our object, to our network, will get the value of three. Actually, we can see a warning here. It says undefined name nn. Well, that's because here we use the nn shortcut and we need to use the shortcut here, nn, for our torch.nn module, and then it will disappear. Here we go, perfect. Right now we have no warnings. All the warnings here are just to specify that what we import is not yet used, but that's okay, we will be using them afterwards. All right, then we have another two variables we want to define for our object, and this will be the full connections. The full connections between the different layers of our neural network. So since right now we want to make a neural network composed of only one hidden layer, well, there will be two full connections. There will be one first full connection between the input layer and the hidden layer, and one second full connection between the hidden layer and the output layer. So let's start with the first full connection. We're going to call it fc1. And again, I use self here to specify that fc1 is the variable of my object. So self.fc1 which will be equal to, and now we use the nn module, and we're going to use a function called linear, and that's exactly to make this full connection between the neurons of the input layer to the neurons of the hidden layer. And what do I mean by full connection? That means that all the neurons of the input layer will all be connected to all the neurons of the hidden layer. And so to make this full connection, we use this linear function to which we need to input some arguments. And as you can see, these arguments are in features. So that is the number of neurons of the first layer we want to connect. Then the out features, that is the number of neurons of the second layer we want to connect. That is the layer at the right, that is the hidden layer. And bios equals true. So bios equals true, we will keep the default value. That's in order to have a bias and not only some weights attached to the neurons, we'll have the weight and one bias for each layer. And so, well, let's see what we need to input. So the first argument in features is the number of input neurons in the input layer. And so what is it? Well, that's actually input size. That's the argument of our init function, which later will be equal to five, the three signals, orientation and minus orientation. So here we go. We input the first argument, input size. And then the second argument is out features. That is, that is the number of neurons we want to have in the second layer, the second layer that will be fully connected to the first layer. And so now the question is, how many neurons do we want in this hidden layer? Well, I did a lot of parameter tuning. I did a lot of experimenting. That's what we do in AI, or that's what we do in deep learning in general. We do a lot of experimenting to see what would be the best neural network for our specific problem. And so I tried many values and I ended up choosing 30, 30 neurons in a hidden layer, and you will see that with this number, we will get some pretty good results. But then, feel free to change the architecture of the neural network, feel free to play with it. You can not only change the number of hidden neurons in the hidden layer, but also you can add some more layers, so that maybe you get an even better car. But 30 hidden neurons will get us a good neural network and a good car. So that's what we go for, and there we go, we have our first full connection ready. With this linear function, we make the full connection between the input layer and the hidden layer. 
And now, time to make the second full connection, that is the full connection between the hidden layer and the output layer. So there we go. We're going to call this second full connection FC2. There we go. And still, this is a variable from our object, so I'm using self here. And then, again, we use, well, actually, we can copy this because we're going to use the NN module and then the linear function. But then we need to change the arguments, of course. First, that's the same. First is the number of neurons we want to have in the first layer of the full connection. So that's the hidden layer. And therefore, that is 30. And then second argument is the number of neurons in the second layer of the full connection. And that corresponds to the output layer. And the output layer has NB action neurons, which later will be three because we have three possible actions. But so far, we have to use the names we defined, that is the names of the argument of the init function, and therefore we input here NB action. And there we go. First of all, our two full connections is ready, and second of all, our init function is ready. So that's what will initialize our object whenever we create an object from the network class. And so as soon as we create an object, well, all these variables, the four variables here, input size, NB action, FC1 and FC2, will be defined, and that's how we'll get the architecture of our neural network for each object that we create. Each object will correspond to a neural network of five input neurons, 30 hidden neurons, and three output neurons. So there we go. We are done with this first init function, and now we can move on to the second function, which is the forward function, and that will be used to activate the neurons in the neural network using the rectifier activation function and mostly to eventually return the Q values, which are the outputs of our neural network. So I can't wait to do this in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so we just built the architecture of our neural network with the init function of our network class. And now we're going to make a second function, which is going to be the forward function and that's the function that will activate the neurons. That is, it's the function that will perform forward propagation. So let's do this. Let's make this function. Let's call it forward, as we just said. And this function is going to take two arguments. First is, as usual, self. You know, to be able to use the variables of the object because we're going to use fc1 and fc2. So we need this self to be able to use these variables. And then we're going to need a second argument, which is our input. And we're going to call it state, because state is exactly the input of our neural networks. You know, that's the state that are the inputs entering the neural network. And then as outputs, we will have the Q values of the three possible actions, go left, go straight, or go right. But we don't need to input it as an argument here, because that's exactly what we want to return. So this forward function is not only going to activate the neurons, but also and mostly it will return the Q values for each possible action, depending on the input state here. All right, so that's the two arguments we need. And now let's go inside the function and let's specify what we want it to do. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is activate the hidden neurons. And we're going to call the hidden neurons by the variable X. So X represents the hidden neurons. And so how are we going to activate them? Well, of course, we're going to take our input neurons we're going to use our first full connection FC1 to get the hidden neurons and then we're going to apply an activation function on them which will be the rectifier function. So how are we going to do that? Remember, we imported the torch.init.functional module that contains all the functions in PyTorch to implement a neural network and we gave it the shortcut F. So actually what we're going to do now is we're going to use one of these functions from the functional module and this function is the relu function. So what is relu? Relu is the rectifier function that you saw in the intuition lectures. That's just the name given to the rectifier function. But since this function is taken from nn.functional, which was given the shortcut f, we need to type here first f dot, and then that's where we can take this function. And actually, if I type re, here we go, we have the relu function. So that's the rectifier function that will activate the hidden neurons, that is x. So in this relu function, now we understand perfectly what we have to input. That's the neurons that we want to activate. That is the hidden neurons. 
And so to get these hidden neurons, we're going to take our first full connection, FC1, which we will apply to our input neurons to go from the input neurons to the hidden neurons. So let's take our first full connection, FC1. But our first full connection is a variable of our object. Therefore, we need to type here first self dot FC1. Here we go. That's the first full connection of our neural network. And inside this first full connection, we're going to input our input states to go from the input neurons to the hidden neurons. And so since we gave it the name state, well, here we have to input state. And there we go. We now get activated hidden neurons. All right. And now that we have the hidden neurons, we are going to return the output neurons. So next line. And as you understood, the output neurons correspond to our actions, but these are not the actions directly. These are the Q values because we're building a deep Q learning model that combines a deep learning model to Q learning. And therefore we use Q learning here to get the Q values for each of our actions. And then later using a softmax or an argmax, we will get the final action. So here, the variable I'm about to introduce will correspond to the output neurons. And since the output neurons are the Q values, well, I'm going to call this variable Q values. There we go. So Q values. And now we directly take our full connection, which is the variable FC2, but a variable from our object. So we take here self.fc2. And of course, here we input the neurons of the left side of this full connection. That is what we got from the first line, which is X. So X, there we go. We now get our Q values. That's the output neurons of our neural network. Okay. And then last line of code, of course, this forward function is used to return these Q values. So we just have to add a return and simply Q values. And that will return the Q values for each possible action, go left, go straight, or go right. All right, so congratulations, we're done with our first class. And actually, we're done making the architecture of the neural network. Remember, this is not a finished job. You can always improve the architecture of the neural network by trying different ones. So feel free to do that by adding more neurons here. For example, if you want to add 50 hidden neurons, you can just replace the 30 here and the 30 here by 50. 50 and 50 and then you can add some more hidden layers by making some new full connections well that's really the job of an artist there is no general rule of what would be the best architecture in each situation so that's why we have to experiment but let's already try with that you will see that we will get eventually a pretty good self-driving car all right and now we're going to make the next class which is about experience replay and we will be making that in the next three tutorials until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so in this new code section, we are going to implement experience replay. So we're going to make a new class, which we will call replay memory. And that will implement experience replay exactly as you saw in the intuition lectures. But first, let's give a quick reminder about what is experience replay. So, you know, all this artificial intelligence is based on Markov decision processes. And Markov decision processes consist of looking at a series of events. So the events are, you know, for example, going from one state ST to the next state ST plus one. But if the events were like that, well, since the next state is very correlated to the current state, well, the network would not be learning very well. So for those coming from the deep learning course, that's exactly the same as where we learned our time series with only one time step. It was not learning anything because one time step was not sufficient enough for a model to learn to understand long term correlations. So that's the same here. And that's why we have to implement experience replay. So how does it work? Well, that's very simple. Instead of only considering the current state, that is only one state at time t, we're going to consider more in the past. So exactly like for our LSTMs. And therefore, our series of events will not be st and st plus one. This will be, for example, the 100 states in the past. So ST minus 100, ST minus 99, up to ST minus 1, and then ST. So in other words, we put the 100 last transitions into what we call the memory. And that way we have a long-term memory as opposed to a short-term memory, or even, should I say, an instant memory. And that makes the whole deep Q learning process work much better. And then 
once we create this memory of the last 100 events, we will sample, that is, we will take some random batches of these transitions to make our next update, that is, our next move, by selecting the next action. And therefore, in this replay memory class that we're implementing for experience replay, we will make three functions. First of all, the init function, as usual, that's the case for any class. And so in this init function, we will define the variables that will be attached to the future instances of the class, that is the future objects that will be created from this class. And so very simply, these variables will be the memory of the 100 transitions, the 100 events, and the capacity, that is the 100 number. You will be welcome to try a longer memory by increasing the capacity. So that's the first function, init function. And then we'll make two other functions. One push function to make sure that the memory doesn't ever contain more than 100 transitions. And for this, we'll use the capacity by just doing one simple if condition. And then eventually we will make the sample function. And that will be, of course, to sample some transitions in this memory of the last 100 transitions. All right, so let's start by introducing the class. So as usual, we start with class and then we give a name to the class. So we call it replay memory. And then in parenthesis, we input object then colon, and then here we go, we start with the first function, the init function. So that's exactly the same as before. We start with def, then two underscores, init, two underscores again, and then the variables. So there is of course self, which is the variable attached to the future instances of the class, the future objects. And then we're gonna have another variable for you to be able to try some other experience replay, some other memories, and that's going to be the capacity. So this capacity will simply be the number 100 because we're going to make experience replay with the 100 last transitions. All right, and then colon, and here we go. Let's go inside the function and let's define the variables of our replay memory objects. So the first one will be self.capacity. And as you probably understood, this will be the capacity that is the maximum number of transitions we want to have in our memory of events. And this will be equal to the argument we will input when creating an object of the replay memory class. And therefore that is capacity. That's the argument of the init function. So capacity. So again, not to be confused, self.capacity is the name of the variable that is attached to the object. And capacity here is the argument we will input when creating an object of the replay memory class. All right, and then we have a second variable. That's of course the memory. So self.memory. All right, and so what will this memory variable be equal to? Well, this memory is supposed to contain the last 100 events, and therefore this should be a simple list. You know, a list which will contain the last 100 events, the last 100 transitions. And to initialize the list, there is nothing more simple. We just add some brackets like that. And here we go, our memory is initialized. So of course, at the beginning of the experiment, or more precisely, the beginning of the exploration, the memory will be an empty list. And then we will put the transitions each time we reach a future state. And speaking of that, that's exactly what we will do with the next function that we're gonna call the push function. We will make this push function to append the events in this memory list, and then we'll use the capacity to make sure that this memory list always contains 100 events and never more. All right, so let's do this in the next tutorial, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so now we're gonna make the push function, which will do two tasks. First, it will append a new transition or a new event in the memory, and then second, it will make sure that the memory has always 100 transitions. I'm saying 100 because we gave the example of 100 events in the previous tutorial, but in fact, this will be much more than 100. This will be rather maybe 10,000 or 100,000. We'll see. But anyway, this value will be the capacity. All right, so let's make this push function. So as usual, we start with def to define a new function. And then we give a name to this function. So we call it push. And this function will have two arguments. First, as usual, self, 
that refers to the object. And the next one, what do you think that will be? Well, remember, this push function will be used to append a new event in the memory. We already have the memory, so what we need now as a variable is an event. So that will be our argument, our input, and we will append this input in the memory, which is a variable of the object. All right, so event, you can actually call it event or transition. That's the same. And you will see in the next code sections what exactly is this event, what form it has. Actually, I can tell you now, this event, this transition that we're adding to the memory is a tuple of four elements. The first one is the last state, that is st. The second one is the new state, that is st plus one. The third one is the last action, that is at, the action that was displayed. And the fourth one is the last reward, the last reward obtained, that is rt. So that's exactly the form that this event will have. All right, and that's all. We just need the event because we just want to append the event to the memory and then making sure that the memory has capacity elements. All right, so now let's go inside the function. So the first thing we'll do is append the new event to the memory. And that's very simple because we're gonna use the append function. So that will be direct. And when we use the append function, we must start with the list to which we want to append something. And this list is of course memory. So we start with memory. And since memory is a variable of the object, we start here with self.memory. There we go. So self.memory and then we add a dot and then the append function, which is the first one. So append and inside the append function, we input what we want to append to memory, which is of course our event. So event here. And that will append the new event composed of the last state, new state, last action, and last reward to the memory. All right, so that's the first thing done. And then the second thing we need to do is make sure that the memory always contains capacity elements. So let's say capacity is now 100,000. That's probably the capacity we'll choose because then 1 million elements might make the training slow. So let's say 100,000. Now we're gonna make sure that our memory always contains 100,000 transitions, 100,000 events, and never more. So of course, at the beginning, it will have one, then two, and three, but then once it reaches 100,000 events, well, it will always have 100,000 events. So to make sure of it, we simply need to make an if condition with this upper bound that we don't want to go over. So if, okay, so the idea that we'll use here is that if we go over the limit, well, we will delete the first transition, the first event of the memory. And therefore, we're gonna take the length function to take the length of the memory, that is the number of elements in the memory. So here in the length function, we input self.memory, that's the memory. So if the number of elements in self.memory is larger than the capacity, well, in that case, we will remove the first element to make sure that the memory always has the same number of capacity elements. And to delete the first element, there is nothing more simple. We're gonna use another function, which is the del Python trick. So del, and therefore we want to remove the first transition, which is the oldest transition in the memory, because the last transitions are the ones that we append, and therefore that's the newest transitions. So the first transitions are the oldest one. And so here we want to delete self.memory and bracket, and we take the first element of the memory, which has index zero. So self.memory zero. Now, interesting, I have a little warning, which says that there is an undefined name capacity. That's because the capacity here is not the input. That must be the capacity variable attached to the object. And therefore here we need to add a self, self.capacity. And now the warning is gone. So now you understand even more the use of self. That's really to refer to the object, to take the capacity of the object that will be created, that is an instance of the replay memory class. All right, so we're done with this push function. And so now we can move on to the next function, which is the sample function, which will take some random samples from this memory of the last capacity elements. And doing this will improve a lot the deep learning process. All right, so let's do this in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI.
Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so we have one last function to implement in our replay memory class. That's the sample function. And that's of course to get some random samples from our memory. And therefore this function will return these random samples. All right, so let's implement it. We are going to call it sample. Here we go. And this function takes two arguments as input. The first one as usual self, our future object of the replay memory class. And the second argument is, can you try to guess? Well, we're taking some samples, a fixed size, and therefore we need to choose a size for our samples. And more precisely, we call it a batch size. So that's the name we're going to give to our second argument, batch size. And there we go, we have our two arguments, and now we can implement the sample function. So, now I just want to warn you, this is going to get a little technical but I'll try my best to explain. So we're going to start by creating the samples variable. This is just the variable that will contain the samples of the memory. All right, so samples equal. And so now how are we going to get these samples? Well, first of all, we have to take our memory because we're getting these samples from our memory. Then we will probably need the batch size because the samples we want to get contain batch size elements. So we need memory, we need batch size, and then we need some PyTorch or Python tricks to get the good format of these samples. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write the line of code, and then I'm going to explain it element by element. So let's do it. I'm starting by taking a zip function. I'm going to explain very soon what it does. And inside this zip function, I'm going to add a star. I'm going to explain that as well. A star and random.sample. So random, as you might have guessed, is the random library that we imported here. So that's the main reason why we had to import this random library. It's because we're taking some random samples. So from this random library, we're going to use the sample function. So this is our variables, and this is a function. So I'm going to add some parentheses. And now, as you can see, sample is a function, and we have to input some arguments. So as you can see, the first argument is self. And actually, speaking of self, this corresponds to self.memory, the memory of our future instance object of our replay memory class. So I'm going to add here self.memory. And then the second argument is, as you might have guessed, the size of the batch we want to take randomly from our memory. And that we gave it a name that is batch size. So the second argument is going to be batch size. All right. So the line of code is typed, and now I'm going to explain what it does. So first of all, with this random.sample function, we're taking some random samples from the memory that have a fixed size of batch size. So that's understandable. But then what does this zip star function does? Well, there is no mystery about it. It is just like a reshape function. So for example, I'm going to add a little comment here just to explain that I'm going to remove it. So let's say that, for example, we have a list of the following elements. For example, first one, two, three, and then the second element four, five, six. So we have a list of two tuples of three elements, one, two, three, and four, five, six. Well, then if I apply the zip function with the star on it, well, what will it become? So zip star list is going to be equal to a new list, but of a different shape. And this different shape is going to be 1, 4, then 2, 3, and then 5, 6. All right, so that's just what it does. It just reshapes your list. Okay, so now that you understand what this zip star list does, well, now let's explain why we have to do it. So, as you understood, we're going to add the events to the memory. And the events have the form, first, the state, then the action, and then the reward. But for our algorithm, we don't want this format. We actually want our samples to have the following format, a format composed of three samples, one sample for the state, one sample for the actions, and one sample for the reward. So, for example, let's say that this 1, 2, 3 is state 1, action 1, reward 1, and then state 2, action 2, and reward 2. Well, what we want is 
one batch for each, one batch for state one and state two, one other batch for action one and action two, and a third batch for reward one and reward two. That's just the format that is going to be expected next, because then we'll wrap these batches into a PyTorch variable. And a PyTorch variable, remember, is a variable that contains both a tensor and a gradient. And that's in order to be able to differentiate with respect to a tensor. To be able to differentiate with respect to a tensor, we need the structure of a variable containing a tensor and a gradient. Again, that's how PyTorch works. So to summarize, we're creating one batch for each of the states, actions, and rewards, and then we're going to put each of these batches separately into some PyTorch variables, which each one will get a gradient, so that eventually we'll be able to differentiate each of them. All right, so that's the purpose of this zip function. So let me just remove this comment. And now the only thing that we have to do left is to return the samples. So as I just explained, we cannot return the samples directly for the simple reason that we want to put the samples into a PyTorch variable. So to do this for each of the samples, we're going to use the map function. And this map function will do the mapping from the samples to torch variables that will contain a tensor and a gradient. So as you can see, this map function takes several arguments. The first argument is a function, and this function is going to be the function that will convert the samples into some torch variables. And the second argument is what we want to apply this function onto. So that will be the argument of this function. And therefore, what is it going to be? That's, of course, going to be the samples. So the second argument here is going to be the samples. But then let's define the function on which we want to apply each of the samples. So to define a function here, we need to first give a name to the function, which we'll call lambda. That's just a name I'm giving, lambda. Then x, which is going to be the variable of this function. So that is just a name I'm giving for the variable. And then colon. And here we give the expression of the function. That is what we want this lambda function to return. And so what it is going to be? Well, it's supposed to be something that will convert our samples into a torch variable. And to do this, we already mentioned it in some previous tutorials. Well, we have the variable function for that. The variable function will make that conversion from a torch tensor to a variable that will contain this tensor and the gradient. So the first thing I'm going to add here is variable. Variable inside of which I'm going to convert x because x is going to be the samples once lambda will be applied onto the samples. But then that's not all. There is one last technical thing that we need to implement. It is the fact that for each batch which is contained in the sample, for example, the batch of the actions, a1, a2, a3, and the other actions, we have to concatenate it with respect to the first dimension, which corresponds to the states. And why do we have to make this concatenation? It's just for everything to be well aligned. That is, that in each row, the state, the action, and the reward corresponds to the same time t. So that eventually, we get a list of batches, all well aligned, and each batch is a PyTorch variable. So how can we make this concatenation? Well, we need to use the cat function from the torch library. So we're going to add here torch, to which we add dot cat applied to x. But then in this cat function, we need to specify the dimension with respect to which we want to make that concatenation. And as I just mentioned, this is the first dimension that has index 0. And here we go, we have our function ready. This lambda function will take the samples, concatenate them with respect to the first dimension, and then eventually we convert these tensors into some torch variables that contains both a tensor and a gradient. So that later, when we apply stochastic gradient descent, we will be able to differentiate to update the weights. All right, so this function is ready. And then here, as the second argument of the map function, we need to specify onto what we want to apply this lambda function, and that is on all our samples. There we go. We will apply this lambda function on all the samples so that eventually we obtain a list of batches where each batch is a PyTorch variable. All right, so that was quite technical, but now at least everything will work well. 
We won't use this technique afterwards, we only use it here, so if you don't want to have a deep understanding of the technical details here, well that's fine, you can just copy these three lines of code to sample your memory if you want to make an artificial intelligence with PyTorch. It's as you want, but now the good news is that we are done with this replay memory class. Experience replay is now implemented and we can move on to the next and final class, which will be the whole deep Q learning model. So in this deep Q learning model, we will have, of course, our network, who will add experience replay, and then all the rest of the deep Q learning algorithm. So it's going to be a much bigger class. We're going to make about 10 functions, but that's only because we're doing this step by step so that you can understand better what's going on. So I can't wait to implement our deep Q learning model, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. In this tutorial, we are going to make the first step into implementing the deep Q learning model. So basically, we're about to implement the whole process of the deep Q learning algorithm. And so we're going to use what we created before, that is the architecture of the neural network, the replay memory, to integrate this into the whole deep Q learning process. And this whole deep Q learning algorithm is going to fit into one class. So that's the last class we're making to implement our artificial intelligence. And this class will just contain different functions. So we will have the init functions, which will create and initialize all the variables attached to our future deep Q learning objects, which will represent the deep Q learning model itself. And then we'll have some other functions. One of them will, of course, be to select the right action at each time. We will also have an update function, a score function to get the score and have an idea of how the learning is going, if it's going well, if the exploration is going well, and if it can move on to exploitation. And then we'll have a save function to save the model, that is to save the brain of the car, and then eventually a load function. So we have a couple of functions to make. We're going to make one function for each tutorial, and today we're going to start with the init function, as usual when we're making a class. But first, let's not forget to introduce the class. So we're going to call it dqn for deepq network, then some parentheses, colon, and there we go with our first function. So let's do this. Def, then double underscore, init, double underscore again, and parentheses. So as you understood, in this init function, we are going to introduce the variables attached to our objects. So we're going to have a couple of lines starting all by self. And we will basically create and initialize all the variables that are needed to implement a deep Q network. So we will, for example, create an object of our network, because of course we need our deep neural network. Then we will need our memory. We will create another variable for the memory. So we will have another variable self.memory. But then that's not all, we will have to create as well some variables for the last state, the last action, and the last reward. That's, of course, you know, the variables that you see in the deep Q learning algorithm. And then what else? Well, we will also need an optimizer, you know, to perform stochastic gradient descent, to update the weights according to how much they will contribute to the error when the AI is making a mistake. And then, I think that's all. That's basically the variables we now need to create and initialize. But in this init function, we will input a couple of arguments. First, as usual, self, which is the argument referring to our object. Then, since, you know, we're going to create an object of the network class, well, since the network class takes as argument in the init function input size and mv action, well, that's the same here. When creating an object of the network class, we will need to choose an input size argument and an NB action argument. Therefore, we can just copy them and paste them here. And here we go. So these arguments will now become also some arguments of the DQN class. Whenever we create some future objects of the DQN class, that is some future deep Q learning models, well, we will need to specify the input size which I remind is the number of dimensions in the vectors that are encoding your states, your input states, and a number of actions, which is the number of possible actions the car can make. So I remind these are either go left, go straight, or go right. Okay, perfect. Then, you know, we will be creating an object of the replay memory class to create the memory object to get our memory of the transitions. 
And in the init function, we have the capacity argument. But since we will only be using it once, actually when we create the memory, and not anywhere after, well, we won't need to specify a capacity argument. We could do this, but we will directly input the number of transitions we want our memory to have. But then we need one last argument, which is the gamma parameter in the deep Q-learning model. Remember, this gamma parameter is the delay coefficient. That's a parameter of the equation, and therefore we will put it here, because we will be using it afterwards several times. So let's put it here. We're going to call it gamma. So far, that is just the name of the argument. And there we go. That's all the arguments we'll need for this init function. So that means that whenever we create our deep Q learning model, that is whenever we create an object of the DQN class, well, we will need to specify as argument the input size, the number of action, and the gamma parameter. And we'll input the real values for them soon. All right, so now let's go inside the init function. Okay, so now basically this is going to be easy. We are just about to create and initialize all the variables that we'll need. And so let's start with the first one. Let's start with gamma, actually the delay coefficient. So since this is a variable we want to be attached to our object, we start with self. So gamma is going to be a variable of our DQN model. So self.gamma equals the argument that will be input when creating an object of the DQN class. So gamma, and there we go with the second argument. So the second argument is going to be the reward window. So what is this reward window? Well, that's going to be the sliding window of the mean of the last 100 rewards, which we'll use just to evaluate the evolution of the AI performance. You know, we'll have the mean of the reward into this reward window that will slide over time. And what we want to observe is a mean of the last 100 rewards increasing with time. So let's initialize it with self.reward underscore window. And so since this is going to be a sliding window of the evolving mean of the last 100 rewards, well, we're going to initialize it as an empty list. And then we will append the mean of the rewards over time. All right, then more exciting, let's create our neural network. So we're going to call it self.model because basically that's the heart of the model, so I'm calling it model. And this model is going to be nothing else than an object of the network class. And to create such an object, we take our class, network, then parenthesis, and here we just input the arguments of the network class. But we put these arguments in the arguments of the init function, and therefore we just need to copy them right here and just paste them in the network class. And there we go, with this line of code, we create one neural network for our deep Q learning model. Perfect, then let's create a memory. So again, we're going to create a new variable that we call self.memory. And again, this is going to be an object of the replay memory class. So let's just take the name of our class, let's copy it, let's paste that here, and in some parentheses, we need to input the capacity because the capacity is an argument of the init function. And that's the only argument we need to input here. So what capacity are we going to choose? Remember that corresponds to the number of transitions, the number of events, last state, new state, last action, and last reward. And so as mentioned in one of the previous tutorials, we're going to take 100,000. 100,000 transitions in the memory. And then we will sample from this memory to get a smaller number of random transitions. And that's on which the model will learn. Okay, so now we have our memory. Perfect. Now let's get our optimizer. So again, self, we create a new variable that we call optimizer. So optimizer is another variable of our future DQN object. So self.optimizer. And now if we go back up, you can see that we imported torch.optim, which is a module of torch that contains all the tools to perform stochastic gradient descent. So of course it contains some optimizers and we gave it the shortcut optim. And therefore here, what we're going to do is take the model optim, which is torch.optim. And from this module, we're going to take one of the optimizers. So as you can see, they're all listed here. Many of them are excellent. 
For example, RMS Prop is an excellent optimizer that is, for example, highly recommended for uh, recurrent neural networks or unsupervised deep learning. But the other one that is excellent and that we will choose is the Atom optimizer. That's the one. You'll see that with this one, we'll get a good self-driving car. But again, you are totally welcome to try other ones. You can try the RMS Prop. But for our model, we will choose Atom. So I'm pressing Enter. And in fact, you notice there is the capital A here. That's because we are creating an object of the Atom class. This is a class. But the object will be an Atom optimizer itself. But since this is a class, we need to input some arguments, the arguments of the Atom class. And the arguments are all the parameters that can customize your Atom optimizer. So for example, that's typically the learning rate, the decay, or some other parameters. And besides taking all the parameters of our model, we will specify a learning rate. So speaking of the parameters of our model, we can get them with self.model. So that's the model we created here, self.model from our network class. So self.model, and then to access the parameters of the model, we add another dot and then parameters with some parentheses, very simply. So that's just to connect the Atom optimizer to our neural network, the one that we created here. Okay, and then as we just mentioned, we're gonna add a learning rate and the argument for this is LR and we will set it equal to a value such that the learning doesn't happen too fast. If we get a learning rate too large, then the AI won't learn properly. We want to give our AI some time to explore, learn from its mistakes. You know, when we punish it, when it's making some mistakes like going onto some sand or getting too close to a wall. Well, we want to give the AI some time to learn. We want the weights of the neural network to update correctly. And so a good value for the learning rate I ended up with after trying several of them is 0.001. All right, and that's all we need to create an optimizer. So basically, we are creating an object of the Atom class. Great, and then the last three variables we need are the variables composing our transition events. So that's the last state, the last action, and the last reward. And so that's basically what we'll create now. And we will just need to initialize them. So let's start with the last state. The last state, we're gonna call it self.last underscore state and then how are we going to initialize it well remember the last state is a vector of five dimensions a vector that is encoding one state of the environment and as a reminder these five dimensions are the three signals of the three sensors left straight and right and orientation and minus orientation so this is a vector in the intuitive sense but for PyTorch it needs to be more than a vector it actually needs to be a torch tensor. But not only it needs to be a torch tensor, but also it needs to have one more dimension that I like to call a fake dimension that corresponds to the batch. And that's because the last state will be the input of the neural network. But when working with neural networks in general, whether it is with TensorFlow, Keras, or PyTorch, well, the input vectors cannot be a simple vector by itself. It has to be in a batch. The network can only accept batch of input observations. And therefore, not only we will create a tensor for our input state vectors, but also we will create this fake dimension corresponding to the batch. So let's do this and let's start by initializing a torch tensor. So to do this, there is nothing more simple. We take our torch library, then dot, and then we're going to use the tensor class because as you might have guessed this will create an object of the tensor class that is a tensor object and in this tensor class we need to input one argument which will specify the size of your tensor you can picture a tensor like an array having one single type but basically what this will represent now is of course this input state which you can see as a vector and so to specify the number of elements this tensor must have well, we need to use, of course, the input size because the input size is exactly the number of dimensions of our input state vectors. Now I should say tensors. And so what we simply need to input in our tensor class to create the tensor object, well, that's input size. 
and later on input size will be equal to 5. Alright, so that's good. That's the first thing done. We just initialized a tensor as it should be. But then remember, we need to do another thing. We need to create that fake dimension because this is what the network will expect for its inputs. And to create this one fake dimension, which by the way has to be the first dimension, you know, the fake dimension corresponding to the batch will be the first dimension of this last state variable. Well, to do this, we simply need to add dot, then unsqueeze, and then in some parentheses, we need to input the index of this fake dimension. And as I just said, this fake dimension has to be the first dimension of the last state. And since indexes in Python start at zero, we need to input zero so that this new fake dimension is becoming the first dimension. So we have a first dimension corresponding to the batch and then the dimension corresponding to the tensor, which will contain the five elements of your input states. The three signals, orientation and minus orientation. And there we go. We initialized our input states properly. Perfect. And then two variables to go. And that's going to be much easier because the next variable is the last action. So that's a new variable we're creating for our object, last action. And remember, in the first tutorial of this section, I told you that the actions are going to be either 0, 1, or 2. And then, using the action to rotation vector, we will convert these indexes of these actions into the angles of the rotation, which I remind are 0, 20, or minus 20. We can actually refresh our memory with that. Well. It is exactly here. Action to rotation. If the action is zero, well, this will correspond to the first index here, so zero. If the action is one, this will correspond to the index one of this vector, so 20 degrees. And if the action is two, we will get minus 20 degrees. That's going to be the rotation angle of our car when we play the action. All right. And therefore, since the action is going to be either zero, one or two, well, the action is therefore a simple number. And so very simply, we can initialize it to zero. We don't need to create any tensor here or anything else. We just need to initialize it with zero. And finally, well, that's the last reward. So self dot last reward. There we go. And again, the reward is a float number, which I remind is between minus one and plus one. So that's a number again. And as for the action, we will initialize it to zero. And there we go, congratulations, our init function is ready. So now we're ready to move on to the exciting stuff. And actually the most important thing for our AI, that's deciding which action to play at each time, at each time t. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the next tutorial by creating the select action method. So let's do this in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so in this tutorial, we're going to make the function that will select the right action at each time. So basically, we're going to implement the part that will make the car do the right move at each time. That is going left, going straight or going right to reach the goal and to avoid the obstacles that is descent. So let's do this right now. We are going to start as usual with a def to define a function. And then we give a name to our function, which we're going to call select action then some parentheses, and this select action function will take two arguments. The first one is self, as usual, to refer to the object, and a second argument, which according to you is going to be which one? Well, what could it be? If you think about it, the action we select comes from the outputs of the neural network, because the outputs of the neural network are the Q values for each of the three possible actions, and therefore, the action that we play, the action that will be the output of the neural network depends on the input state. And the input state is exactly the second argument we need for the select action function. It's because we're literally going to take the output of the neural network, and of course the output of the neural network directly depends on the input of the neural network. So that's gonna be our argument. And now we can give it any name. We will actually call it state, because the inputs of the neural networks are the input states that are encoded by a vector of five dimensions, the three signals, orientation and minus orientation. 
And so now things are going to be easy. We are going to feed the input state into the neural network, the one that we built right above, right here with the network class. And then, then we're going to get the output, which are the Q values for each of the three possible actions. And then using the softmax method, which I'm going to explain in this tutorial, we're going to get the final action to play. So let's do this. Let's go into the function and let's implement all this. So the first thing we need to start with is about what I've just mentioned, softmax. The idea of the softmax is that we're going to try to get the best action to play at each time, but at the same time, we will be exploring the different actions. And how can we do that? How can we get the best action to play while still exploring the other actions? Well, we use this idea of softmax, which consists of generating a distribution of probabilities for each of the Q values, Q state action. You know, we have one Q value for each action, go left, go straight or go right. But this Q value also depends on the input state. That's exactly the Q function you saw in the intuition lectures. This Q function is a function of the state and the action. So since we have here one input state, which is the state here, and three possible actions, we have three Q values, Q state action one, Q state action two, and Q state action three. And we're gonna generate a distribution of probabilities with respect to these three Q values. That is, we're gonna have one probability for the first Q value, one other probability for the second Q value, and a third probability for the third Q value. And all these three probabilities will sum up to one. And so we're gonna do all this with softmax, and softmax will attribute a large probability to the highest Q value. That's why an alternative to softmax is a simple argmax, you know, directly taking the maximum of the Q values, but in that case, we're not exploring the other actions. Thanks to these probabilities, we can explore somewhere else using a temperature parameter that we're gonna see very quickly. We can still explore them by configuring this temperature parameter. That's why, in general, for deep Q learning, I highly recommend to use a softmax rather than a simple argmax. All right, so let's implement softmax. And therefore, as you understood, since softmax returns the probabilities of each of the three Q values for the three possible actions, well, the first variable we're going to create is probs, referring, of course, to these probabilities. So probs equals, and now we're going to take our softmax function. And according to you, where are we going to take it from? Well, of course, remember we imported the torch.nn.functional submodule, which I remind is the module that contains most of the actions to implement a neural network. We gave it the shortcut f, and so that's exactly from this functional submodule that we're going to take our softmax function. But since we gave it the shortcut f, we start here with an f representing functional from which we take our softmax function. Here it is. That's the first one. And parenthesis. All right, and now what do we need to input in this softmax function? Well, that's of course the entities for which we want to generate a probability distribution. And what are these entities? Well, these are of course the Q values. So now the question is, how can we get the Q values? Well, of course, the Q values are the output of the neural network. And to get these outputs of the neural network, well, here we go, we need to take our neural network. But in fact, we already have it because that's what we initialized in the init function. You know, we created self.model, which is nothing else than our neural network because it is an object of the network class. And so that's perfect. We can just take our model here in softmax, apply this model to the input state, which is the argument here, and that will return the outputs that we're looking for, that is the Q values. And so now your intuition why we had to take the model here to introduce it in the init function might get better. For those of you starting with object-oriented programming, you will see that all this will become natural. So softmax, then, so we take our model, self.model, because this must be the model of the object that we created here. But then we need to get the output of our neural network model, and therefore we're going to add here some parentheses in which we're going to input, well, the input state, named state here. So what we want to do at first is enter state. But now we must be careful to something. State 
looks like a simple state right now, but remember that state is actually going to be a torch tensor because later we're going to use this self.last state to put it as the argument of the select action function. The state argument that is here is actually going to become later this self.last state. And since this is a torch tensor, well, the model will accept it. So that's fine. But now we can improve the algorithm. So as you understood, state is a torch tensor. And as we said earlier, most of the tensors are wrapped into a variable that will also contain a gradient. So right now what we're going to do first is wrap this input state, that is a tensor, into a torch variable. But since this is the input state, well, there is not going to be some differentiation. We will not be using the gradient of this state torch variable in the computations. And therefore, what we're going to do now is convert this torch tensor state into a torch variable, like so. But then to specify that we don't want the gradient in the graph of all the computations of the NN module, well, we will add here comma volatile equals true. So that now we have our state torch tensor into a torch variable, but thanks to this volatile equals true parameter, well, we won't be including the gradient associated to this input state to the graph of all the computations of the nn.module. So that's another technical trick. This will save us some memory and therefore this will improve the performance. So I highly recommend to do this. And now we're going to add something more fun. It's about this temperature parameter that I've just mentioned. So this temperature parameter is the parameter that will allow us to modulate how the neural network will be sure of which action it should decide to play. So this temperature parameter will be a positive number and the closer it is to zero, the less sure the neural network will be when playing an action. And the higher this temperature parameter is, the more sure the neural network will be of the action it decides to play. And to add this parameter, I'm going to multiply the outputs, which are the Q values, by this temperature parameter. So let's start, for example, with seven. And I'm going to specify here the little comment, T equals seven. So that's the temperature parameter that I'm setting equal to seven. We're going to try some other ones, but I just want to start with a small one because you're going to see that with a small one, our car will still behave like some kind of an insect. But then by increasing this temperature parameter, our car will look more like a car. And besides, the cell driving will be much, much better. And so that makes sense because the higher is this temperature parameter, the higher will be the probability of the winning Q value. Because for example, if we have softmax of the Q values, let's take some simple numbers, one, two, three. If softmax of one, two, three equals, for example, 0 0.04, 0 0.11, and 0 0.85, then by increasing the temperature, you know, by taking a higher temperature, right now the temperature equals one, by taking a higher temperature, like for example, two, so softmax, let's copy this and multiply it by, for example, two or three, softmax of the same Q values, but multiplied by this temperature parameter of three, well, we will get something like zero for the first Q value because this had a very low probability. So that's something around zero. Then something very small for the second probability because this was still a low probability. So let's say for example, 0 0.02. But then the third probability, since it was the largest one and a pretty high one, well, by increasing the temperature, this probability will be even larger because we're going to be even more sure that this is the right Q value corresponding to the action we must play. And therefore, this is going to be something like 0.98. Now, by increasing this temperature parameter, well, we are now even more sure that the third action here should be the action to play because the probability for the Q value of this action is not only the largest one, but also very high. So that's what this temperature parameter is all about. It's about the certainty of which action we should decide to play. All right, so I'm gonna remove this comment. This was just to explain. And now let's get our action. So how are we going to do that? Well, the principle of the softmax method 
is not only to generate a probability distribution for each of the Q values, but also, and that's the second step of this softmax method, we take a random draw from this distribution to get our final action. And of course, we will have a high chance to get the action that corresponds to the Q value that has the highest probability, because that's exactly how a distribution works. So there we go, let's get our action. So we're going to introduce a new variable that we're gonna call action. And this action is going to be a random draw of the probability distribution that we just created at this line before. And so how do we get such a random draw? Well, we're gonna take our props, probabilities of each of the Q values. We take props and then dot, and then we're gonna use the multinomial function. And that will give us a random draw from this distribution, props. So that's all, that will give us the action, perfect. And now, of course, we are going to return the action, but there is a little trick here. Well, it's the fact that this props.multinomial returns the PyTorch variable with a fake batch, you know, this fake dimension corresponding to the batch. And therefore, to get the right result that we want, that is the action 0, 1, or 2, we just need to add here data and then some brackets. And the action 0, 1, or 2 that we're looking for is contained in the indexes 0 and 0. All right, and there we go. Now we have our action. Thanks to this select action function, the AI will now know which action to play at each time. Terrific. So now we can move on to the next function, which will be the learn function. And that's where we will train the whole neural network, you know, with all the forward propagation and then the back propagation using stochastic gradient descent. Well, basically, we will implement the whole training of the deep learning model that is at the heart of our artificial intelligence. So I can't wait to do that. This is going to be an exciting tutorial. And so I'll see you in the next tutorial. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so now in the next function that we're about to implement, we will train the deep neural network that is inside our artificial intelligence. So basically, we're going to do the whole process of forward propagation and then back propagation. So that is, we're going to get our output. We're going to get the target. We will compare the output to the target to compute the loss error. Then we're going to back propagate this loss error into the neural network. And using stochastic gradient descent, we will update the weights according to how much they contributed to the loss error. So let's do all this. For those of you coming from the deep learning course, this will be kid stuff. But for the others, don't worry, I'm going to explain that again. So we're going to call this new function learn. And this learn function is going to take several arguments. First, self, of course, which will refer to the object of the DQN class. Then we're going to take our batch state for the current state. Then our batch next state. Then our batch reward. And finally, our batch action. So why do we take this? You probably recognized what is the series. Well, that's of course a transition. A transition of the Markov decision process that is at the base of deep Q learning. And why do we all take them into some batches? Well, that's because, you know, remember, we don't consider the transitions by a series of the tuple current state, next state, current reward, and current action. We created some sample batches here, thanks to the sample function. And so now our transitions are in the form a first batch for the state, a second batch for the next state, a batch for the reward, and a batch for the action. That's the form of our transitions now, and they're all well aligned with respect to time, thanks to this concatenation that we made here with respect to the first dimension. So the point is, now we have these transition of batches, one batch for each of the state, next state, reward, and action, and we do all this because we're using this experience replay trick so that our deep neural network can learn something. Remember, if we only had the transitions by themselves, well, it would be some instant learning, or if you want some very short memory learning, and therefore the model wouldn't learn anything. So we have to take these batches from the memory, which become our transitions, and then eventually we will get the different outputs for each of the states of the input batch state. And we will do this for the batch state and for the batch next state because we will need both to compute the loss. 
I will soon remind the balance equation that is at the heart of the deep learning algorithm. So now let's go into the function and let's first get the output of the batch state. So I'm going to call this first variable outputs and then we're going to take of course our self.model so self.model because we want to get our model outputs of the input states of the batch state. And since our model is actually expecting a batch of input states, well, we can totally input batch state right now for the input of the model. That's exactly how we initialized the states that are going into the network with a torch tensor with this fake dimension for the batch. So that's perfect. We now get the outputs of the model. But then there is another technical trick. If we only do self.model batch state, well, we will get the outputs of all the possible actions, you know, 0, 1, and 2. But that's not what we want. We are only interested in the actions that were chosen, the actions that were decided by the network to play at each time. And so to get these actions we're interested in, that is the actions played, well, we have to use this gather function in which we input 1 because we only want the action that was chosen and then we add batch action. With this, the 1 and the batch action, we will gather each time the best action to play for each of the input states of the batch state. We only want the action that is played, the action that is chosen. And we get this with this gather 1 and batch action. But then be careful, the batch state here has this fake dimension corresponding to the batch and batch action doesn't have it. Batch state has it because we use the unsqueeze here, but we haven't used any unsqueeze for the actions. So we have to add it here so that the batch action has the exact same dimension as the batch state. So we're going to add a dot unsqueeze zero right here. And actually this is not zero, but one because zero corresponds to the fake dimension of the state and one will correspond to the fake dimension of the actions. And finally, the last thing we need to do here is we need to kill this fake batch with a squeeze. And why do we need to do that? Because now we are out of the neural network, we have our outputs, but we don't want them in a batch, we want them in a simple tensor, a simple vector, a vector of outputs. The batch is just when we work in the neural network, because the neural network is expecting the format of tensors into a batch. But now we have our outputs, and in the next balance equation of the deep learning, we won't need them into a batch. So I'm killing the batch here, I'm killing the fake dimension, to get back the simple form of our outputs. So I'm just adding here dot and then squeeze. And then since I want to kill the fake dimension corresponding to the batch of the action, well, since this fake dimension has index one, I'm adding one here. All right, and now there we go, we have our outputs. Okay, we have a little warning, what is it? Local variable outputs is assigned but never used. That's okay, we will use it very quickly. So that's our outputs, and now we want to get our next outputs. So now you might be thinking, why do we need the next output? Well, to understand this, we need to go back to the deep learning algorithm, which is right here. That's a part of the LaTeX handbook. So that's the whole deep learning process. At the beginning, we're initializing all the Q values. And then at each time t, well, there we go. We select the action with softmax, that's what we did with the select action function. Then we append the transition, and then, as you can see, we get the prediction, we get the target, and we compute the loss. So why do we need the next output as well? That's because of the target. The target is equal to gamma times the next output plus the reward, and we will compute the target right after that. But since we need the next output for the target, let's compute this first. So again, to get the next output, that's very simple. The next output is going to be the result of our neural network when the batch next state is entering it as input. So very simply, we take our model, that is our neural network, and then this time, the input of the neural network is going to be the batch next state. The batch next state, but now remember, if we go back to the deep learning algorithm, well, you can see that the next output is the maximum of the Q values for the next state with respect to all the actions. 
So right now, to get the next output, we need to get the maximum of these Q values. And therefore, I'm going to do here a detach, you know, to detach all the outputs of the model because we have several states in this batch next states. That's the batch of all the next states in all the transitions taken from the random sample of our memory. So I'm detaching all of them using the detach function. And then I'm taking the max of all these Q values. And since we're taking the maximum of these Q values with respect to the action, well, we have to specify that it is with respect to the action. And since the action is represented by the index one, well, again, we have to put the index one here. And then we have to specify that we're taking the Q values of st plus one, that is the next state. And the next state is represented by the index zero because the index zero corresponds to the state. And therefore here, we need to add brackets with the index zero. That way, we get the maximum of the Q values of the next state represented by the index zero according to all the actions that are represented by the index one. And now perfect we get our next outputs. These are unused yet, that's why we had the warning, but that's fine, we will use it right now to compute the target. And speaking of the target, that's the next step of this learn function. So there we go, target equals, now let's get back to our AI handbook. The target is equal to the reward plus gamma times the next output. That is the maximum of the Q values of the next state according to the actions. So there we go, let's compute that. So that is equal to self.gamma, and self.gamma was initialized here, it is introduced, so that's a variable of our DQN object. Self.gamma times the next output, as we just said, plus the reward, that is the batch reward. We're working with batches here. So plus batch reward. And that's the target in one sample of the memory gamma multiplied by the next output plus the reward. All right, perfect. So now we have our outputs. We also have our target, and therefore we can compute the loss, the loss that is representing the error of the prediction. So let's call this loss TD loss. TD is of course for the temporal difference that is again at the heart of Q learning. And this TD loss is going to be equal to the Huber loss that improves much the Q learning. That's the loss function we will choose for our artificial intelligence. For those of you coming from the deep learning course, that's really the loss I recommend if you want to implement deep Q learning. And so how are we gonna get this Huber loss? Well, again, we're gonna take a function from the functional module represented by F. And therefore here, I'm going to use our functional module F dot, and the Huber loss can be obtained thanks to the function smooth L1 loss, that one. So pressing enter, and that's really the best loss function I recommend for deep Q learning. It really improves the Q learning. But this is a function, so I'm adding some parentheses. And now there is nothing more simple. The arguments we need to input are the predictions and the targets. So the predictions is of course our outputs, because that's the output of the neural network. You know, the output of the neural network is what the neural network predicts. So that's the prediction. So the first argument here is outputs. And then the second argument is, of course, the target, the thing we're trying to get. And it's already computed. Perfect. We can directly input target. Perfect. And now we have the loss. Just forgot a little T here. There we go. Now the warning should disappear. Yes, perfect. And now that we have the loss error, we can back propagate this error back into the network to update the weights with stochastic gradient descent. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the next step. So of course, now what we have to do, as you might guess, is take our optimizer, our optimizer, which again, we introduced here, we initialized it. And that's an atom optimizer, which is actually an object of the atom class. And it is already fitted with the parameters of our model. And we already chose a learning rate of 0.1%. So perfect, our optimizer is ready, but now we need to apply it on the loss error to perform stochastic gradient descent and update the weights. So when working with PyTorch, the first thing we need to do is reinitialize it at each iteration of the loop. 
we must reinitialize the optimizer from one iteration to the other in the loop of the stochastic gradient descent. And to reinitialize it at each iteration of the loop, well, we're going to use the following method, which is zero grad. Here we go. Zero grad will reinitialize your optimizer at each iteration of the loop. Then let's not forget the parenthesis. Perfect. And now that it is reinitialized, well, we can perform backward propagation with our optimizer. And how do we do that? Well, we take our TD loss and we are going to backpropagate it back into the network. And to backpropagate it into the network, we need to use the backward function. And inside this backward function, I recommend to input retain underscore variables and set it equal to true. I recommend to do this because this will improve backpropagation. The use of return variables equals true is to free some memory. And we need to free the memory because we're going to go several times on the loss. So that will definitely improve the training performance. And finally, last step of this learn function is to update the weights according to the backpropagation, that is, according to how much the weight contributed to the error. And to do this, we take our optimizer again, which was initialized and reinitialized, and we use the step function. And simply, with this line of code, by using the step function, this will update the weights. That's this line of code that updates the weights. This line of code backpropagates the error into the neural network, and this line of code uses the optimizer to update the weights. And there we go, we have a learning neural network. All right, so congratulations. This was probably the most technical and difficult part of all this deep learning model. I know PyTorch can be tricky sometimes with these unsqueeze and squeeze, but in the end, I promise you will get a very functional neural network and therefore deep learning model and eventually a great artificial intelligence. So now let's move on to the next step of our deep learning model, which will be the update function that will obviously update when the AI will discover the new state. So you know it will discover the new state and then it will receive the reward depending on the action that it just played and this new state. So we'll take care of this with the update function and we'll do this in the next tutorial. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so today we will be making the update function which will update everything there is to update as soon as the AI reaches a new state. So when it reaches a new state, you know we need to update the action. The last action becomes the new action that was just played but also the last state that becomes the new state and finally the last reward that becomes the new reward we get when we play the action. So that's the logical path that happens right after selecting an action. We need to update all the elements of the transitions. And of course we will get a new transition, so we will have to append this new transition to the memory and finally we will also update our reward window, you know, to keep an eye on the evolution of how the training is going and how the exploration is going. But what's most important for you to understand is that now we can finally make a connection between the AI that we're implementing right now to our map. Because if we go back to our map, remember there is this big update function into the game class. So that's where we're actually making the game with the car and defining how the car should be punished when it's making a mistake. But in this game class, we notice this update function. And in this update function, we notice this line action equals brain dot update last reward last signal and actually this is exactly what we're about to make we are about to make this update function that will take the last reward and the last signal to get the next action to play so not only will we update all the different elements of the transition but mostly we will be playing the action that we should play when getting the last reward and the last signal and so, of course, in this update function, we will use the select action function that we just implemented before. We will integrate the select action function in the future update function that we're about to make to select the right action to play besides making all the updates. So that's really important to make this connection with the map right now. What we're about to make is eventually the connection between our AI and the game, the game that we make in this class. And so what we can do now is directly take 
this update last reward last signal because that's exactly the function that we will be making with these two arguments here. And just as a quick reminder, brain is our AI object. That is, it's the object of the DQN class. So what we're going to do now is we're going to copy this, update last reward last signal, and that's going to be our next function we're making, and therefore I'm pasting that here. Then just to be careful, I would just like to give some different names than the names we have here. You know, we have last reward here, and I don't want to confuse this last reward with this one. That can be dangerous. So I'm going to replace last reward here by reward. And by the way, same for last signal. Let's just put signal or even new signal to specify that, you know, we want to make the update when reaching a new state and therefore getting a new signal. But then of course, this reward here is going to be the last reward that we get here. You know, when going onto some sand or worse, getting too close to one edge of the map. That's where we define the last reward. This last reward is going to be the input of the update function. So that's why we have last reward here. But right here, I'm just giving another name for the argument, reward, to not confuse it with last reward here. All right, so this is the update function. And now let's go inside it. And let's do these two things. That is update all the elements of our transition and of course, select the action. Okay, so what do we need to update first? Well, as you understood, we want to make the updates when reaching a new state. So the first thing we'll be updating is obviously this new state. That is the new state we're reaching. So I'm gonna call this new state, new state, and then equal. And so how can we get this new state? Well, of course, that depends on the signal, the new signal that the sensors just detected. And as a reminder, the state is the signal itself, composed of the three signals of the sensors, signal one, signal two, and signal three, plus orientation and minus orientation. That's our state, so be sure to understand that the signal is the state, but right now it is a simple list of five elements. And since this is going to be the input of the neural network, remember we have to convert it into a torch tensor. So that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. We are going to take our torch library and then take the tensor class, there we go, which will convert our new signal into a torch tensor. Then it's better to make sure that all the elements of the torch tensor are float. So I'm going to make a type conversion to convert them into float, like this. And then finally, try to get the reflex of what we need to do next. It's of course to create that fake dimension to add the dimension corresponding to the batch. And we do this, of course, with the unsqueeze function to which we have to input the index of this fake dimension we want to have for the batch, which is zero. All right, and now we have our new state, composed of the three signals of the three sensors, plus orientation, minus orientation. And of course, that will depend on the new signal we're getting with this update function right at this line. Last signal we get the three signals plus orientation minus orientation. And as a reminder, the three signals are the density of sand detected around the sensors. All right, so we just got our new state. So that means we reached the new state and now we have to make the next update. So according to you, what do we need to update now? What would be the logical thing to update right now after reaching this new state? Well, what we need to update now is the memory. Why is that? It's because at each time t, a transition is composed of the current state, st, the next state, st plus one, the reward, rt, and the action, at. And right now, we already have st, we already have rt, and we already have at. And we just got the last element of the transition, st plus one. So by getting this new state, st plus one, we are getting one brand new transition of the memory. And therefore we have to append this brand new transition to the memory because that's simply our next transition. So that's why we have to update the memory right now. And therefore what I'm gonna do is take my memory object created from the replay memory class. And therefore I'm gonna take self.memory to refer to the object. But since I'm using self, I have to include the self in the update function. 
So now you can really see what this self is for. It's whenever you use one variable that you created and initialized in the init function. So self.memory, and now we need to update it. And according to you, how are we going to update that? Well, the good news is that we already made a function to do that. It's the push function which appends an event or a transition to the memory. So that's exactly what we're going to use now. We're going to use the push function to append our new transition that we just made to the memory. And therefore, here I'm taking not an equal because we're going to use a method and therefore we can directly use dot push. And first, I'm going to add the transition, this new transition that we just got. And that is first the last state. So self dot last state. So that's st. That's exactly this one. It already exists. Then the next element of this transition is, of course, the new state that we just reached. And therefore, since it is not a variable of the object that we created and initialized in this init function, we don't put a self here. We directly put the new state. Then the next element of the transition is the action. And same, we already have the last action, which is this self.last action here. So of course it is equal to zero, but then of course it will be updated with the select action function, but that's this one. So then it is self.last action. But now be careful, the elements that we're including in this transition should all be torch tensors. As you can see, that's the case for the last state. It's a torch tensor. The new state is also a torch tensor. And so this must be the same for the action and then the reward, of course. But now you're going to think, how can it be a torch tensor considering that it's simply a number? You know, the action is either 0, 1, or 2. But in fact, that's not a problem. We can still convert this 0, 1, or 2 variable into a torch tensor. This will just be what we call a long tensor. The long is a type, and that's the tensor that will contain an integer. Because the last action is an integer. It is 0, 1, or 2. So what we're going to take now is our library torch. Then we're going to take the long, here it is, the long tensor class that will create an object, which will be the long tensor itself. And by taking the self last action function as input, it will create this long tensor object, but it will still contain 0, 1, or 2 into a long tensor object. And that is just to be consistent with the transition that should only contain tensors because we're working with PyTorch and we're working with a neural network. So we have to work with tensors. So there we go, torch, long tensor, and one last conversion to make. We must be sure that what's inside this long tensor is an integer, and to make sure of it, even if we already know that the last action is 0, 1, or 2, to make sure of it, we're going to make this int type conversion again. We convert our self last action into an integer. There we go, and then we must just put the integer self last action into brackets right here so that now we get a long tensor of one element which will be this last action 0, 1 or 2 itself. So the key point is that's just how you convert a simple number 0, 1 or 2 into a tensor with torch. All right and then finally the last element of the transition and that's of course the last reward we got. So that's exactly the last reward variable we created in the init function that was initialized to zero, but then of course is updated right here in this code, either when we go onto some send, which is a negative reward, or if we get further away from the goal, that's again a negative reward. If we get closer to the goal, that's a positive reward. And the worst punishment, if we get too close to one edge of the map, well, that's a terrible negative reward, minus one, and that's all. So let's add this last element of the transition, self.reward. So I'm copying this, pasting that here, and now we have to make another conversion, which will be, of course, exactly the same as this one, only since the reward is not an integer, but a float number, we will simply make a torch.tensor conversion, but without the int. We will keep the brackets here, because you know, first we have to put the number into a list, and then this list will go as input in the torch tensor class, but we don't have to make that int conversion, because last reward is a float number. So what we're going to do is simply add here torch.tensor, torch.tensor, then parentheses, brackets, and 
we're going to close the brackets here and we close the parentheses. There we go. So to summarize, with the new state that we just reached and the reward, we observe a new event of transition that we add to the memory. And this transition contains the last state, st, the new state, st plus 1, the last action played, at, and the last reward, rt. All right, and now we are good with our memory update. So let's have a quick break and we'll take care of the next update in the next tutorial. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so we just updated the memory after reaching the new state, and now let's take care of the next update. According to you now, what is going to be the next update? Well, basically, we are done with one transition. We updated the last element of the transition, which is the new state. So now it's like we're starting all over again. And when we're starting all over again, well, it's like, you know, we are in this new state of the environment. And so what do we need to do now? Naturally, well, of course, it's to play an action because we already got the observation of the new state. So now the thing that we have to do is play an action. And therefore, what we need to do now is, of course, use the select action function to play the action. So let's do it. Let's create a new variable action and let's play the action with the select action function. So I'm taking, well, first self to specify that the select action function is a method of the object of the DQN class that will be created. So self dot select action. Here we go. Self dot select action. And then of course, since the select action function takes the state as input, because of course the select action function will return the output of the neural network when the current input state entered the neural network. So we have to input the input state here. And since that's the state that we just reached in the environment right now, well, the input state is of course new state because the state that we just reached at the time we were right now is new state. So in the select action function, I'm inputting new state. All right, so with this line of code, we simply play the new action after reaching the new state. Okay, and now that we played an action, well, we get the reward and therefore we get a feedback with the reward. And therefore, if we have more than 100 elements in the memory, well, it would be time to learn. And therefore, what we must do now is what logically comes after selecting an action, which is, of course, to learn. The AI needs to start learning if it is doing the things the right way. And now, since it just played the action, well, we're going to make the AI learn from its actions in the last 100 events. But before we apply this learn function, we have to make this if condition to make sure that we already have reached more than 100 events because, you know, we're learning from the random samples of the memory. You know, we have this huge memory of 10,000 elements. We're taking some random samples of the memory of 100 elements and the AI is learning from the information contained in this sample of 100 random transitions. So let's just make this if condition to make sure that the number of elements of the memory, self.memory, and then be careful, just a little trick here, self.memory is the object of your replay memory class, but then the replay memory class has an attribute, which is memory. So in fact, we need to take self.memory.memory. The first memory is the object of the replay memory class, and the second memory is the attribute here self.memory. So if the number of elements in the memory is, well, we want it to be larger than 100, then colon, and then what happens? Well, we can learn. But before learning, we need to get this random sample of 100 transitions, and this we can get with the sample function. And since the sample function returns the different batches the states at time t, the states at time t plus 1, the actions at time t, and the rewards at time t, well, what we need to do now is create some new variables, which are going to be the batch of the states at time t, the batch of the next states, the batch of the rewards, and the batch of the actions. And we can simply give the same names as we gave for the arguments here, and paste that here. And these variables will be equal to what the sample function returns. 
because it returns exactly these batches of the states, next states, rewards, and actions. So what we simply need to do now is get first our memory object, and then from this memory object, we're going to use the sample method, which will take as input, well, the number of transitions we want our AI to learn from, that is 100. That's why we made sure that the memory had more than 100 transitions. So it's going to learn from 100 transitions of the memory. So the learning will be much better. And so now let's make this learning happen. Well, since the learn method is a method of our DQN class, well, we need to access this learn method from the future objects that will be created from the DQN class. And therefore, what we need to take is self. So self refers to that object of the DQN class. And then learn as this learn method. Learn method to which we input, of course, these guys here. The batch state, the batch next state, the batch reward, and the batch actions. So these are our batches sampled from our memory. And we get 100 of them because we have 100 transitions. And from these 100 transitions, we take 100 states, 100 next states, 100 rewards, and 100 actions. So let's paste that here. And there we go. Now the learning will happen. It will happen from all these random batches. Perfect. And now what we need to do is the very last update. After, you know, reaching a new state and playing an action, well, we got the action to play, but we still didn't update the action. That is our self that last action variable. So let's make sure we don't forget this. Let's do it right now. We will update the last action, self.last action equals, and of course, action. The action that we just paid here with the select action function. All right, so now the last action is updated. Then same for the new state. We reached the new state, but we haven't updated the last state yet because of course the last state was before the state at time t. But since now we reached the new state st plus one at time t plus one, well, the last state becomes this new state here. And therefore we need to update it as well. Self dot last state equals our new state. There we go. And now what do we need to update? Well, there is only one thing left. That's of course the reward. And the reward is exactly the reward we get in reality. So that will be the argument of this update function, which if we make the connection to our map, will be the last reward, that is, the reward we get right after playing the action in this reached new state. So if we go on to some send, this last reward will be bad, minus one. If we get further from the goal, we will get a slightly bad reward, minus 0.2. If we get closer to the goal, we will get a slightly good reward, 0.1. And if we get too close to one edge of the map, well, that will be a bad punishment, we will get minus one for each edge. So that's the last reward we get in reality. That is the one that happens for real on the map. And this will be the argument of the update function, this last reward here, that's exactly this one. And so since this is the argument of the update function, well, that corresponds to this reward here. And therefore, our self.last reward variable initialized at the beginning in this init function becomes the new reward we get in reality, that is reward, or that's the same last reward. All right, so now we updated our last reward. And now, since we just got our last reward, well, we can now update the reward window. You remember, the reward window we initialized here as one of the variable of the object of our DQN class, that's the window that's going to keep track of how this training is going by taking the average of the last 100 rewards. So, you know, it will be like a sliding window showing us how the mean of the rewards is evolving. And so since we just got our last reward, well, we can update the reward window. And so how do we update it? Well, we simply need to append this last reward to the window. And therefore, what I'm gonna do is take my reward window, self.reward window, here it is. And then I'm going to use the append function and inside the append function we need to input the element we want to append to the reward window and that's of course the reward all right perfect 
And then since this reward window is going to have a fixed size, you know, it's not going to be a growing window. It's going to be a window of fixed size sliding with time to show us the evolution of the reward. And so now we need to decide for a size of this window. And it's simply the number of means of the rewards we will have in this window. And so, for example, let's get, you know, the last 1000 means of the last 100 rewards. And so to make sure of it, we're going to add if then len, then we take our reward window and we simply add here if the number of elements in the reward window is larger than 1000, well, what we want to do is delete the first element of this reward window and the first element of this reward window has the index zero. All right, and now we make sure that this reward window will never get more than 1,000 elements. That is 1,000 means of the last 100 rewards. So that's perfect. This will be a window of fixed size so that we can see if the mean of the rewards is increasing and therefore if the training is going well and accordingly if the car does what we want. Perfect. And now one tiny little thing to do left. According to you, what is it going to be? Well, remember, this update function not only updates the different elements of the transition and the reward window, but also it returns the action that was played when reaching this new state. That's why we have in the map action equals brain.update last reward last signal. And therefore, it's supposed to return something. And the something it is supposed to return is, of course, the action. So the simple last thing we need to do here is just return action, the action that was just played when reaching the new state. And that's it. Our update function is ready. It's going to do all the required updates and it will return the action when reaching the new state. That's perfect. That was the last difficult action to make for all this AI process. Now the rest will be kid stuff. We will just make a score function to return the means of the rewards in the reward window. Then we will make a save function to save the brain of the car whenever you want to quit the application and go back to it. And of course, since you want to be able to load the brain of your car when you get back to it, get back to the application, well, we will end up by making a load function, which will load your model after you saved your model with the save function. So three functions to do left, but it's going to be simple. And then we'll have the most exciting section of this first module, that is the demo. We will see if the AI works, we will see if the car reaches the goals, and we will see how we can improve it. And then eventually, you will have built your first AI. So I can't wait to start the demo. Let's make these three functions first, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so very quick tutorial today to make the score function. And so basically, this function will just compute the score on the sliding window of the rewards. And so basically, we will very simply compute the mean of all the rewards in the reward window. So this will be very simple. Let's do this now. We're going to make this new function that we're going to call score. And the score function will just take the argument self because basically we don't need anything. We need to take self because of course we will take self dot reward window. So just self and then colon. And there we go. It's going to take one line of code. So we want to compute the mean of all the rewards in the reward window. So that's basically the sum of all the rewards in this reward window that are between minus one and plus one divided by the total number of elements in this window. So let's do this. We're directly going to return that. So I'm starting with return. And so we need to take the sum of all the rewards in the reward window. And to do this, we simply need to take the reward window itself. And so I'm inputting here self dot reward window. All right, and so very simply, this will sum all the elements inside reward window. So that's pretty practical. And then to get the mean, we need to divide this sum by the number of elements in the reward window. And to get the number of elements, well, we need to take the len function and then we take our reward window again. There it is. But now we just need to be careful with something. It's that len self reward window is a denominator and this must absolutely not be equal to zero. No matter what, we need to avoid this. 
And to make sure that the denominator here is not equal to zero, we're going to add this safety trick. We're going to add here a plus one. So that len self.reward window plus one will never be equal to zero. If the denominator here is equal to zero, this will crash your system. So we must avoid it. And that's totally fine to add a plus one. We will still get a good measure of the score. All right, perfect. And so that's all. We have our score function, which will give us the mean of the rewards in the sliding window. All right, so now let's move on to the next function, which is the save function that will save your model, that is save the brain of your car, so that you can then be able to reuse it by loading it with another function that we'll make after the save function. So that's really practical to have this save trick, save function to save your models in case you want to reuse them for any kind of purpose where they can be useful. So that's what we'll do in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this tutorial. All right, so today we're gonna to make a function that will save our model. That is, that will save the brain of the car so that we can reuse it whenever we quit the application. Thanks to this save function, we will be able to save the model, then quit the application. And then when we go back to the application, thanks to another function that is the load function, which we'll make after this one, we will be loading the last version of our model that was trained. So that will be very practical, and therefore let's make these two functions, the save function and the load function. So let's start with the save function in this tutorial. So here comes a new def, then save, and then it's gonna take one argument that is going to be self. And the reason is that the thing we are going to save is not the whole model here, but our neural network, self.model, and our optimizer, self.optimizer. Because what we want to save is just the last weights that were updated at the last iteration. Because whenever we want to reuse our saved model later, we want it to predict the action to play with the weights that were already trained. So we need to take these last version of the weights, and also we need to take the last version of the optimizer because it is connected to these weights. So let's do this. We have our self, so we'll be able to take our self.model and our self.optimizer. And we will be saving these two objects in a Python dictionary. And to save these two objects, we're going to use the save function from the torch module. So I'm starting here with torch.save. And in parentheses, we are going to input that dictionary. Brackets. And a dictionary in Python works like that. You have a key, which is your identifier. So that's unique. And for each key, you have the value you want to give to that key. So it's like a mapping function from unique identifiers to a value you want to give for these identifiers. If you take a simple dictionary book, well, the keys would be the words and the values would be the definitions of the words. Well, here, that's the same. We're going to make two keys, one key for the first object we want to save, which is self.model, and one second key for the second thing we want to save, that is our self.optimizer. And therefore, let's start with the first key. So we have to give a name to that key and I'm going to call it state underscore dict because then you're going to see that I'm going to use the function state dict to save our model in the dictionary. So that's our first key. Then to give the value we want to attribute for that first key, well, as you can see, I added a little column here and here I'm going to add the object, the object I want to save. So the first object I want to save is self.model. So we can just copy this self.model and paste it as the value of our first key, self.model. Then we add dot state underscore dict. Here we go, the first one. And then we add some parentheses. And that will save the parameters of your model in this first key, state dict. And now let's save our optimizer. So we're going to add a second key in the dictionary. And to do this, we add here a comma, then press enter. And there we go with our second key. So the second key we're going to call it, well, we can call it optimizer, then colon, and then we just need to add the name of the object we want to save, and that is self, that is our optimizer. So we add here self.optimizer, and then again to save the parameters of this optimizer, we add here again dot state dict. And there we go, we have our model saved with all the weights saved, and our optimizer saved. Perfect. And then we will save all this into a file 
And to do this, I'm going to add a second argument to this save function, which is going to be the name of this file where we want to have our model and our optimizer saved. So remember, I showed you a quick demo in the first section of this first module self-driving car. You know, that was the demo where we just had some random actions. So that was not yet a self-driving car. But then remember, I clicked on this save button to save the model. And this created the last brain.pth file, which is the file that contains the saved version of your model. So I'm going to add here last underscore brain.pth so that your model and your optimizer will be saved into this created file lastbrain.pth. So you don't have it yet, but as soon as you save your model in the application, this file will be created thanks to this code we just added. All right, and so now, perfect, we have a save function that will save your model, save the brain of your car by saving the weights and the optimizer of the neural network that is in fact the brain of the car. So perfect, we now have only one function to create left, that's the load function, and that's because a save function never goes without a load function. You know, there is no purpose saving your model if you cannot load what you save afterwards. So that's the last step in our journey before the exciting demo, and we will make this load function in the last tutorial of this section. So I'll see you in this next tutorial, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to the final tutorial of this section. We are going to make the last function of this DQN class, which is going to be, of course, the load function that naturally comes after the save function. You save your model and then you want to be able to load it whenever you go back to the application. So let's do this. We're going to make def, then load. We call this last function load. Again, this load function will take as argument self. And you probably guess what this self will be for. It will be exactly to load what was saved in the save function. So we will take self.model and of course self.optimizer. So this self here will be for the model and the optimizer. So then colon, and now let's load the model. So since the model is in the last brain.pth file, we want to make sure this file exists. And therefore that's what we're gonna start with. We're gonna make an if condition to make sure that this file exists and if it exists, we will be loading what we have in the dictionary, which is in this last brain pth file. So we start with an if, then we're going to take our operating system and the path leading to this last brain.pth file. So os.path is exactly the path that leads to the working directory folder. So as far as I'm concerned, that's this path, desktop, then my artificial intelligence A to Z folder, then module one cell driving car, and then the module one self-driving car folder, that is this folder here with the last brain.pth file. And then we're going to add dot is file, is file, this one. So that's a function. So I'm going to add some parentheses. And inside the parentheses, I'm going to input the name of the file, the name of the file that contains the model that is last brain.pth. So we have to input it in quotes. And so I'm entering last brain.pth. And so is file lastbrain.pth will return true if the file lastbrain.pth exists and false if it doesn't exist. And therefore, this if condition means if we have the lastbrain.pth file in our working directory folder, then let's code what's going to happen in that case. In that case, if this file exists, well, first, we're going to print something to say that you know, we're loading the model. So for example, we can say a little arrow and then loading checkpoint with three little dots. All right, so that's just to say we're loading the model. And then of course, we're going to load the model. So the model and the optimizer. And we're gonna put what we load in a variable that I'm going to call checkpoint equals. And that's where we're gonna use the load function to load what was saved in the save function. So of course, this is a function from the torch library. So torch dot, and the name of this load function is simply load, parenthesis. And inside the parenthesis, according to you, what do we need to input? Well, very simply, we need to input the file that contains our saved model and our saved optimizer. So we simply need to input the name of the file, which is last brain dot pth lastbrain.pth, and we load this file 
only in the condition that this file exists. So that's why we had to code this if condition here. Okay, so now that we loaded the model and the optimizer, well, what we're gonna do is update separately our model and the optimizer. Because actually we loaded the parameters, we loaded the weight and the parameters of the optimizer. So now what we need to do is update our existing model, which is this one, self.model, and our existing optimizer, self.optimizer, with the parameters, with the weights that are in this lastbrain.pth file. So we simply need to make these two updates separately. And to do this, we're gonna use a method from the torch modules. So there's gonna be inheritance, which will allow us to use this method that is called load state dict. And this load state dict method will allow us to update all the parameters of our model and our optimizer. So let's do this and let's start by updating our model. So we take our model, which is self.model. Since self.model inherits from the methods of the torch module, to use the load state dict method, so that's the method we're taking from the inheritance, and thanks to this method, we're going to update all the parameters of the model, that is all the weights. And so what we need to input in this load state dict method is our checkpoint variable, that is the result of the load function, so checkpoint, then brackets, and now we need to enter the name of the key that corresponds to our model, that is that corresponds to self.model state dict, and that is state dict. So in checkpoint and the brackets, we enter in quotes, state underscore dict. And this line of code will update your model. That is, it will update the weight, the parameters of your model. And now we need to do the same for the optimizer. And that's going to be almost the same. So I'm going to copy this line, paste it below. And so this time we're going to update not the model, but the optimizer self.optimizer, then again we use the load state dict method that inherits from the torch module method, and we apply this function to checkpoint of not state dict, but the key that corresponds to the optimizer, and that is optimizer. So here we just replace state dict by optimizer. There we go. Here we update the weights of the model, and here we update the parameters of the optimizer. Perfect. And then, just to finish, we can print a little done, like that. And finally, we just need to specify what happens if this condition is not respected, that is, if there is not a lastbrain.pth file. And so we just need to add an else, then colon. And simply, we're just going to say that there is no such file lastbrain.pth. So we're just going to print something like no check point found and three little dots if you want all right and that gives us a functional load function and mostly a functional dqn class and now huge congratulations because our artificial intelligence is ready you can probably hear by the sound of my voice that i'm getting very excited because now it's time for the demo we just made a brain and we're going to put this brain in the car and we will see how it is clever enough to do these round trips between the airport and downtown, whatever the road is. So I can't wait to show you the demo. This is going to be in the next section. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to the fun tutorial of this first module, self-driving car. It's gonna be epic. We're gonna test our AI on the environment and we're gonna test it on four different levels. That is, we're gonna play a game. The game will have four levels of difficulty and the AI will have to pass these four levels. So. What are going to be these four levels? First, level one. The first level is going to be to reach the airport and then do some round trips between the airport and the downtown. So as soon as we see the car do these round trips, well, we pass level one. Then level two. Level two will be to still do these round trips, but on a specific road that we draw ourselves. But it's going to be an easy road because it's level two. And of course, the car will have to self-drive by staying on that road. So it will be a road that goes from the airport to downtown and then the other way. And so the car will have to do these round trips by staying on that road. If it does, we will pass level two. Then level three. Level three will be to draw some obstacles on the map to see if the car manages to avoid the obstacles 
and still reaching its goal. So no worries, we will draw some difficult obstacles that the car will have to avoid and we'll see if it managed to reach the airport and the downtown. And finally, level 4, the most challenging level for the car, will be to draw a very difficult road to reach the downtown. So I don't know, you know, it will be a road like some zigzag. I'm not a brilliant architect, but I'll try to make a challenging road. So let's hope we pass at least the first level, that would be great. Then let's hope we can also pass level 2 and 3. And if we pass level 4, that would be wonderful. So let's do this. Let's take the challenge. Well, actually, the self-driving car is going to take the challenge. But we are the brain behind this, so let's still hope that works. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is just to give you a quick reminder about the map. So that's the map. And first, we're going to look at the map. We're going to look at the self-driving car without the AI. So it will just be a car having those random actions that you saw at the beginning of this module. So how can we look at that? Well, we have to deactivate the AI. And to deactivate the AI, we simply need to put a temperature equal to zero. Remember, that parameter here is the temperature, and right now it is equal to seven, so that's a low temperature. We will increase that afterwards. But if we don't want the car to have a brain, that is, if we don't want to activate the AI, we simply need to set the temperature to zero. T equals zero, and same here, of course, that's the real temperature in the code. So there we go, and then we must not forget to save, because otherwise that won't include the change. Okay, so now we don't have any AI. The AI is deactivated. So let's have a look at the map, just to give us a quick refresher, a quick reminder about what it looks like. So I'm going to select everything and press enter. All right, and there's our map and there's our car. So as you can see, the car is having totally random actions, you know, to go left, to go straight or to go right. And therefore it is not reaching the airport, which is, I remind, at the upper left of the map. And not reaching, well, it just did, but that's totally random. Uh, you see, right now it is at the airport and it is not reaching the other goal, which is downtown at the bottom right of the map. So we were just lucky here, but we can clearly see now that the actions are totally random. It is going nowhere and there is definitely no artificial intelligence. But no worries, we will activate it right now. I'm going to close the map and then I'm going to restart the kernel. Restart the kernel. You click on this tool button here and then yes. And now time for the show. We're finally going to put this brain we made in the car and activate the AI. I'm super excited to see what's going to happen. We're going to activate the AI right now. And to do this, we need to raise the temperature. So to change the temperature, we just need to replace that zero by, well, let's start with seven as we had before so let's specify seven here all right let's not forget to save and now let's get back to our map and now we can just re-execute this again because we restarted the kernel so let's execute and there we go we have the car and what is it doing well it is trying to find its way it's exploring it's understanding what it has to do and it's about to reach the airport and there we go First goal reached, wonderful. And now the next goal is to reach downtown. And there it did, just reached downtown. And now it's trying to find the airport back, going to the airport, and there it did again. Wonderful, so that works. It didn't take time actually to explore, learn from the mistake. You know, the mistake here is to get further from the goal. That's where we punish the car by giving it a slightly negative reward. You know, it's minus 0.2. So it learned from that mistake and by learning from that mistake, it managed to get the positive rewards by getting closer to the goal. And now it finally understood what it has to do. It's definitely reaching the airport and then reaching the downtown and then doing these brown trips. So that's perfect. We have a self-driving car, but I can't help but notice it is looking like an insect. The car doesn't really seem sure of itself. You know, it doesn't have a very confident movement. It's like going left and right. That's not looking like a car movement. It looks more like a bug. So we're going to fix that. And as you might have guessed, the way to fix that is increase the temperature. Because remember, the temperature is the parameter in the softmax function that we can increase so that the action is returned with more certainty. So that makes sense that if we increase the temperature, 
Well, we might end up getting a car more sure of itself because the AI will be more sure of which action it should play. And that, remember, is because the action will be played with a higher probability. The only problem with this, increasing the temperature, is that remember the AI is less exploring the other actions. Because by increasing the temperature, the other actions will have low probabilities. But right now that doesn't seem to be a problem because the car seems to have no problem reaching its goals, the airport and the downtown. So we can totally increase the temperature if we want this thing that so far looks like an insect look like a car. So let's do this. I'm going to close this now. There we go. Restart the kernel again and press yes. And now we're going to increase the temperature. So let's do this. I'm going back to my AI file, then replace this t equals 7 by 100. There we go. Then we save. And now we have a self-driving car sure of itself. So we might get better results and we might get something that looks more like a car. So let's click on map and then let's re-execute that again. All right, what happened? Okay, it did some kind of a burnout, not sure why. But anyway, now we have something that looks more like a car. You can see that it is going more straight. It is not doing these quick left and right movements. That's because now the car is more sure of which direction to take at each time. You know, it wants to take the best direction going to the airport and then to downtown. So clearly, we can now say that we pass level one. The car is doing these round trips between the airport and the downtown. So we're going to save that. That's, I'm going to show you how to save the brain. We just need to click on this save button. And if we look at what happens here, well, we have the curve of the reward. At the beginning, we can observe some mistakes that it made. So that's where the reward is negative, but then it learned from its mistakes and the reward increased little by little until reaching a constant positive reward equals to 0.1, but that's the maximum reward we set and that's because it ended up exploring. That's the exploration phase and then it just knew what it had to do. And that's where it was doing these round trips between the airport and the downtown without any mistake. So there we go, we passed level one, congratulations. Now let's get things more challenging. Let's take things at the next level. Let's try to pass level two, which I remind will be to do these round trips on a specific road we're gonna draw ourselves. So let's check that out in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to level two of our self-driving car AI game. All right, are you ready to take level two? Are you excited? Well, me too. Let's do this. As you can notice, I just quit the application, but that's not a problem because we saved the last brain. So we're gonna go back to the app and load the last brain. And this will have the last weight of the neural networks. Like, you know, it will have the last synapse of the brain. So it will already know how to do the round trips between the airport and the downtown. But now we're taking on the challenge of passing level two. So as a reminder, level two is to still do the round trips, but by staying on a specific road that we will draw ourselves right now in this tutorial. So let's see if it can do that. Let's make this road simple because then remember that level four is a highly complicated road. So for now, let's still be nice with our self-driving car. All right, so let's do this. It's already selected. I'm going to select that all over again and let's try to beat level two. There we go, it's doing the weird spinning first, but that's because I didn't load it. Let's load the brain, and there we go. Now it should be okay, yes it is. It's doing the round trips between the airport, there we go, and now the downtown. It's going to the downtown, and perfect. And now doing the other round trips. All right, so that's level one, and now let's take care of level two. So I'm gonna draw a road, something like this. So let me think what to draw. Uh, it has to be simple. So what about, what about something like this? So I told you I'm not a very good architect, but I'm trying to do something not too difficult. Something like that. What do you think? All right. So let's draw the other border of the road, you know, something like this. And 
There we go. All right. Pretty good. Well, that's a classic road. But, okay. So, it's in the road. Perfect. And so now, the challenge is not to cross some sand. So, here we go. First mistake. But it's going to learn from this mistake. And try not to do it again. If we actually save the brain, we can see the mistake, probably. Yes. If we look at here, well, we see the mistakes it made here. That's where it crossed some sand, probably. So, there we go. Right now it's on the road and it's reaching the goals. Right now I just reached the downtown and going back on the road to reach the airport. There we go. Perfect job. Well done. So, it seems that level 2 is passed already. Didn't take much time to do the training. So, that's great. That's just great. We can take it at the next level now. Yes, indeed, the round trip looks perfect. We can still sense some bit of hesitation. Maybe we can still increase the temperature. But, you know, it's reaching the goals. It's staying on the road. It's not crossing any sand. So, that's definitely a self-driving car. So, pretty exciting. But now, I want to make it more difficult for the self-driving car. We want to take it to level 3, which will... Oh, here we go, a mistake. Sorry about that. I thought it was already a one game. But, you know, it can still make some mistake. Actually, if we save, we can probably see a constant reward close to 0.1. There we go. And that's probably the mistake. But anyway, it's uh, doing a great job right now. So we will take it to level 3. And the level 3 will be to draw some obstacles, but some difficult obstacles for the car. And the car will have to find its way to the downtown and the airport by avoiding the obstacles. So it will be obstacles full of sand, of course, but it will have to avoid them and find the goals, the airport and the downtown. So let's see if you can do that. And until next time, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to the level 3 of our self-driving car AI game. So now, the challenge is going to be to still do the round trips between the airport and the downtown, but this time by avoiding obstacles. And we will draw the obstacles ourselves. You can draw any difficulty of obstacles. I'll try not to be too tough with the car, because I want to make it to level 4, but let's keep this challenging. Alright, so as usual, we're going to select all this code and execute and there we go with level three so let's load our brain here we go brain is loaded the car is doing the round trips properly and so now let's draw some obstacles all right so what can we do now first let's draw something like this okay and then what we can do is draw another obstacles like this and then maybe something like this, something like this, and something like this. Let's see what it does. Alright, so now what it's going to do, okay, avoiding this obstacle, now avoiding this one, no, mistake again. So still it has to learn, it's still exploring, avoiding this obstacle, perfect, very good. Is it going to avoid this one? Great, it did. And going to the downtown, and now going back to the airport, avoiding this obstacle, great. Now is it going to avoid this one this time? And no, still mistake. It's okay, I'll get this thicker. Maybe something like this will be better. The car will understand more because right now it is being quite stubborn. All right, 
still avoiding this obstacle. It seems not to have any problem with this one, but kind of a problem with that one. Better now. You see, I got it thicker, which means that the punishment was harder with a worse reward, and now it managed to avoid it. And this one avoided as well. Perfect. So now we have a functional self-driving car, as it seems. So avoiding this one again, great. And now avoiding this one, great. Still going on to some sun, but uh, it's okay. It's, it will be punished for that anyway. Avoiding this one. So sorry, this, this one was totally unuseful, but uh, you know, we can do something like this if you want, you know, to get this even more challenging for the car. All right. And okay, we can add a big tip here so that it doesn't cheat because it's still crossing the tip of the obstacle. And we can do the same for the other tips of the other obstacles. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, better now. Let's see what it does now. Okay, there we go again, trying to reach the airport now. Okay, perfect. So it's going around the obstacle. It's not trying to find the best path. But anyway, the goal is to reach the, the two goals, the downtown and the airport. Then we can add some code to, you know, try to find the best path. But uh, we definitely already have a self-driving car. All right. Great. Great job. And there we go again. Oh, it's still going on to some sand, so it's still being punished. We can actually look at the score function, which is here. As you can see, it gets the punishment. And the score function is actually decreasing with time. So, so that's because I got the obstacle thicker and, um, and right now, as you can see, it's trying to avoid the tips of the obstacles more and more. It's doing a better and better job, as you can see, you know, it's going around faster now, not except for this one. But if we save again and look at the score function, as you can see, we see some kind of improvement here. But anyway, the car is going to get better with time. But I think that right now we can say that level three is passed because anyway, it manages to do the round trips between the airports and the downtown by going around the obstacles. And that's what we wanted. So yes, maybe let's move on to level four. Level four is going to be very challenging. I don't think we will be able to pass level four, but that will be the challenge of this module you will have to change something in the code to pass level four. It will either be something that has to do with the reward or something that has to do with, you know, the strategy of the game or even something with the neural network or something with the DQN algorithm. Well, you will look for it. You will do some research and you will try to get an even better car than this one that avoids any kind of obstacle that will never go onto some sand or that will try to find the best way, the best path, the shortest path. So good luck with that. It's going to be excellent practice for you and I can't wait to see your solutions. So now let's move on to level four and this time it's going to be very, very challenging. So I'll see you in the next tutorial and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to the final level of the self-driving car challenge. So this time my goal will be to beat the self-driving car, not the level four, 
because I want to challenge you into improving the code, improving the AI, or maybe improving the strategy so that you can beat this challenge yourself. So I'm going to make a highly complex road that will still go from the airport to the downtown, but maybe too complicated for the car to find its way. So that will be my challenge so that I hope you can have fun with the challenging homework. So let's do this. Let's approach this level four. So let's select everything. Then let's load the brain. And there we go. Now it's doing the round trips between the airport and the downtown. So it's going to take some time. So I'm just going to put on some music. And here we go with the road. And there we go, here is the road. And as you can see, the car seems to have a lot of trouble. So that's exactly what I wanted. It's, you know, doing these little round trips in the same part of the road. So that's a problem. It doesn't find its way right now to the downtown. So how can we fix this? Can we, do we need to change the strategy? Do we need to change the parameters of the neural networks? That is change the synapses in the brain of the car. Do we need to do something with the rewards? You know, maybe get a worse reward when it's not finding the goal, as it is the case right now. So, so I don't know. That's for you to find out. As you can see, the rewards is not very severe when it's not finding the goal. You know, when it's not getting closer to the goal, the reward is just minus 0.2. So that's not a severe bad reward. You could try to decrease the reward even more, like setting a reward equals to minus 0.5. Maybe that will work. I'm just throwing some suggestions to help you. So that's a change you can make with the reward strategy. And then of course you can make some other changes with your neural network. So you know, in this section we create the architecture of the neural network. We choose to have 30 hidden neurons in one hidden layer. Maybe you can try to change the architecture by trying some more layers or some more hidden neurons, I don't know. So that's another suggestion for improvement. And then you can also try to change something in a deep Q learning algorithm. Or simply you can move on to the course and find out about the other algorithms. Maybe there is another one that will manage to handle this situation. So good luck. I look forward to seeing your solutions. Try to draw that same road, that's perfect. That's a really pretty exciting enigma. And if you want me to give you a hint, or if you want me to explain quickly what the problem is, well, you can see that right here, when it reaches that point, it's going back. And that's because when it's reaching that point, it's getting too far away from the goal, which right now is the downtown. You know, when it's reaching that point, if it goes further, well, it will go further away from the goal. So that's why it's going back here. And so you have to change something in a code, something in a strategy to maybe punish it less when it's getting further away from the goal. Maybe that's a solution. I'm just throwing some suggestions. I don't want to give you the solution too fast, but that would be a really good exercise. And that's typically a problem that can be encountered by the engineers when they're making a self-driving car. But anyway, I think that's a pretty cool enigma. So I hope you will have fun. And before solving this homework, maybe you can do another very efficient homework, which would be simply to try to implement all this AI again. You know, just implement the exact same one. That will be excellent practice because so far you've just listened to my explanations, but there is a huge difference between listening to something and try to do the thing ourselves. Oh, oh, did you see what happened? It just found its way. That's amazing. It's funny how it got out of it, but I'm sure there is a better strategy to get out of it more efficiently. And now it seems to be pretty good. Maybe 
I'm speaking too fast, maybe it's going to solve this. No, here we go. It's getting stuck here again. That's pretty challenging for the car, right? But I'm sure this can be solved. That's your goal, so good luck, and please let me know about your solutions. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello my friends and welcome to this new data science use case with ChatGPT, which this time will be on reinforcement learning. So we're going to tell ChatGPT right now that we have programmed a virtual self-driving car without any AI yet. So we have just implemented its ability to move forward, turn left, turn right and stop. And we're going to say that this self-driving car is rewarded if it manages to reach a certain destination and penalized if it goes away from this destination or if it runs into some obstacles. Okay, and then we're gonna ask ChatGPT which AI model should be implemented for the self-driving car and how, okay? So let's do this. I'm gonna open a new chat here and inside we're gonna say exactly, hey, I have programmed a virtual self-driving car with the actions being to move forward, turn left, turn right, and stop. And then this car is rewarded once it reaches a certain destination and penalized if it goes further away from this destination or if it runs into some obstacles okay and now let's be greedy i just wanted to ask for some recommendations on how to build a reinforcement learning model for this self-driving car but let's actually ask to directly build it you know why not let's see what chat gpt is capable of so i'm gonna ask can you please write me a python code using the best libraries to build a reinforcement learning model that implements the AI inside that self-driving car. All right, so it's a bit greedy to ask this, but we never know, ChatGPT might give us exactly what we want. So let's try, and if it runs into any trouble, we will help it, okay? So let's press enter, and here we go. Sure, okay, that's a great start again. I can help you get started with implementing a reinforcement learning model for your self-driving car in Python, amazing. Here is some code that demonstrates how you can use the OpenAI Gym library, awesome, to train a reinforcement learning model for your self-driving car. Okay, so that's amazing, actually. I didn't expect it to, you know, ChatGPT to do it so easily. And uh, it makes all sense what it's doing now. You know, it's uh, initializing the queue table, the number of states, the number of actions, a learning rate initialized to 0.1, a discount factor to 0.95. This is really amazing. I'm in an awe. The exploration weight to 0.5, the maximum number of episodes to 1000, maximum number of steps per episode to 100. Then it trains the Q learning model. Amazing. I'm going to challenge them to, you know, implement a more advanced model like the deep Q learning model or, you know, the A3C. But let's see. It implements everything, you know, from scratch with the for loop. It starts by choosing an action, then it implements, you know, the step where the AI takes the action, then it updates the queue table, and then it sets the state to the next state. This is really the reinforcement learning process, you know, the queue learning process. This is amazing. Then it even implements how to test the queue learning model, and then finally it closes the environment. Wow, that was really amazing. Okay, I didn't expect that much, so since it did it so easily, let's actually challenge it even more, you know, even harder. So uh, first, let's say, of course, thanks a lot. That was really helpful. However, I do know already 
how to implement Q learning. So could you please do the same with a more advanced reinforcement learning model, like for example, deep Q learning, or even better, you know, let's be super greedy, a state of the art reinforcement learning model. Okay, ready for this? Here we go. And certainly, he always says certainly, that's amazing. Here is some code that demonstrates how you can use the OpenAI baselines library to train a deep Q learning model, DQN, for your self-driving car. And here we go again. It gives us the code. That's really amazing. All right, so uh, yes, it uses now the wrap deep mind library from uh, the baselines common Atari library and uh, it implements the AI again with the deep Q learning model this time. That's really, really amazing. This code uses the DQN algorithm to train a deep Q learning model for your self-driving car. The model will learn to take the best action at each state in order to maximize the reward. Alternatively, if you would like to use a more advanced reinforcement learning model, you can use the OpenAI Spinning Up library, which provides implementations of state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms. Here is some code that demonstrates how you can use the Spinning Up library to train a proximal policy optimization PPO model. Indeed, that's a great model for your self-driving car. And here you go, it gives you the model again with the whole code. Wow, what, what a revolution, this uh, ChatGPT. Seriously, I'm, in, uh, I'm really impressed. Right, and uh, there you go, you have the code. This code uses the PPO algorithm to train a reinforcement learning model for your self-driving car. The model will learn to take actions to maximize the expected sum of discounted rewards. I hope this helps. Let me know if you have any questions or if you would like further assistance. Well, even I didn't expect so much, so you know, I'm just impressed just like you at the same time doing all this. So we're gonna say a big thank you. That was amazing. And done. Thanks again for watching this data science use case with ChatGPT. Let's now move on to the next one. And until then, enjoy machine learning. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. In today's section, we're going to tackle deep convolutional Q learning. So we're taking Q deep Q learning to even a further step. So we originally started with Q learning, the simple Q learning. Then we took that to deep Q learning, and now we're taking it to deep convolutional Q learning. So let's see what we're going to discuss in terms of intuition. The intuition section is going to be quite quick. Uh, there's uh, not much that we need to add as long as we're familiar with convolutional uh, neural networks, and we'll touch on this towards the end of today's tutorial. So uh, today, in this section, we're going to talk about deep convolutional Q learning, the intuition behind things, and why it's so powerful, why exactly it's so important to move away from uh, deep Q learning and why deep Q learning is just a basic building block where it's just a step for us on the path to deep convolutional Q learning and what kind of avenues deep convolution, convolutional Q learning opens up to, what kind of avenues the knowledge uh, opens up to and what, where it can be applied. We'll have some examples of that. And then we'll talk about eligibility trace or n-step Q learning, a uh, very powerful addition to the whole concept of deep Q learning. And we'll talk about the intuition behind that. It's quite a complex topic, but nevertheless, we'll break down the intuition in quite simple terms. And then I'll give you some additional references where you can read up about eligibility trace if you'd like to go into more detail. But it is important for us to get the intuition down pat because we're going to be using that in the practical tutorials because we're delving into much more complex topics now that we need to be add these extra extra elements to our agents or to our Q learning algorithms so that they can actually handle these complex environments and navigate them successfully. And of course, in this uh, section, because we're talking about convolutional uh, neural networks, it is highly advisable that you check out Annex number two, convolutional neural networks. Uh, once again, if you've done the deep learning uh, a to Z course, then you already, you're already familiar with uh, this information, so you can safely proceed with these tutorials uh, on the deep convolutional Q learning. If you haven't done the deep uh, learning A to Z course, then um, it's a great idea to look at convolutional neural networks and look at those intuition tutorials there so you understand better how 
images are processed by neural networks in order to look for features and you know, what's the whole convolutional layers are about the pooling layers, uh, the flattening layers, and how all of that works in order to come up with some parameters about that describe uh, the environment or that describe that image. And therefore, we're going to be using those as inputs into our neural network instead of that vector which we're talking about. But more on that in the next tutorial. So uh, if you haven't uh, seen those tutorials yet, uh, we highly advise you to check them out to get up to speed with or refresh your knowledge on convolutional neural networks. All in all, we've got an exciting section and as you can see quite not that many intuition tutorials, meaning that you can, uh, you'll be able to jump into uh, the practical side of things very quickly. So on that note, I can't wait to see you on the first tutorial and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. In today's tutorial, we're starting off the section on deep convolutional Q-learning. So let's have a look at what it's all about. Previously, we talked about deep Q-learning. So we had an environment with an agent and we had a vector describing that environment which was fed into a neural network and at the end we got the Q values as our outputs. And then, of course, we, we found out how to how the network is trained, the learning part. We found out how actions are decided based on those Q values. That's an action part. And we talked about the uh, action selection policies and, and different things about um, how deep Q learning works. But here, the key concept for all of this is how do we get from this, from the actual environment and the states, to the neural network well the transition is over here the input vector so the input layer of our neural network and it is a vector so what we're looking at is okay so we're actually actually not the correct it's not the correct term we're not looking at anything the agent basically has this information so the environment is passing it this information saying okay you the agent you're currently in the this your state is described by this vector in this simplified example uh, it's described by this vector x1 of 1, x2 of 2. So your coordinates are 1, 2, and that is your whole state. In a, in a more complex environment, the state might in involve other things um, that the agent uh, can be observing. But the point here is that it is passed as a vector. And the thing is that that doesn't happen in real life. In real life, yeah, except for GPS systems and other things like that, but in real life, what do we use most of the time? We use our senses. We use our eyes. Even in GPS, it's not built into our brain. It's not telling us the coordinates through our brain. And so it, we're still using our eyes to look at, at the GPS and understand what's going on there. And so this is kind of cheating for AI to be able to get like information about the environment as a vector. It's too simple. It's not how it works in real life. That's not how we as humans operate. And ultimately, we want to create artificial intelligence, which can operate sim in a similar fashion to humans, which is as, uh, like, can, can take on the same challenges as humans. And so in, in the human world, we don't have that. We don't have that. We don't have these coordinates or other types of vectors that are passed to us that explain the state we're in in that environment. So we're going to have to remove that to make it more realistic. And then what can we replace it with? What do we see or what do we do as a human to get information? Well, most of the time we see. Of course, we use all of our senses, but most of the information that we're getting about the, out, uh, the world around us comes through our sight. And that is why we're going to change that little arrow which we had into a whole convolutional uh, neural network. So this is from our annex number two, uh, we've got the convolution layer, and that's why it's important uh, to be quite comfortable with convolution, convolutional neural networks and how they work. So you've, uh, if you've done our deep learning course, then you should be comfortable with that, or you can just have a look at the annex number two. We've got some very good intuition tutorials there. So here we've got the convolution operation, which happens. So we, we're actually going to be looking at this as an image. So this is an image of um, net environment and so the agent is actually looking at the environment so in this case uh, not that he's like looking from within there he's like looking like let's say he's playing this on a computer and he can see this environment and therefore he can see like where this 
figure representing the agent is actually actually is so you can see this whole environment or whatever a human would see if, if it's actual maze then the human would see the maze from inside and so the agent should be able to see exactly the same thing so whatever he sees is uh, done uh, goes through a convolution layer it goes through a full pooling layer goes through flattening again you can find about out about more about these different parts of the convolutional uh, neural network in the annex and then after it's flattened then we have inputs which go into the neural network. And this is way more realistic because the agent has to use uh, their site and or has to process images which the environment is supplying to the agent just as a human would be processing images. And the beauty of this is not just that it's more realistic and it's kind of like more as a human, the agent's actually more as a human would be, but it allows us to process much more complex environments. For instance, this is how we can play Doom or other games like that because instead of just getting a vector of information, which um, like uh, somebody would have created for us in this environment, we can just hook up our artificial intelligence to any environment which as humans, we would have a vision of this environment. So we, as a human, when you're playing this game, you can see exactly this picture. And that's exactly what the artificial neural network or the agent would see now. So in, in this part of the course, when you're going to be programming the pra practical tutorials, the agent will actually see this exact picture. It will see the pixels. It will get this exact picture of all of the pixels with this person, with this, with this gun, with this face, with this percentage, with everything. Exactly what we see here, that's exactly what the agent will see. Then it will have to dissect that through convolutional layer, pooling layer, flattening, and then it will go into a neural network. And needless to say that the neural network will actually be much more complex than that. So let's replace it with something like this. This is not much more complex. This is a, looks a little bit more complex, but in reality, the neural networks you're going to be working with and creating with Adlan are going to be quite interesting. They're going to be much more complex than this. But as you can see already here, even if we just have five inputs instead of two, things become much more complex. And here you can see we have many more actions that the agent can take. So in the game of Doom, you turn left, turn right, look down, look up, run, shoot, reload, or you know all those different actions that are possible in a first person shooter like like Doom. And moreover, it doesn't have to be that. It can you can attach this agent to another type of game. That's the beauty of it that it then realizes that it can now operate any kind of environment that you attach it to because as long as there's like a visual representation of environment of that environment, it's already got the whole infrastructure, the whole structure is ready to process that. So that's what uh, deep convolutional Q-learning is all about. So we're taking it even to the next step. We're adding convolutions into or the uh, convolutional layers into our agent's brain now. And we're making it even more complex, and therefore we can we're rewarded with uh, being able to solve even more complex challenges. So I hope you're very excited about this. This is going to be an, an epic section, and we're going to create some amazing things. And I can't wait to see you on the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome back to the course on artificial intelligence. In today's tutorial, we're going to cover off quite a complex tutorial called Eligibility Trace or N-Step Q Learning. And this is something that we're going to implement in the practical side of things. So that's why we need to cover it off. And at the same time, it is quite a complex topic. So I've got a very interesting approach to getting us up to speed with the intuition behind this. So I have like a, a different approach in mind than we're used to. So let's let's have a look at that and see how that goes. So I'm going to give you an example to start off with. Like I'm going to give you an example in this tutorial and that will demonstrate the power of eligibility choice and it'll give us the intuition behind things. And then if you like to delve further into eligibility trace, I'll give you the best place where you can read about it. Uh, I'll give you a reference to a book. But otherwise, so why this is going to be different is because we're going to first look, rather than delving into the intuition, we're going to look at an example and the intuition will become obvious after we talk about it. And that's that's my hopes for this tutorial. So let's have a look. Let's see. Let's see if we can do this. So here we've got two agents and they're navigating the same environment. And we're going to see how these two agents work. The first one is going to work without eligibility trace. Second one is going to work with eligibility trace. And hopefully we'll see why the second one is going to be so much more powerful than the first one. So let's have a look. We're going to look at this agent first. And the way he operates is 
the exact way that we've discussed uh, deep uh, queue learning so far. Uh, so the agent is going to take a, a step or is going to move, take an action, move into a new state. It's going to get a certain reward. It's going to uh, put that reward through its algorithm, update the neural network that's uh, running this agent or that's running in the mind of this agent. So that's basically how it's, it's learning from the environment. Then it's going to take a new step. So from this new state, it's going to take a new action based on what its neural network is telling it to do. It's going to get a reward, it's going to update and so on. And it's going to keep doing that. So obviously this agent is going to do quite a good job. And as we've seen uh, previously from the previous practical tutorials, we're going to get some quite good results here. But now we're going to add a new feature. Now this agent number two, this guy over here, he's going to navigate the same environment, but he's going to use the legibility trace. And this is what it means. What he's going to do is he's going to take N steps. He's going to take, in this case, five, four steps. He's going to take four steps and then only after taking these steps will he get uh, calculate the total reward that he got from those steps and he will put it through his network. He will put it through his uh, neural network that's governing the decision-making process and then the neural network will learn from that. Uh, so which one right away, like which one do you think is more powerful? The guy that is just taking a one step at a time and kind of like poking in the blind or in the dark and he's like, okay, so I'm going to take a step, see what happens. I'm going to take a step, see what happens. I'm going to take a step, see what happens. The guy at the top. Or the guy that takes just very courageously marches through four steps in a row and then he decides whether those were good steps or not altogether. And why you can see here or why you're probably getting a sense for why the second guy is better or is more powerful is because the second guy actually knows what's at the end. The first guy, when he's when he's assessing whether this step is good or not, he's only looking at the reward that he's getting. And so he's only guided by the reward the environment is giving him. Same thing here. He's only guided by the reward that this environment is giving him here. Uh, so every time that's his only kind of compass that he has, the reward, the reward, the reward. Um, whereas here, the he actually can assess after taking all these steps, he can assess, oh, okay, so I did get to the finish line. So this combination of steps was good. All of them were good. Or, oh no, I ended up in the fire pit. Or, oh no, I I didn't win. the the My car didn't get to the finish line. Or I crossed the sand wall. Or I lost the game of Doom. Or something like that. And then he decides for himself that this whole combination of steps is bad. And therefore, for these steps that are earlier on, he has more information. He has more insights. Uh, like in, in a very intuitive approach, this, again, this is a much more complex topic than we're portraying here. But in an intuitive way, for example, if we take this step, this step only has information to you to update it. You only have information coming back from this reward here. And for this step, in this case, the same exact step, it has more information. It has information coming all the way from, okay, so what was the outcome after four steps or five steps or whatever? Yeah, so that is that is how it works. And why it's called eligibility trace is because during this process, not only does he look at the cumulative reward of this uh, of what's what's going on, and then the cumulative loss, and, and then all of that is propagated through the network, but actually there's a trace of eligibility. That's why it's called eligibility trace. There's a trace uh, that is kept in in the algorithm, which says, okay, so if we do get a uh, let's say we get a punishment, we get a negative reward, then which of these steps is most likely to be eligible for that re that that punishment? So not only do we know what, what overall this whole pattern or, or this, this combination of steps is, but we also keep an, a trace of eligibility, which steps are we going to update if we get a reward? So for instance, if it's a negative reward, we might have an eligibility trace that indicates to us that this is the step that is most responsible for what we got in the end. Or if it's a positive reward, again, we might know uh, the, the algorithm helps us keep track. This eligibility trace algorithm helps, helps us keep track of what's, uh, what step um, or what action it needs to be is eligible to, eligible to be updated based on that reward that we get. And that's why it's called eligibility trace. And so that's the basic intuition behind eligibility trace. And hopefully these two examples of these two agents make it quite obvious or quite intuitive in why eligibility trace can be so powerful. And if, as promised, if you'd like to delve further into the topic of eligibility 
uh, traces or n-step q learning then uh, a wonderful amazing book is which is uh, you can, which you can find is called reinforcement learning and introduction is by uh, richard sutton and andrew barto 1998 i think they're in the process of uh, creating a second edition or they've already created a second edition but this is the most common or the, mo the most popular or the most referenced um, book on reinforcement learning it's got a ridiculous number of citations uh, i think like tens of thousands if i'm not mistaking and also the chapter you need for this is chapter seven so in order to look at um, eligibility traces there's a whole chapter about it chapter seven you can read about it and it goes into lots of detail uh, forward backward eligibility traces um, and also how you know, you've got temporal difference on one hand and on the, and the other end of the spectrum you have Monte Carlo methods in between you have eligibility traces so eligibility traces are your link to go from temporal differences to Monte Carlo methods very interesting read lots of pictures which I really really appreciated very uh, intuitive explanations so there's lots of things that you can learn from this book uh, about uh, artificial intelligence and reinforcement learning but specifically eligibility traces are like a very good place to go to is this book for eligibility traces and the second reference for today is uh, something that Adlan is going to show you in the uh, practical tutorials uh, the uh, deep learning or the Google deep mind uh, research paper on asynchronous methods for a deep reinforcement learning yes that's the paper that's the one paper that uh, the a3c paper that we're going to be discussing further down in this course we're getting closer and closer to it and as, as uh, you can tell we're pretty excited about this so this is uh, going to be looking a little bit at about at how they implemented eligibility traces in this paper so we're going to be uh, using this more for the practical side of things so hopefully you enjoyed today's tutorial and now you're a bit more comfortable with eligibility traces and i can't wait to see you next time until then enjoy ai hello and welcome again to module 2 doom we will now get us ready to start the implementation of our ai and as usual the first thing that we need to do is set the right folder as working directory so let's do this now so that we can move on to what's more interesting. So as usual, I start on my desktop, then I go to my artificial intelligence AZ folder, then module two now, Doom, and there we go. That's the folder we have to set as working directory. So let's do this now. We click on this tool button here, then restart kernel, and then yes. And here we go. We now have the right folder as working directory. So now, as you can see, we have four files well, actually three files in one folder in this working directory folder. So let's start with the first one. The first one is ai.py. That's, of course, the file that will contain our artificial intelligence. And that's nothing else than this file here. That is the ai.py file in which we will implement everything that is related to building an AI and especially building an AI with the deep convolutional Q-learning model. So basically, that's where we'll have the big adventure. Then we have some other files. So we have the second file here, which is experience replay.py. And so this time I put experience replay separately just because we already implemented it. And now we want to focus on what's new. And trust me, we have a lot of new things to do with this new artificial intelligence because not only we want to build an AI, but we want to build an AI to beat Doom. So you can imagine that this will require some quite advanced code. So no worries, we have a big code waiting for us and you will learn a lot of new tricks. That's why this experience replay trick that you already know and that I remind improves a lot the training. Well, let's put it separately in this experience replay.py file so that we can now focus on all the new concepts, techniques and tricks that are waiting for us. All right, and then we have the image preprocessing.py file. So that's Another Python file which will take care of pre-processing our images because you know this time our AI will have eyes and that's because the input states are no longer encoded by a vector but this time the input states are the images. So the first layer of the big neural network that we will make will be the eyes and that will be the convolutional layers of the convolutional neural network. But to make sure these images can be accepted as input of the convolutional neural network, well, we need to pre-process them. And so this file will take care of pre-processing these images so that they can go into the neural network. 
And so I separated this file because this is not directly related to AI. And again, we want to keep the maximum of our brain and our memory and our focus on everything that is related to AI. So we are putting this separately so that we can pre-process the images in a flashlight and save some energy for the rest. You can have a look at it if you want. And if you also have the deep learning course where well, you can have a look at the practical tutorials, we talk about image pre-processing. But here again, we really want to focus on AI. Trust me, we have a lot to do. And eventually the last folder, well, that's the videos folder. So right now this folder is empty, as you can see. But when we execute the code, some videos of the AI playing Doom will be added to this folder. So that will be very exciting because we will see on some videos how well the AI is doing. So we will literally see the AI killing the monsters and trying to run towards the goal. So you're gonna see this will be pretty exciting. So of course the first videos will be very bad because the AI will not be trained much yet and so it will get killed very fast. But then you will see that as the training is progressing, well the AI will get better and better and eventually it will manage to kill some monsters not getting killed and hopefully we will be able to make it reach the goal. All right, so let's go back to our AI file, which is this one. And as you can see, I already took care of importing all the essential libraries and packages that we need to play Doom. So let's quickly have a look at them one by one. We have, of course, NumPy, because we'll be working with arrays. That's inevitable. Then we have Torch, of course, because we're implementing the AI with PyTorch. Then we have the torch.nn module, which contains all the tools to implement a neural network. So for example, the NN module will contain the convolutional layers that will be part of our future neural network. Then we have the nn.functional package, which has the shortcut F and that contains all the functions that are used in a neural network. So typically the activation functions. We will be using some rectifier activation functions, but also some max pooling function for the convolutional neural network, and all these functions are contained in functional. Then we have Optim, which is of course for our optimizer. I think we will be using an Atom optimizer, and this optimizer is contained in Optim. And then the best of the best of PyTorch, the variable class from the autograd module. And that's all the power of PyTorch because that's what contains the dynamic graphs allowing to perform very fast computations of the gradient, even the gradient of composition functions. So we will definitely be using it as for the self-driving car, but trust me for Doom, we will be needing it very bad. Okay, so that's all for the essential libraries. Then we need to import some packages related to OpenAI Jim and Doom. So of course we import Jim, then we import some wrappers module of the Jim library, and one of these wrappers is Kip wrapper so that's basically to import all the tools and environments of Jim and finally we have this package that we need to import and which is directly related to Doom and that's the action space and to discrete of the Doom wrapper that basically contains the environment of Doom and more specifically the actions that can be played the number of actions for the specific Doom game we're going to play and I remind that there are six actions move left move right turn left turn right move forward and shoot, attack. All right, so that's basically what you need to import for Doom. And then finally, we of course need to import our two internal files, experience replay.py for experience replay and image preprocessing to preprocess the images that are nothing else than the images of the screen when playing the game. And these images will be preprocessed, converted into NumPy arrays, reshaped to a certain format and then they will go to the neural network, the convolutional neural network. All right, so I guess now that we're ready to start the big implementation of this AI, and now it's very important for me to tell you that that leads me to the very important point of this module. It's that since, you know, I told you we have a big implementation waiting for us. Well, in order to not get lost in all this, we need a good structure. And so I already highlighted the structure. We will be implementing this in two parts. The first part will be about building the AI. So that's where we will make the brain of the AI. And the brain, as you understood, is nothing else than the neural network. You know, this big CNN composed of some convolutional layers 
and then some fully connected layers to predict the outputs that are still the Q values. And then we'll make the body of the AI. And that's a new representation I'm bringing to you. And that's again, not to get lost. You will see that the further we progress with the code, the more you will see the structure and everything will make sense in the end. And to make sure that makes sense, we need a representation of the AI. And basically this first part, building the AI, will be composed of three sections. First section will be about making the brain, that is the neural network. The second section will be about making the body, and I'm calling it the body because this is the part that will tell the AI how to play the action. So you know, first you have the brain that detects the images and predicts the Q values, but then you need to specify how the AI should play the action. And that, it does it with its body, like a human body would do. So the body will be the part where we will specify the method of playing the action. So for example, with our self-driving car, the brain was the neural network we made and the body was how the action was played, that is with the softmax method. In here, that's the same. We're gonna make a brain and we're gonna make a body which will play the action. I will let you find out. But the key point in all this is that we will have a very structured code so that not only you can take a step back and really understand what's going on, but also you will be able to use it as a framework whenever you want to build an AI for other purposes. All right, and after building the AI in part one, we will move on to part two, which will be about implementing the deep convolutional Q-learning model. And there again, we'll have different sections, and one of them will be, of course, to train the AI. So I can't wait to dive into it now. We're gonna start with part one, obviously, and we're gonna start by making the brain of our AI. So I can't wait, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to the first part of this AI implementation, part one, building the AI. And as you can see, I already added a dimension in the structure of this implementation with these three sections composing part one, which clearly show how we're gonna build this AI. First, we're gonna make the brain, that is nothing else than the neural network. Then we're gonna make the body, which will define how the actions are gonna be played. And then once we have the brain and the body, we will assemble them to make the AI, which will be in the last section of this first part. So now you can already have a good vision of the structure of this implementation. First we make the brain, then we make the body, and then we assemble the two to make the AI. And in this tutorial, we're gonna start with the first section that is about making the brain. And this is going to take us four tutorials. You can imagine that making a brain is not like making a cake, so this will require more than one tutorial. And of course, as usual, we're going to represent that brain with a class because we will need several functions. And in order to have a structure of several functions that will be organized in some kind of instructions, well, of course, we need a class. And that's perfect because once we make that class, well, we will be able to create as many brains as we want by just creating some objects of this class. So again, classes in Python and in general in object-oriented programming languages are very practical because you make your model of something you want to build and then you're able to create as many objects as you want and they will have all the features that you define in the class. And for our brain, the features will be of course, well, first of all, the architecture of the neural network, which I remind will be a CNN, and of course the different functions, like for example, passing on the signals from the input neurons to the output neurons. So that will be of course the forward function that we will make. So let's do this, let's start making the brain. This is going to be pretty exciting. It is one of my favorite parts and therefore let's get straight into it. So we're gonna start by introducing a class, of course, and we're gonna call this class, well, I hesitated to call it brain, but let's be more direct and let's call it CNN because actually the brain is a CNN network, a convolutional neural network. So as you want, you can call it brain if you want, but at least now we know what we're building. And CNN, as for the network of the self-driving car, is going to inherit from the NN module. So remember, the NN module is what we imported here, and we want to be able to use all the tools of this NN module, and therefore we want to use this technique in object-oriented programming, which is inheritance, and which allows us to, you know, well, use all the tools from a parent class. And this parent class is going to be nn.module. There we go. 
And now we can use all the tools and objects of the nn.module. All right? So now that we have our inheritance, we can go into the class to make our first function. And as you probably guess, the first function is the init function that will define all the variables of the future brain objects, you know, the future CNN objects that will be created. All right, so let's do this. Def, then two underscores, init, two underscores again, and now we need to input some variables. So first, the first variable is going to be self. That's, of course, to refer to the object. Now, I guess you're pretty comfortable with this. Then we're going to add another variable, which will be the number of actions in the Doom environment. So we're going to call it number actions, number of actions. And actually, this variable is not compulsory for the init function. It's just that if you want to test the AI that we're going to build on other Doom environments, well, this will be very practical because we will import this number of actions variable from the Doom environment wrappers with two discrete. And when doing that, we will, you know, input the name of the environment, Doom v0. And so if you want to, you know, experiment with this AI on other Doom environments and play on other games, well, you won't have anything to do because this number of actions will directly get the number of actions in the Doom environment you'll be playing with. Okay, so that's it for the two arguments of this init function. So now we can go inside. And now remember what we have to do. The first thing we have to do is activate the inheritance with the super function. So that's exactly like for the self-driving car. We take the super function. Then inside, we start by inputting the class that will define the neural network. And that is CNN. Then we have to input self to refer to the object. But then remember, that's not all. We need to add here a dot and then the init function with some parentheses. And by doing that, we activate the inheritance, and now we can use all the tools from the nn.module. All right, so now I think it's time to build the architecture of the neural network. And so as you remember, we're going to build a CNN, a convolutional neural network, simply because this time the AI will have eyes, and the eyes of the AI will be the convolutional layers of this convolutional neural network. And then after the AI visualizes the images with the convolutional layers, it will pass on the signals into a classic artificial neural network. So that is the one that we had before with fully connected layers. And that's where it will try to predict the Q values for each possible actions that we can play. So you have the architecture in mind. First, we're gonna have some convolutional layers and then some fully connected layers. And this will be the brain of our AI. So what, what we're going to do to, you know, be able to have a step back at what we're making, well, let's just make this architecture with the variables we want to create. So actually, speaking of this architecture, we're going to build a CNN with three convolutional layers, and then after that, one hidden layer. That means that we will need three convolutional connections and two full connections. And speaking of connections, that's exactly what we're about to define. That will be the variables of our CNN class. And therefore, right now, I'm going to define five variables, three for the convolutional connections and two for the full connections. So let's do this. We're going to start with the convolution connections. So I'm going to call them self.convolution1. I'm going to copy that and paste them below. And there we go self-convolution 2 and self-convolution 3. That's our convolution connections. So this first convolution 1 here will apply some convolution to the input images to get a first convolutional layer. Then the second convolution 2 here will take the first convolutional layer as input and by applying again some convolution it will create a second convolutional layer and in this convolutional layer we will get some new images each of them detecting one specific feature. So we will get these new images in a convolutional layer. Then we will apply this convolution two here to connect these new images from this first convolutional layer to some new images of a second convolutional layer. And these new images again will detect some features in the images of the first convolutional layer. So it's just to reinforce the feature detection. And then to the images of the second convolutional layer, we apply the third convolution here 
to get, for each of them, some more images that detect even more features inside the input images. And so the more we do this, the more we apply some convolutions to the different layers of images, well, the more we are able to detect some features. And that's how, by detecting the features, the AI will understand where the monsters are, where it has to shoot to kill them, and where it should go to. It will also detect the walls, the obstacles, well, literally where it has to go. And that is thanks to what all these convolutional layers detect in the original input images. All right, so that's for the convolution part of the CNN. But then remember, after the convolutional layers, we have to flatten all the pixels obtained by the different series of convolutions that were applied. And by flattening all the arrays of pixels, we get this huge vector that will become the input of a classic artificial neural network. And that's where we get our fully connected layers and therefore our full connections. And so now what we have to do is create two new variables because we're going to have one hidden layer in this classic artificial neural network that comes next. And therefore we need one full connection from this huge flattened vector to this one hidden layer and a second full connection between this one hidden layer and the output layer composed of the output neurons that are the Q values. So let's make these two first connections and then we will define all these connections. So as for the self-driving car, we're going to call them self.fc1 and then self.fc2. All right, so now we have all our variables. And so now what we have to do is, of course, define them with the classes of the NN module. So that means we will basically create the architecture of the neural network. And that's what we'll do in the next tutorial. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. Now we have to define the five variables of this init function, that is the three convolutions and the two full connections. So let's start with the first one. Convolution one applies convolution to the input images. So that's the original images. And now you're gonna see how everything will become so simple to create this convolution. Well, what we have to do is actually create an object of some specific class. And this class is taken from NN. And then the class is conv. 2D. 2D because we're working with 2D images. And now, as you can see, we need to input several arguments. First one is in channels. So let's input it in channels. The second one is out channels. The third one is kernel size. And the rest of them are the stride, the padding, the dilation, groups, and bias. And we have default values for all these ones. So we're not going to input them. We're going to keep the default values. But what's important is these three arguments, in channels, out channels, and kernel size. And so do you guess what they correspond to? Well, very simply, in channels correspond to the input of the convolution, and out channels correspond to the output of the convolution. So in channels, what is it going to be? Well, very simply, that's going to be the number of channels in our images. And actually, we're going to work with black and white images, because basically we don't need colors to recognize the monsters. The AI is totally capable of recognizing the monsters in black and white. So we don't need the colors. It will just recognize them by their shape. And therefore, we're going to use one channel. So one channel is when you have black and white images. And three channels is when you have colored images. And therefore, since we're working with black and white images, in channels is going to be equal to one. Then out channels. So out channels is going to be equal to the images you want to have in the convolutional layer which is the output of this convolution one. And so basically, this is equal to the number of features you want to detect in your original images, because we will create one image per feature we want to detect, because basically you know how it works. We apply one feature detector to the input image to detect a specific feature in the input image, and therefore the number of output images here is the number of features we want to detect. So now the question is, how many features do we want to detect? Well, a common practice is to start with 32 feature detectors. And so that will lead us to 32 processed images in this first convolutional layer. So the input is one black and white image, a real image, and the output in the first convolutional layer is 32 processed images. And by processed, I mean, of course, that the convolution was applied to the input image to get 32 new images with detected features. And then we need to specify a kernel size. 
which is nothing else than the dimensions of this square that will go through the original image. And in common practice, we use either 2x2 or 3x3 or 5x5. And for the first one, we're going to use a 5x5 feature detector. That is a feature detector that will have 5x5 dimensions. And then we will reduce the size of this kernel for the next convolutional layers. And speaking of it, this is exactly what we're going to do now. We are going to copy this to define the second convolution. And therefore, I'm pasting that here. And now it's very funny and very easy. It's like a domino. The input channel of the second convolutional layer is the output channel of the first convolutional layer. So this number of outputs 32 here is the same number of inputs 32 here. And that's because we have 32 images in the input convolutional layer of the second convolution. And so the second convolution is applied to this second convolutional layer to return a third convolutional layer. And so now the question is, how many new images do we want? Well, same, let's create 32 new images. 32 is actually a very common number in convolutional neural networks. If you look at the architectures, you will find 32 in many of them. And then for the kernel size, well, we need to reduce the kernel size, that is the dimensions of our feature detector. And so now we're gonna go from five to either four or even three. And then we'll go even smaller. All right, so our second convolution is ready. It takes as input 32 processed images, each one detecting a first feature of the original input image. And it creates 32 new images thanks to this reduced dimensions of the feature detector. And so now let's push this even more. So I'm copying this and pasting that here to create a third convolution to detect some features. And so now that's the same. The input channels here is the number of input images at the left of the convolution connection. And that is the number of processed images that was at the right of the previous convolution connection. So that's 32. Therefore, we keep 32 here. That's perfect. And now the question is again, how many new images do we want to detect? We are going to take now 64 and therefore 64 output processed images. And of course, now we take a smaller kernel size and we're going to take two. And so that's a very classic architecture of a convolutional layer. And it's very efficient to have a high level of feature detection inside images. All right. And so now that we have our three convolutional layers, thanks to our three convolution connections here. Well, now it's time to get our two full connections that I remind will take this huge vector that we obtain after flattening all the 64 times 32 times 32 again images that we got from all these convolutions. So we flatten all the pixels of these images and we get one huge vector that will become the input of a new fully connected neural network. And so that's when we have to make these full connections between first this huge vector and a hidden layer, and then a second full connection between the hidden layer and the output layer composed of the output neurons, each one corresponding to a Q value of the possible actions. So let's make these two full connections. You know how to do that. That's exactly what we did for the self-driving car. So let's do that again. Well, first we take our NN module, then we take the linear class, because again, the full connection we create is an object of the linear class. And then in parentheses, well, that's the same. First, we input the input features, that is the number of them, then the output features. And so the input features for the first full connection, what is it going to be? Well, that's going to be equal to the number of pixels there are in this huge vector obtained after flattening all the processed images after the three convolutions. And so what is this number? Well, actually, there is a trick here. This number is actually hard to get. We actually need to make a function to compute that number. We don't have a variable that will get us this number. We have to compute it. And therefore, what we're going to do now, and now it's very important to understand the mindset of programming that we must have. I'm trying to bring to you the mindset that is what you must be thinking right now to do to overcome this obstacle. Because the first time you might say, hey, I don't have this number of neurons in the flattened vector. What should I do? I'm stuck here. Well, no, actually, because what you can do now is simply input any name here that will represent this number of neurons. So I'm calling it number neurons, number of neurons. And then we will simply make a function that will return 
in this number of neurons variable, this number of pixels we're looking for. So we can totally do that. We can totally put this variable. Well, of course, we'll get a warning because it doesn't exist yet, but we will create it afterwards with a function. And we are totally allowed to do that, even if the function comes afterwards. So that's a typical programming thinking you must have when you get that kind of obstacle. Well, you can make a function to get what you're missing. All right, and then out features, and out features, that's the number of neurons in the hidden layer. And that, this time, is up to you. That depends on the architecture of the neural network you want to create. And so a good number would be not a too small number. So, for example, 40 neurons might be fine. We can try to increase it. If the training is not too slow, you can try to increase it. Maybe that will improve the predictions. But let's start with 40. Maybe we'll increase that afterwards. All right, so that's it for the first full connection. Then we'll copy this, paste that here for the second full connection, that is the connection between the hidden layer and the output layer. And so the in features here becomes the out features of the previous layer, and that is 40. So here we input 40. That's, of course, the number of neurons in the hidden layer. And out features here is going to be equal to the number of output neurons there should be in our neural network. And since each output neuron corresponds to one Q-value and one Q-value corresponds to one action, well, the number of output neurons here is, of course, the number of actions. And we have one variable for this, which is number actions. And therefore, here we input number actions. And there we go. Congratulations. We defined the architecture of our neural network. Our neural network is composed of three convolutional layers and one hidden layer, all this in one big CNN. And this CNN will detect the features in the game so that the AI will know what it has to do, where it has to go, and where it needs to shoot. So there we go for this step. That's the first very important step done. Now we're gonna move on to the next step, which is of course to get this number of neurons that is still missing. That's actually why we have the warning here, undefined name, number neurons. But no worries, now we will make a function that will return the number of neurons in this huge vector and we will put that number in a variable that we'll call number neurons. So let's do this in the next tutorial. That's our next step. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. So now the next step is to make that count neurons function, which will give us what we want. That is this number of neurons in this huge vector after the convolutions are applied. That's the only missing information we need right now. And we're going to get it with a function. So let's make this function. We are going to call it count underscore neurons, very simply. And what is this count neurons function going to take as argument? Well, it is going to take the object, self, but then it's going to take something else. Because this number of output neurons in the flattening layer actually only depends on one thing. It depends on the dimensions of the original input image, the one that goes at the very beginning of the neural network. And so the only argument we need right now is actually these dimensions, the dimensions of the input images. Therefore, let's give a name to this argument representing the dimensions of the input image, and we're going to call it image dim. All right. And I can tell you right now that the actual dimensions of the input images coming from Doom are going to be 80 by 80. We're going to reduce the size of the original images to 80 by 80, and that's going to be the format of the images going into the neural network. So image dim is actually going to be 1, 80, 80, and the 1 corresponds to the fact that we're working with black and white images, that is with only one channel. So image dim is going to be equal later to the tuple 180 and 80. All right, so that's the only argument we need. And now let's count the neurons. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we actually don't have any input image right now. We don't have any Doom image that we can import. We're going to do that later. So the first thing we have to do is create a fake image, but that has dimensions 80 by 80. We're going to create that fake image with fake pixels and that will still give us eventually the number that we want because that number only depends on the dimensions and not on the pixels that are inside the images. So let's just create a fake image to start and then we will compute the number of neurons that we want. So the trick to create a fake image is, well, we're going to call it X, first of all, and then we're going to use the torch dot 
rend because you know we're going to put some random pixels in this images so we're using this random functions from torch which is the rend function then inside we're going to input as you can see the dimensions of the images that is 18080 but since we're going to input this image into the neural network and as you remember the neural network can only accept batches of input states that is here batches of input images we are going to create that fake dimension which we can directly do in this run function we actually just need to start with a one that will correspond to the batch and then we can just put the tuple 18080 corresponding to the dimensions of the input image and as you understood these dimensions are contained in this image dim argument which represents that tuple 18080 so so now we just need to add image dim but in order to pass the elements of a tuple because you know right now image dim is a tuple as a list of arguments of a function we need to add here before image dim that is before the tuple a star the star will allow to pass the elements of the image dim tuple as a list of arguments for a function and as you can see that's exactly what is specified here with the star and the dimensions all right, so that will create an image of fake pixels. So that will have nothing to do with the Doom images. But again, we will still be able to get the final number of neurons. And now the last thing that we need to do, remember, is to convert this input batch of vector into a torch variable, because this is going to go into the neural network. All right, so this now represents an input image of random pixels that was just converted into a torch variable and that will now go into the neural network and more specifically the convolutional layers of the neural network because since we only need the number of neurons after the convolutions are applied we will just go up to the convolution 3 so right after the third convolutional layer and we will not go into the two full connections here and that's because the number of neurons that we want is between convolution 3 and fc1 all right, so now that we have one input image with the right dimensions, well, it's time to propagate this image into the neural network to reach the flattening layer. Then we're gonna get the neurons in the flattening layer and we will just get the information that we want, that is the number of neurons in this flattening layer. So now what we have to do is exactly what we do in a forward function. We need to propagate the signals into the neural network, but only in the convolutional layers until we reach the flattening layer. So let's do this. We're going to update x. Now x is the input image. And with the second x here, x will become, well, the first convolutional layer. And now what we have to do is a three steps process. First step, we apply the convolution to the input images. Then second step, we apply max pooling to the obtained convoluted images. And then third step, we activate the neurons in this pooled convoluted images and so x will become this first convolutional layer composed of all these pooled convoluted images so let's do this first step apply the first convolution convolution one to the input images so what we do is take our convolution one self dot convolution one there we go we apply it to our input images which so far are represented by x so that's the first step, first step done. Now, second step, we are going to apply max pooling to our convoluted images returned by convolution one X. And to apply max pooling, well, we're gonna take a function from the functional module. So we take F, the shortcut, then dot, and then we're gonna use the function max pool 2D. That's the one. We put self convolution one X in the parenthesis of the max pool 2D function because we apply max pooling to the convoluted images. But this max pooling function takes additional arguments, which are first the kernel size. So again, that's the size of the window sliding through your images, and that will take the maximum of the pixels in each slide. So that will still detect the features because the features are associated to a high value of the pixel in the arrays, as you saw in the intuition lectures. So this first argument here we need to input is this kernel size and we're going to take three. That's a common choice for the kernel size. And then we need to input the strides, you know, by how many pixels it's going to slide in the images. And we're going to take a stride of two. 
Again, that's a common choice. So there we go. Now the second step is done. And now let's move on to the third step, which is to activate all the neurons in this pooled and convoluted images, in this first convolutional layer. And to do this, again, we are going to apply a function to all this. And so here I'm taking f again, because we're going to take another function, which, as you might have guessed, is going to be an activation function. With which one, as usual, it's going to be a rectifier activation function. And maybe you remember the name for that is ReLU. There we go. That's the one. And so we apply ReLU to our pooled convoluted images. That is all this. All right. And that's it. Three steps done. That was very quick. So remember, the way we have to look at this is first, we apply the convolution to our input images. Then we apply max pooling to our convoluted images obtained with the convolution. And then we activate the neurons in all this pooled convolutional layer with the rectifier activation function. So perfect. We get our first convolutional layer on which was applied max pooling and in which the neurons are now activated. And so basically what it does is that it propagates the signals from the first convolutional layer to the next one. And speaking of the next one, that's exactly what we're going to take care of right now. We are going to do the same thing as we just did on the first convolutional layer to the second convolutional layer to again propagate the signals further into the neural network by activating the neurons of the second convolutional layer. But before doing this, we need to get this convolutional layer. And so we are going to apply convolution 2 to x, that is now the first convolutional layer, where we are going to apply convolution 2 to x to obtain the second convolutional layer, after which we will be max pooling it, and then finally activating its neurons. So let's do this. It's actually very easy. We just need to copy that and pasting that below. Now, of course, we need to replace convolution 1 by convolution 2. And there we go. That's actually ready. See? Very easy. And so now with this line, we propagate the signals from the second convolutional layer to the next one, which is going to be the third convolutional layer. And to get this third convolutional layer, well, we need to apply that again. So I'm copying this, pasting that below, and replacing convolution 2 by convolution 3. And that's done. Isn't it so practical? We propagate the signals in the three convolutional layers in a flashlight thanks to this awesome structure. All right, so perfect. Now we have our signals propagated up to the third convolutional layer and after. And speaking of after, that leads us to what we're looking for, what we're interested in, that is the flattening layer. All right, so now that we have our third convolutional layer, that's the last X here, it's time to get our flattening layer. And so that's exactly what we're going to do now. We're going to flatten all the pixels of this third convolutional layer. That is, we're going to take all the pixels of all the channels of the third convolutional layer. We're going to put them one after the other in a huge vector. And of course, this huge vector is going to be nothing else than the flattening layer. And at the same time, we will use a trick to get the number of neurons in this flattening layer. That's exactly what we're looking for. That's the number of neurons we're missing. And therefore, let's directly return what we want. And in this return, we're going to flatten the third convolutional layer and get, at the same time, the number of neurons in this flattening layer. So we're going to take x, which is our third convolutional layer. We're going to take all the channels of this third convolutional layer, and we're going to use a function, which is the size function, to flatten all the pixels of all these channels in one same huge vector. And so the trick, you can find it in the PyTorch tutorial. Well, first we take the data of x, because x is a special structure, you know, it's a torch variable, so it has a pretty complex structure. But first, we need to access it with data here. Then we need to view what's inside of it. So we use this view function. And now we need to access what we're looking for. And that is given with the arguments 1 and minus 1. You don't have to understand what's inside the structure, but you can just understand that this is how we're going to get this number of neurons. And then to finish, we need to add size, then parenthesis, and inside we input 1. So basically what we do here, what we do is we take all the pixels of all the channels and we put them one after the other in this huge vector, which will be the input of the fully connected network. 
That's basically what this size one does. And with this, we can get this number of neurons that we're looking for. All right, so now we get what we want. And so finally, we can replace number neurons here by what is returned by this function when it is applied to the format of the DOOM images, that is 1 by 80 by 80. So what we have to do now is replace number neurons by we take the count neurons function, which we apply to the format of the DOOM images, which will be the tuple 1, 80, and 80. And there we go. And of course, we don't forget self because count neuron is actually a method of the CNN class. So we need to add the self. And now the warning should disappear. And there we go. Now everything is good. We get the architecture of the neural network with nothing missing. And we have this count neurons function in case, you know, you want to try some other architectures and you don't want to count this number of neurons manually. You just use this function, you apply it to the format of your images, and this will get you directly what you want, that is the number of neurons in the flattening layer, without having to do anything and whatever the architecture is. So that's pretty cool. And now we're done with the first big important step of this brain that we're making. And we have one last step, that is one last function to make, which is going to be the main forward function. So we're going to propagate the signals from the beginning of the brain, that is from the eyes of the AI, up to the output layer, that is after the second full connection. So we'll do that in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to the last step of our process to make the brain. We have one function to make left. This is the forward function that will propagate the signals in all the layers of the neural network including the three convolutional layers and the fully connected layer. And so this function is the forward function, exactly like for the self-driving car, except this time we have to propagate the signals in the convolutional layers before the fully connected layer. And the good news is we already did that in the previous step with the count neurons function. So we already have the code to propagate the signal in the convolutional layers. And so this will be very quick. We will just combine what we did here and what we did for the self-driving car and we'll get our forward function for our brain. So let's do this. We introduce a new function here, the last one for the brain. And this function is the forward function, which takes as argument, well, exactly like before, self, to refer to the object, and x, which will be first the input images, and then you know x will be updated as the signal is propagated into the neural network. All right, so Colin, and then let's go inside the function. So as I just said, we already made the code to propagate the signals in the three convolutional layers. That's exactly these three lines of code. So I'm copying them and pasting them here. And there we go. We already have our propagation of the signal in the three convolutional layers. And so now we just need to propagate the signal from the convolutional layers to the hidden layer and then eventually to the output layer that is at the very end of the neural network. And to do this, we first need to flatten the third convolutional layer that we obtained here. Remember, x at first is the input image, then here x becomes the first convolutional layer, then here x becomes the second convolutional layer, and then here x becomes the third convolutional layer. So right now at this stage, x is the third convolutional layer, and now to obtain the flattening layer, we need to flatten this third convolutional layer x. And to do this, we are going to do something quite similar as we did here. Only this time we don't need the number of neurons. We simply need to flatten the channels in the third convolutional layer. So this will be quite more simple, but very similar. And to do this, well, we're going to take x again, because x is going to become the flattening layer. So we're just updating x. So x equal, then we take x again, but this x is the old x, that is the third convolutional layer. So we take the third convolutional layer, then dot, then we take the view function to which we apply two arguments. The first one is x dot size zero. So again, we take the size function to you know take all the pixels of all the channels in the third convolutional layer, and we put them one after the other in this huge vector that is going to become this x here. 
and this X then will become the input of the fully connected network. But that's not all, we need to add here comma and minus one. So that trick, you can find it in the PyTorch tutorials. That's how you can flatten a convolutional layer composed of several channels by using the size function. And of course, if you want more details on how this works, you can go to the PyTorch tutorials. I will provide the link. So now that we got our flattening layer, well, you know, this flattening layer is going to become the input of a classic fully connected network with a simple linear transmission of the signal. And so now we're not going to use a convolution function to pass on the signal. We're going to use a linear transmission with the linear class. And then to break the linearity, because you know we're working with images and images have nonlinear relationships, well, we're going to use a rectifier function to be able to learn these nonlinear relationships. So let's do this. This is actually the next step. And so now that's exactly like what we did for the self-driving car. We take X because we want to update it again. We want to get the hidden layer now. And so first what we do is we take our full connection FC1 because the full connection FC1 is the one that connects the flattening layer to the hidden layer. And therefore we need to take FC1 and apply it to the X that we have right now, which is the flattening layer. And we don't forget the self, of course, because FC1 is a variable of our init function. So self.fc1x. And so that passes on linearly the signal from the flattening layer to the hidden layer. But now we need to activate these neurons while at the same time breaking the linearity. And that's exactly what we do with the rectifier activation function. So now what we have to do is take our functional module. And from this functional module, we take, of course, our rectifier function that is the ReLU, and we put self.fc1 inside the parenthesis. All right, so what happens in this line of code is that first we propagate the signals from the flattening layer to the hidden layer of the fully connected network, and then we activate the neurons of this hidden layer by breaking the linearity with this rectifier activation function, and we get our hidden layer that is x here. Perfect, and now we have one last step to do, it is, of course, to propagate the signal from the hidden layer to the output layer with the final output neurons. And to do this, well, that's very simple. That's exactly like what we did for the self-driving car. We take our second full connection, FC2, and we apply it to, of course, the neurons of the hidden layer that is right now X. So X here is the neurons of the hidden layer, this old X, and X here becomes of course, the output neurons of the output layer containing the Q values. And finally, we simply return the output neurons, that is, X, with the Q values. So perfect, congratulations, we just made a brain, we just made the brain of our AI with the eyes and the rest of the cells. So congratulations, now it's time to make the body, that is, defining how we're going to play the action. After all, the signals are processed in the brain. So that's our second big step. Let's do this in the next tutorials, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so we just made the brain, and now let's make the body. So as you understood, the body is the part where we define how the actions are gonna be played, like what happens for a real human body. You know, you have the brain that sends the signals to the body, and then your body plays the action. Well, here that's the same. We have our signals coming from the brain. We get the output signal with the forward function here. You know, first what happens is that we get the images. The images go into the eyes of the neural network, composed of the three convolutional layers. And then with the fully connected layers, we get the output signal from the brain, which contains the Q values. But then this output signal should be forwarded to the body and the body will play the action. And so that's exactly the part that we're going to take care of right now. We're going to implement the way the body will play the action. And the way it will do it, is with a softmax method, exactly like for the self-driving car. I insist that the softmax method is highly recommended for playing in action with the body of the AI, and therefore that's the one we're gonna go for. But as opposed to the self-driving car, we're gonna make a class, and this class will of course correspond to the body of the AI, and therefore let's start by introducing a class here that we're gonna call softmax body like this. I don't want to call it softmax only because softmax is a class of PyTorch from the NN module, so it's dangerous to call it this way. Therefore, I'm calling it 
softmax body and now it's very clear that our CNN convolutional neural network is the brain and softmax body is the body of the AI. So softmax body and let's inherit from the NN dot module. I don't think we're going to use it, but anyway, we can still inherit from it. You know, in case you want to improve the softmax body class and want to use some tools from the NN module, well, you will be able to do it with the NN module. But at this point, I don't think we will be using any of the NN module. So then colon and let's go inside the body. All right. So first, as usual, we're going to start with our init function to define the variables of the future body object, that is the bodies of the AI. And actually, as for a human body, a parameter that can define it is the temperature. And actually, that's going to be the only temperature. So it's a simple body, but still using this temperature parameter will do a lot for us. Okay, but before the temperature, let's not forget the self for the objects, for the bodies. And now we can input the temperature T, which is the same parameter as the one we use for the self driving car. Okay, and then colon, and let's define our variables. So, since we inherit from the nn.module, we're going to use the super function again. And so let's be efficient. Let's copy this and let's paste that right here. And of course, let's not forget to replace CNN here by soft max body. There you go. Now, I suppose that might become a reflex for you to use the super function at this stage. And then what we have to do is, of course, set our temperature variable with self dot t and that will be equal to the argument that will be input when creating an object of the softmax body class. I remind that whenever you create an object of the softmax body class, you have to input the arguments that are in the init function and therefore that is t. And then the variable of your object attached to your object self dot t will be equal to this t which is the argument that you will input. All right, and now that's it for the init function. That's actually all we need. So I guess we're ready to move on to the next function of the softmax body class. And this is going to be the last function. There are only two functions, the init function and the next one that we will implement in the next tutorial, which will be the forward function. And why forward? That's because right now we have to forward the output signal from the brain. That is, you know, the Q values contained in the output neurons of the output layer to the body which will play the action. So we are forwarding the output signal from the brain to the body that will play the action. Move forward, go left, go right, turn left, turn right, or shoot. All right, so let's do that in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. All right, so now we're going to make the forward function which will propagate the output signals of our brain to the body of the AI so that it will play the right action to reach the vest. But there is no right action yet because there is no training yet. We have not trained the AI yet, but this is exactly what we will do in part two, implementing deep convolutional Q learning, which by the way, I will rename training the AI with deep convolutional Q learning. But right now we need to forward the signal from the output layer of the brain to the body. And that's exactly what we're going to do with this forward function, which is the last function of our body. So let's do this. We start with def forward. And according to you, what argument is it going to take? Well, it's going to take, of course, first self. And then is there another one? Well, yes, there is. And what is it going to be? Well, very naturally, we want to forward the output signal of the brain to the body. And therefore, the input will be the output signal of the brain. And so now we need to give a name to these output signals. And so I'm going to add here the argument output. All right. So that corresponds to the output signals of the brain after the input images are propagated through all the brain to reach the output layer, which is X here, returned by the forward function of the brain. And now this output signal of the brain will be forwarded to the body with this new forward function that we make in the softmax body class. So let's do this. Let's add some column here. And now, as you understood, we're going to use a softmax method to play the action. That means that the body of our AI, after receiving the output signals of the brain, will play the actions with a softmax technique. 
So basically now what we have to do is exactly the same as what we did for the self-driving car. We're going to get our distribution of probabilities. That's the first step. And then we're going to sample an action according to this distribution of probabilities. So basically what we could do now is get our self-driving car file and copy paste what we implemented for the select action function in the self-driving car. But let's do it again. It will be good practice. And actually you can try to type it before me. Okay, so first what we're gonna do is get our probabilities. So I remind this is a distribution of probabilities for each of the Q values, which depend on the input image and each action. So we have one Q value for each of the six or seven possible actions. And therefore we get a distribution of seven probabilities. I'm saying seven because I think there are seven actions instead of six, because besides moving forward, left, right, or shooting, we can also run. So that makes seven possible actions. And therefore we get a distribution of seven probabilities, one for each Q value associated to each action. So props equals, and now remember what we have to do. Well, basically we have to use the softmax function from the functional module. So that's very simple. We take our functional module first, then dot, and then we take our softmax function. Here it is. We press enter. And now we input the arguments of the softmax function, which I remind are the elements for which you want to create a distribution of probabilities. And so that's, of course, the Q values, that is the outputs of the neural network. That's the outputs of the neural network for which you want to create a distribution of probabilities. And I remind that we want to create this distribution of probabilities to be able to explore the different actions instead of directly picking the one that has the maximum Q value. If we directly pick the one that has the maximum Q value, well, we don't explore much the other actions and we might miss something. But with this softmax method, we can do some more exploration and therefore maybe find some hidden solutions in the patterns that might be much better. So again, I highly recommend softmax and therefore now what we have to do is input the Q values, that is our outputs here, the outputs of our brain. So outputs, there we go. But then we have this temperature parameter that we can use, that we can configure to customize the exploration. Remember that the higher we set the temperature, the less exploration of the other actions we will do because the best action will be selected with a higher probability as opposed to the other actions which will be selected with lower probabilities. So that's exactly like with a self-driving car and therefore we have to multiply the outputs here by our temperature parameter, self.t. There we go. Perfect. Now we get a little warning because we haven't used props yet, but we're about to use it now. And so that brings us to the next thing we have to do. How are we going to use these probabilities? Well, we're going to sample the final action to play from this distribution of probabilities. And therefore, what we have to do now is use the multinomial function to sample the action according to this distribution of probabilities. So now we're ready to get our actions. So I'm creating a new variable here because that will become the actions that will be played by the body of our AI. And so now we take our distribution of probabilities, probs, to which we add dot and then the multinomial method. All right, and now we get our final actions to play. They're sampled from our props distribution. Okay, perfect. So now we are ready to return what we want, that is the actions to play. And these are, of course, actions. And now the warning should disappear. We use everything we want. There we go. Perfect. So now the forward function is ready. And congratulations, the body is also ready. So now we have our brain, we have our body, and therefore we're ready to assemble them to make the future AI. Our future AI will be composed of nothing else than a brain and a body. And so it will have intelligence and a body to play the actions which will be the right actions to play thanks to its intelligence. But remember, before we have to train its intelligence, and that's what we'll do in part two, training the AI with deep convolutional queue learning. All right, so let's make the AI in the next tutorials. It's again going to be a class of two functions, I think, and so this will require two or three tutorials. So I can't wait, this will be exciting, and until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this tutorial. So now that we have a brain and a body, we can make the AI. Of course, we're going to assemble them and you're going to see how now things are all going to make sense. 
You're going to understand why we had to make some classes, or more specifically, the purpose of making these classes, and mostly you're going to get the intuitive sense of how you can play with objects to create new objects, bigger objects. And as you understood, we already created two classes, the brain and the body. So then by creating some objects of these two classes, well, we can make a bigger object, which will be the AI. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. We are going to make the AI by assembling the two classes that we created, that is the brain and the body. So let's do this. It's going to become super intuitive now. I'm going to introduce a new class, which of course I'm going to call AI, because now we're ready to make the final AI. And right here, I'm going to start with the init function. And what is this init function going to take? It is right now that things will make a lot of sense. Well, first we get the inevitable self with the object, but then the two arguments are going to be nothing else than a brain and a body. That's the two elements that we need to build an AI. We need a brain, the neural network, and a body which will play the action with softmax. And so now, very simply, what we have to do is defining the variables of our AI object, because right now brain and body are just arguments. So let's do this. We have to make two variables, obviously. The first one is self.brain, which will be equal to the brain argument, but which later will be a brain object created from this CNN class. And then the second variable is self.body, which will be equal to the body argument right here, but which in the future will be, of course, an object of this softmax body class. And so now, as simple as that, thanks to this pretty awesome structure that we made here, we build an AI. Not trained yet, not intelligent yet, but still, we have a brain and a body. So that's perfect. And now, the only thing that we have to do left is make a big forward function that will do the whole propagation. You know, since now our AI is assembled, well, we're not going to use separately the two forward functions, you know, the one of the brain and the one of the body. We're going to make a big forward function, which will be our next function, which will take the images as input, then we'll propagate the signals in the brain. And for this, we will, of course, use the first forward function. And then once we get the output signals of the brain, we will forward these output signals into the body with the forward function here that will use a softmax technique. And then eventually we will return the actions to play. And it is just now that we can make this big forward function because we have assembled the brain and the body. And so we're not going to call this next function forward. We're going to use the call function, which is kind of like the init function, but that will call the two forward functions here from the brain and the body to propagate the signal from the very beginning with the input images to the very end with the action to play. And that's why the next function we will make now is this call function that will combine the two forward functions of the brain and the body. That's the only thing we have to do, and then we will have our AI ready. So let's make this final step in the next tutorial, and until then, enjoy AI! Hello and welcome to the very last step of this part one, building the AI. Now the only thing that we have to do left is to make this big forward function that will propagate the signal from the very beginning when the brain is getting the image to the very end when the AI plays the action. So we're going to make this whole function and that's going to be our last step before we move on to part two, training our AI with deep convolutional Q-learning. So let's do this. We are going to take the function call, which actually is similar to the init function. That is, it's an existing function, but this time we use it to call some other functions, the ones that we made before, because, you know, we're going to use the forward function from the brain and the forward function from the body. And so we're using this call function now to basically call these functions. So call is going to take two arguments. The first one is self, of course, the object, and a second argument, which, according to you, what is it going to be? Well, we are doing the whole propagation this time. So what we want to take as input is, of course, the input images, because, of course, that's the starting point when the AI is playing the game. It is first visualizing the images of the game, then propagates the signals in the brain, and then plays the action. Therefore, the second argument is going to be input, and now we are ready to make this whole propagation. So let's do this. Okay, so the first step, what is it? 
the first step is receiving the input images from the game. And since these images are going to enter the neural network, well, you can imagine that we have to format them in a special structure. And this structure is, of course, a torch structure. So the first thing that will happen is that we will convert these images into a NumPy array. Then we will convert the NumPy array into a torch tensor. And then finally, we will put the torch tensor inside a torch variable that will contain both the tensor and a gradient. That's for our dynamic graphs to compute very efficiently the gradients later for stochastic gradient descent. So that's our first step. And then once we get the right format of our images, well, they will be able to enter the neural network and then that's where we'll do the whole propagation of the signals. So let's do this first step, converting the image into the right format. So our images are so far input. So now we're going to create a new variable, which I'm calling input. So that's the real input of the neural network. And this input, what is it going to be? Well, first we need to take our input, that is our original images. Then, as we said, we want to convert these images into NumPy arrays. So to do this, we can simply take NumPy, which has a shortcut NP, then the function array. So we put input in the parentheses of the function array. There we go, now it is converted into some NumPy arrays. But then, since the cells of the NumPy arrays will contain the pixels, it is actually safer to specify the type float. It's better to make sure we have some floats right now. And to make sure of it, we can use np.float32 here. All right, so now we still have a NumPy arrays, but with the type float. All right, and that's also for another reason. It's that tensors are, by definition, arrays of a single type. And so we choose this single type to be a float, float32. All right, so now that we have our NumPy arrays, the next step is to convert that into a torch tensor. And to do this, we can use, for example, torch dot and then the from underscore NumPy function. So that will convert that into a torch tensor. There we go. And now the last step is to put these torch tensors into a torch variable containing both the tensor and the gradient. And you know how to do it. Of course, we take our variable class because actually everything that is inside this variable is actually the input of the variable class. But I wanted to show that to you this way because, you know, we start with our input images, then we convert them into NumPy arrays, then to torch tensors, and then to variable. And now we're good. They are allowed to enter the neural network that is first the eyes of the AI and then the fully connected layers to lead to the predictions. So speaking of the eyes of the AIs, that's exactly what we're going to do now. We're going to propagate these allowed images now into the eyes of the AIs, that is through the three convolutional layers. And to do this, you're going to see now how it's so simple. That's because we already have our brain and our body from the init function. We simply need to take our brain, so self.brain, and apply this brain to the input images. And that will propagate, thanks to the forward function here from the brain, that will propagate the signals inside the brain. And since the forward function of the brain returns the output signals, that is, the neurons of the output layer containing the Q values, well, this self.brain input here will return this output signal. And therefore, we're going to put here what it returns into a variable, and we're going to call it, very simply, output. And this output is the output signal of the brain. And now, now that we have the output signal of the brain, well, we have to propagate this output signal to the body. And to do this, we're going to use the second forward function from the body. And to do this, we simply need to take our body and apply it to, of course, the output. Because the forward function of the body takes as input the output signals of the brain. So that's exactly what the output is right now and returns the actions. And therefore, since it returns the actions, well, here we're going to add actions equals self.bodyoutput. All right, so now you can see that very simply, we propagated the signals inside the brain and then from the brain to the body. First, by using the forward function from the brain, which takes as input the input images and then propagate them into the brain to return the Q values. And then we propagate this output signal into the body with the forward function of our body to get the action to play. And so now 
the only remaining thing that we have to do, and that's the very last line of code of this part one, building the AI, well, we have to return the action to play, and that is actions. However, right now, the actions have the torch format, and we need to convert them back into NumPy array. And to do this, we're gonna take the data structure of these actions, and then add here the NumPy function, and there we go. Now we have the actions returned in the right format. So congratulations, we are now done with this first part one. We built the AI in three steps. First, we made the brain. Second, we made the body. And third, we assembled the brain and the body. And we propagated the whole signal from the eyes to the moment we play the action. So that's the first step done. That was a huge step. But now, as you understood, we built an AI, but it is still stupid. We need to train it to be intelligent. So we need to train it to do what we want it to do. And to do this, we're going to use the reward of the Doom environment, you know, because it's learning from the reward by being reinforced when it gets a good reward and by being punished or weakened when it's getting a bad reward. So that's where the Q learning will come into play. And so that's exactly what we'll do in this part two, training the AI with deep convolutional Q learning. I can't wait to start. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to part two, training the AI with deep convolutional Q learning. That's right, now that we built the AI with the architecture of the neural network, the body, the way the actions are played and everything, it's time to train this AI with deep convolutional Q-learning. So that's from now that we will implement, you know, experience replay, working with the Q values, working with the rewards, and there's even going to be a bonus which will improve a lot the training process, and that is called eligibility trace. Eligibility trace is a powerful technique which consists of accumulating the reward over several steps and the Q values are learned on this accumulation of rewards, as opposed to before where the Q values were learned after each transition, therefore after getting each reward. This time we will be learning the Q values after getting several rewards instead of just one reward. So instead of having one transition after the other and you know, updating the Q value each time, well, the Q values are gonna be updated every n steps because eligibility trace is rather called n steps eligibility trace and n is this number after which the q values are going to be updated and in our model here we're going to have n equals 10 so that means that will be a 10 steps eligibility trace and therefore we will update and learn the q values every 10 steps after accumulating the rewards on these 10 steps so that's a bonus that will make our model even more powerful and you will see that in the end we will get outstanding results I was really amazed when I saw the final results. I used to work on models that took a lot of time to execute. You know, the AI took a lot of time to train, but you will see that with this one, plus the neural network that we made, that is our brain and our body here with StuffMax, we will get a very powerful model and therefore a very powerful AI because you will see that it will ridiculize Doom. You'll understand what I'm talking about. So as you can see in this part two, we are starting by getting the Doom environment and I actually prepared the lines of code for you. We are just using the image preprocessing external file from our working directory folder. So basically the order is rather to first take this line of code, gem.make ppacket doom corridor v0. So doom corridor v0 is the name of the environment of the game we're playing. So first we import the environment with this gem.make. That's what you can find on the OpenAI gym tutorials. But then we use this preprocess image class, which is a class from image preprocessing, to preprocess the images that will come into the neural network. And we preprocess them so that they have a square format with the dimensions 80 by 80. And that, remember, is because in our neural network, well, we set our input images to have the dimensions 1 by 80 by 80. Remember, one is the number of channels, and so one means that we're working with black and white images. So that's the grayscale here. And 80 by 80 means that the dimensions of our input images will be 80 by 80. And that is what we set in the neural network, but of course then we need to specify this when inputting the images, which is exactly what we do here with this preprocess image class. And then after we import the environment with the right format of the input images, well, we import the whole game with the videos with this line of code. And remember, the cool thing about this is that 
In the end, we'll see the videos of our AI playing Doom. So we will see how it will kill the monsters, try to reach the vest and everything. So that will be super exciting. And remember that these videos will go into this videos folder. All right. And last line here, but I want to show it to you because that's important. That's now more related to the AI that we're building. Well, remember that our neural network takes as input number actions. That's because, you know, we want to make an AI that we can test easily on several environments, on several Doom environments. And since the different Doom environments have different number of actions, well, we specified this number actions variable as the input of the CNN, the brain. And therefore, now what we're going to do is get this number actions variable using the Doom environment that we just imported and created into this variable. And later, this number actions variable that we're about to create will be the input of the brain. So let's do this. I'm introducing this real now variable number actions. So number actions equals, now we're going to take our doom environment, that is the variable that we created. So doom environment, then we add here dot. And then, well, here we go. We take the first here action space. That's the set of your actions. I encourage you to have a look at the OpenAI tutorials to see how it works, you know, to understand how the OpenAI gym environments work. But basically, this is the set of actions. And from this set of actions, we can access the number of actions in the environment. And to do this, we add a dot here and n. n is the number of actions. And therefore, doom env dot action space dot n will return seven. It will return seven because there are seven actions. I know that we can see six actions in the doom environments on the OpenAI gym page, but I think we can also run. And so, you know, we can move forward, move left, move right, turn left, turn right, and shoot. And besides, we can run. So that makes seven actions. All right, and that's it for getting the Doom environment. We have the Doom environment. We have the number of actions. So we have so far everything that we need for our brain. We will then just create an object, a brain object, which we'll call CNN in minimal letters. And since the init function takes number of actions as argument, well, we will input the number of actions in the CNN object that we will create. And then, of course, we will create the body and eventually the AI. And that's why the next section, I'm going to call it building an AI, because now we can build as many AIs as we want. That's the awesome thing about object-oriented programming. We can build any AIs as we want. And so we're going to build our AI that has this sophisticated brain. And that's exactly what we'll do in the next tutorial. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this tutorial. All right, so now time to build our very first AI. Because right now we've only made the manual of instructions with the AI class, but we haven't created any object yet. And so we haven't a real actual AI yet. But we're about to get it right now because we're about to create one object of this AI class. And this object will be nothing else than an AI which will have a brain and a body. All right, so let's do this. It's actually very simple to do it now that we have defined everything with the classes. So basically what we need to do is first create a brain because as you can see, when we create an AI, we need to input a brain, but we also input a body. So we need to create a body as well. And then once we created a brain object and a body object, well, we will be able to create the AI. But no worries, we will build the brain and the body in a flashlight. And actually let's do it right now. Let's start with the brain. We're going to call the brain CNN because the brain is a convolutional neural network and it will be an object of the CNN class. So it makes sense to call it CNN. So CNN equals, and then we take our CNN class this time and we input in parentheses according to you. Well, at this point right now, when we create an object of a class, what we have to input is very simply the argument of the init function. And that's number actions. And thanks to what we did previously when getting the Doom environment, well, we already have this number actions and therefore we simply need to input number actions here into the CNN class. Perfect. So now we have the brain. Now let's make the body. We're going to create an object of the softmax body class and we're going to call this object softmax body. That will be the body of our AI. And this object is an object of the softmax max body class to which we have to input 
the only argument of the init function of the softmax body class, which is the temperature T, and therefore here we input T, but we have to specify a value because so far T is just an argument. So T equals, and we're going to start with 1. That's a small temperature, but this might work very well. And actually, I already know this will work very well. So, but you can try with other temperatures. You know how it works now. Your actions will be more sure of themselves. That is, the action with the highest Q value will have a higher probability to be selected as opposed to the other actions, which will have lower probabilities to be selected and therefore there will be less explored. But anyway, we can start with one. This will get us a good body. All right, so now we have a brain, we have a body, so I guess it's time to make the final AI, eventually. So now you're going to see how things are going to become so simple. It's when the intuition reaches its peak. To make an AI, we simply need to create an object that we call, of course, AI from our AI class. And since an AI is composed of a brain and a body, we input the brain, which is our convolutional neural network, but the object, and a body, which is nothing else than the softmax body object from the softmax body class. And see, we built an AI in a flashlight by just inputting a brain and the body, and now we have an AI ready to be trained. So now it's time to launch the whole deep convolutional key learning process with experience replay, that bonus of eligibility trace on 10 steps, and eventually, once we have all this, we will train the AI to make it smart. So can't wait to do this. The next section is gonna be about setting up experience replay. So we're not going to implement it all over again like for the self-driving car, because the good news is that we already have it implemented. So that will be fast. We will just create an object of the replay memory class that is in this experience replay file. So that will help us a lot. And therefore we will move on quickly to what's new and most important, that is the training. So let's attack this in the next tutorials. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this tutorial. All right, so now we have our AI. It is ready to be trained. And the first step of the training is to set up experience replay. So we're slowly getting there, the training, and the good news is that we have an implemented version of experience replay, besides that is adapted to eligibility trace, which I remind is a technique that instead of learning the Q values, every transition learns it every 10 transitions. So basically that's exactly the same as before, but instead of having a single target, a single reward for each step, we're gonna have a cumulative target on 10 steps and a cumulative reward on 10 steps, and we will learn on the 10 steps each time. So we are learning on 10 transitions, 10 steps, instead of one like before. And with this, our AI will work wonders. And that will make some wonders for the training process. You know, the training will take much less time, thanks to this technique, but we have to specify in experience replay that we are learning every 10 steps. So that's why this experience replay is not a classic implementation of experience replay, like the one for the self-driving car, it is an experience replay implementation taking into account this 10 steps learning. And therefore you will find in this experience replay file two classes. One class that makes your AI progress during 10 steps so that it can sum the rewards observed on these 10 steps. That's the first class. And we need this class because we need to include these 10 steps in the replay memory class, which is the class we implement for experience replay. And that's how we make sure that the memory also takes into account the fact that we're learning on 10 steps. So that's why you will find two classes in this implementation of experience replay, but that's only to take into account that we're learning on 10 steps and that must be taken into account also in the memory. So speaking of our memory, let's create it. We're gonna call our memory memory. And so memory is going to be an object of the replay memory class. And the replay memory class is a class of this experience replay py file. And so I'm taking first this file, experience replay, then dot, and that's where I take the replay memory class. Perfect. And now, as you can see, we have to input two arguments. The first argument is n steps, which corresponds exactly to the number of steps on which we're going to learn the Q values. So, you know, the number of steps on which we accumulate the target and the reward. So we're going to have a cumulative target and the cumulative reward. And then the second argument is the capacity, that is the size of the memory. So for example, here we can see 10,000. 
So if the capacity is equal to 10,000, that means that the memory will have a size of 10,000. And therefore, that means that we will get a memory up to 10,000 last steps performed by the AI. But again, we're not going to learn every transition. We're going to learn every 10 steps among these last 10,000 steps of the memory. And that's exactly this new feature that we introduced here compared to before. Before, we only had this replay memory trick. And here we have this replay memory trick plus this trick of learning every 10 steps. And we're going to learn every 10 steps and we're going to do it in the memory composed of the last 10,000 steps. And this, that is experience replay combined to an eligibility trace with 10 steps, will considerably improve the training performance. So let's input these two arguments. The first one is n steps, and that will be equal to, well, for now, let's say n steps. We will specify what n step is right after that. It will actually be an object of the other class of this experience replay file, which is the n step progress class, and that allows to make the AI progress during 10 steps. And remember, during the 10 steps, we will sum the rewards on the 10 steps to get the cumulative rewards over 10 steps. And that is exactly eligibility trace. So now what we have to do is create this n steps here. And we create it with the second class that we have in this experience replay file, which is n step progress. So now we're going to create n steps like this. And this will be an object of the n step progress class that we take again from our experience replay file. There we go. So that's the n step progress class. And now we have to input three arguments. As you can see, we have to input the environment, which is the Doom environment here that we imported. Then the second argument is our AI. And this will be, of course, the AI that we built right here in the previous section. And the last argument is n step. And this, that's where we'll specify that we want 10 steps, you know, to learn every 10 steps, that is every 10 transitions. So let's input these arguments. The first one is the environment, and that's doom env. All right. Then the second one is our AI, and that we called it AI. That's the one here. So this is just the name of the argument of the n step progress class. And this AI here is our AI, the one that we built. And then the last argument is n step, and that is equal to 10. All right. So right now we're just taking into account in the memory that there is a learning on 10 steps, and this learning on 10 steps is called eligibility trace. So we're really working on the advanced stuff here, but remember that's because we're trying to beat Doom. That's nothing like making a piece of cake. So we need these advanced techniques to make it work. So now we're almost ready before moving on to the next step, which will be actually about implementing eligibility trace. The only thing that we have to include is the capacity, of course, and that is, let's say, 10,000. The memory will have a size of 10,000, meaning that the memory will contain the last 10,000 steps performed by the AI. And that will allow us to generate some mini batches, as you remember, with a sample function. You know, the memory contains 10,000 transitions, but to train the AI, we're going to sample some mini batches of 10 transitions, not one compared to before, 10 transitions this time, and we will sample these mini batches of 10 transitions in the memory composed of the 10,000 last steps. All right, so now I guess we're ready to move on to the next step, which is about implementing eligibility trace. So we're going to have some adventure here. This will not be a simple implementation, so have a good break. And when you're ready, we can attack this. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this tutorial. This special tutorial is going to be super exciting because we are getting closer to the A3C algorithm. You're going to see that what we're about to implement, and that is called Eligibility Trace, or SARSA, is actually an algorithm of the asynchronous actor critics agents algorithms, but we cannot consider it an A3C because we're still going to have one agent. But still, you're going to see that what we're about to implement is actually taken from the following paper, which is this paper, Asynchronous Methods for Deep Reinforcement Learning. And it is in this paper that we'll find the A3C algorithms that we will implement as the final bonus of this course. But as I said, we're getting closer to it because the model that we will implement right now is actually this one, the Asynchronous and Step Q Learning. That's the one. 
So that's almost the A3C, which is the one after that, but with one agent. And the powerful thing about this is this end step queue learning. We're going to learn the cumulative rewards and learn the cumulative targets on end steps instead of one step like previously. And that's what will make the training much more performant and therefore our AI much more powerful. So we actually have the pseudo code for this algorithm. It's this algorithm S2 right here. So let's click on it. And there we go. That's the algorithm we're about to implement. But remember with only one agent. The difference is that here they take an action AT according to the epsilon greedy policy based on the Q values for the current state and the action played. But in our case, we didn't implement an epsilon greedy policy. We implemented a softmax, but the rest is the same. As you can see, we're going to compute the cumulative rewards on n steps, actually 10 steps. Remember that n steps is equal to 10. And so we will implement this line of code in our algorithm that we're about to implement right now. We're going to get this and mostly we're going to implement this as well. You'll see that we will get the maximum of the Q values for the current state and the current action. And this theta here is just a target parameter. So let's do this. Let's attack this algorithm. This one is called the asynchronous and step Q learning, but we don't have the right to say asynchronous as far as we're concerned because we only have one agent, but therefore we can call it n step Q learning eligibility trace or even sorsa all right so let's do this it's going to be pretty fun we can basically follow the pseudo code here and that's what we're going to do and so as you can see a parameter that we'll need is a gamma the gamma parameter that is the dk parameter and therefore we will start by introducing a variable for this gamma parameter and choosing a value so let's do this we actually don't need a class to implement this we can simply implement this with a function because you know, we don't really need to create objects for this eligibility trace model. A function will be enough because basically what we want to do is to return the inputs and the targets so that later when training the AI, we are ready to minimize the distance between the predictions and the target. And to get the predictions, we need the inputs because we're going to apply our brain on the input to get the output signals. That will be our predictions. And then once we have our predictions and our targets, we will be ready to train the AI by trying to minimize the square distance between the predictions and the targets. So that's the whole point of doing this right now. We are implementing this function to be able to return these inputs and these targets so that we can be ready for the training to minimize the square distance predictions minus targets. All right, so let's do this. As we said, we want to implement a function. So we start with def. This function, we're going to call it eligibility underscore trace. You can also call it sarsa. You can also call it and step coloring, whatever you want, but let's call it eligibility trace. And this function is going to take one argument, which is going to be a batch. And why a batch? It's because we're going to get some inputs and some targets because we're going to train the AI on batches. And so the inputs and the targets will go inside some batches. And therefore the input argument here is this batch that will contain several inputs and then several targets that we will compute. So there we go. That's the only argument we need. Now let's go inside the function and let's define what we need it to do. So as we saw in the pseudocode of the paper, we need a gamma parameter. So as we said, we start by introducing this gamma parameter. So gamma equals, and we can already decide for value and we're going to choose 0.99. That's a classic good value for the gamma and no worries. I checked that this is a good value for our AI. All right, then next step, next step is to prepare our inputs and our targets, because that's exactly what we want to return. We want to return the inputs and the targets to prepare the training. And so we can already initialize them with an empty list, because of course, in these inputs inside the batch, we're going to have several inputs all into a list. And that's why I'm initializing the inputs as a list as well as the targets. There we go. So we initialized our inputs and our targets. And in the end, this eligibility trace function will return exactly these inputs and these targets were of course filled in. We will have several inputs and the associated several targets in what will be returned by the function. All right, next step. Next step is to start a for loop. And that's exactly because we're following the pseudocode of the paper, this pseudocode. And as you can see, 
there is this repeat code section and repeat is exactly a for loop and so the code we're going to compute the cumulative reward right here accumulated over the 10 steps and how is it computed well in each step that is not the last step we're going to get the maximum of the q values of the current state we're in during this n steps run and if we reach the last state of the 10 steps well this will be equal to zero that is we don't want to update it anymore and then we have this for loop which is going to be another for loop they don't say repeat here but that's the same it's going to be a second for loop in our algorithm well we will update the reward this way by multiplying it by the decay parameter gamma and adding the reward so let's do this let's go back to python and let's start our for loop so for and what is going to be the iterative variable well that's going to be our 10 step series you know our series of 10 transitions so we're going to call this variable series so that represents a series of 10 transitions like a sequence of 10 transitions so for series in and then what do you think well our series will belong to our batch that is the batches on which we will train the ai and so for series in batch that is for all the series of 10 transitions in our input batch well what are we going to do well to get the cumulative reward you will see in the pseudo code that we need the state of the first transition of the series and also the state of the last transition of the series so what we have to do right now is get these input states and so we're going to put these two input states into a variable that we're going to call input and we will get these two input states the first one of the series and the last one that we're going to put into a numpy array but no worries we will not stay with this numpy array we will of course convert that into a torch variable but the first step is to put these two input states the first one and the last one into a numpy array and so right here in this numpy array we add the first input which is the input state of the first transition of the series and that is series and then to take the first transition we take the index 0 of the series that's the first transition and then we can access it by taking its attribute which is state and that's because in our experience replay file we defined a special structure for each of the transition and you know this structure each transition is composed of a state an action a reward but then a last element which is done so this special structure that we're allowed to use right now comes from the way we defined a transition in experience replay all right so with this we get the input state of the first transition and now let's get also the input state of the last transition of the series and to do this that's the same we can just copy this and paste it and replace the zero here by the last index of the series which we can access with this trick minus one series minus one dot state will get the input state of the last transition of the series all right then we need to put these two elements inside some square brackets because that's what is expected by the numpy array function and then an important thing to do since we are going to convert that into a torch tensor in a torch variable well remember a torch tensor is by definition a special array containing one single type and so we need to force having one single type and as usual we're going to choose the float type and so i'm adding this parameter here d type equals np dot float 32 you can take this one and now we can convert that into a torch tensor in a torch variable so let's do this to do this well first let's convert that into a torch tensor and remember we can use torch dot from numpy there we go and we put all the array of the two input states inside this torch tensor with the torch from numpy function perfect so that will convert this arrays of the two input states into a torch tensor and now we put this torch tensor into a torch variable using the variable class so input will be an object of the variable class and in fact as you understood this variable class takes all this as an argument and that creates the object all right so now we should be good we have our two inputs that we need that is the input state of the first transition and the input state of the last transition and now now that we have the input well what can we get we can get the output signal of the brain of the ai 
that is the prediction. But we're going to call it output. That's the output signal. And to get the output, well, now that's very easy because we already have a brain created, which is our convolutional neural network. And so we can simply take our brain, CNN, applied to the input, which will return the prediction, that is the output. As simple as that. And now we are already ready to move on to the next step. And the next step is to start to compute this cumulative reward. So now we're going to do exactly the same as our S2 algorithm, the SARSA, or should we call it n step skew learning. We are going to introduce the cumul reward variable, which will be the cumulative reward. And let's go back to the paper. As you can see right now, what we have to do to get this cumulative reward, which is R here, well, at each step of the 10 steps run, we need to update it by adding a zero to this cumulative reward if we reached the last state of the series or the maximum of the Q values if we haven't reached the last state of the series. That is for all the steps except the last step. So let's simply implement this. So let's go back to Python. So this cumulative reward, as we just saw, is going to be equal to 0, 0.0 if we reached the last state and we can write this condition this way if series of index minus one that is the last transition of the series then we add dot done because done actually is an attribute of you know this transition structure that we defined in experience replay our experience replay file and this done comes from actually the open ai structures because if we go to the open ai gym website which is actually right here i prepared it so that's the doom corridor v0 and if we go to documentation and then if we so that's the tutorial i really encourage you to have a look at it you can run an environment but mostly you can see that our observations that is our transitions are defined by an observation a reward and this done here and this done means exactly that a transition or a step is over and so we're going to use this done here for our if condition therefore if series minus one dot done means if the last transition of the series is over, is completed. And so this cumulative reward is going to be equal to zero if the last transition of the series is done. And else, if we haven't reached the last transition, well, cumulative reward is going to be updated with, as we said, the maximum of the Q values. And since this output here is the output of the brain, that is the predictions of the neural network, and as you know, the predictions of the neural network are the predicted Q values. Well, this output contains the Q values. And since we need to take the max of the Q values, well, we need to add first this index because the structure contains the Q values in the index one. And then we need to add data to access the data of this output structure. You know, it has the special structure of a torch variable. So with this, we get our Q values. And now we want to take the maximum of our Q values and so simply we add dot max. And now we get exactly what we want as in the paper. This maximum of the Q values for the non-terminal state ST. Perfect. And so now what we're going to do is make this second for loop. That is for the 10 steps of the series, we are going to update the cumulative reward this way by multiplying first by gamma, the decay parameter, which we already have, and then adding the reward. So let's do this. We're actually going to do exactly the same as in the pseudocode. As you can notice, they start from the right. So they're not starting with the first step and going to the last steps. They start with the last step, t minus one, up to the first step, t start. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. And that's because we wanna get, in the end, the cumulative reward being equal to r equals r0 plus gamma r1 plus gamma squared r2 plus dot 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 plus gamma at the power of 10, R10, where R1, R2, dot 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 R10 are the rewards obtained in each of the end steps of the series. So let's take a quick break before attacking this second for loop and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. So let's do this. Let's make this for loop starting from the right and going to the left. And to do this, we're gonna add four so this time the iterative variable is going to be our step because we're going to go from the last step to the first step of the series of transitions. 
And so fourth step, and now the trick to go from the right to the left, is to use for step in reversed. Reversed. And now we just need to input a sequence. And this sequence is going to be, of course, our series. So we input our series. But as you can see in the paper, we go from t minus 1 to t start. So we don't go from the last, last step, that is the terminal state, but the state before that, that is t minus 1, but to t start, that is the first step. And so here, to go from not the last state, but the state before, we need to add in brackets column minus 1. I'm sure that for those of you who followed the machine learning and the deep learning course, you know this trick. Column minus 1 means that you're going up to the element before the last element, but not up to the last element. And therefore, we get the sequence we want. That is, we're going to go from the element before the last element up to the first element. And that we do thanks to reversed, to go from the right to the left. All right, so we are ready to enter the for loop. And so inside this for loop, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do exactly as in the paper. We're going to update the cumulative reward by multiplying it by gamma and adding the reward obtained in the current step, that is, in the step of the for loop. All right, so let's do this. Going back to Python. And so we want to update our cumulative reward the following way by first multiplying it by gamma. There we go. Here we multiply it by gamma. And then we want to add the reward of the step, which we can access this way with this special structure. Remember that reward is an attribute of the step object. And so here, of course, we add a plus. All right, so cumulative reward equals the reward of the step we are in right now, the loop, plus gamma times the previous cumulative reward before it is updated. Perfect. So now I think we're good. We're following thoroughly the algorithm. And now time for the next steps. Well, now it's going to become pretty easy. We go back to the first for loop because this for loop is just to compute the cumulative rewards you know, going from the right to the left by updating this way, following the algorithm. And now, as you remember, the goal of doing all this is to get our inputs ready and our targets ready so that we can minimize the square difference between the two for the training. And so right now, the only thing that we have to do left is get these inputs and targets ready. So let's do this. First, what we need to do is add the first state of the series in our inputs list. So far, this input state is in this input variable, but that was just to compute the output. So we're going to get this input state of the first step separately, because that's exactly what we need to append in our inputs list. So let's get this separately. Therefore, we're going to call it state. And so exactly the same as here, we can get it this way by taking the first index of the series, which contains the first transition, and then adding dot state to get the state of this first transition. So that's the state we need. Then same, we're going to get separately the target associated to this input state of the first transition. And so I'm introducing a new variable here, target, which will be equal to the Q value of the first step. And since the Q value is returned by the neural network, it is contained in output. And since output is the output associated to this input, which contains the first element of the transition, well, we can get this Q value of the first state by just taking output here and taking the index zero. And then we add dot data. That will simply get us the Q value of the input state of the first transition. And that is exactly the target Q value. So that's why we're taking it. Then we are going to update this target variable, but only for the action that was selected in the first step of the series. And to access this first step of the series, well, we need to take first series zero, because this is exactly the first step of the series, series zero. And to access the action corresponding to this first step of the series, well, we need to add here dot action. Again, that is this attribute structure that we're using. You know, action is an attribute of the first step of the series, that is the first transition of the series, because each transition of the series has the following structure, state, action, reward, and done. So action here, this attribute action here, means that we're simply getting the action of this first state. And so the target for that specific action of the first step 
is exactly what needs to be updated by the cumulative reward. So basically here we're just going to write that the target associated to the action that was played in the first step of the series is this cumulative reward that we just computed. All right, and now we're finally ready to update our input by appending this first input state here and this first target here for the first step. We only need to update the first step of the series because you know we train the AI on 10 steps and therefore the input is the first step of the 10 steps and also we get the target in this first step. But then we don't need to get any inputs or any targets in the following steps of the 10 steps because basically the learning happens 10 steps afterwards. So that's why right now we're only getting the state and the target of the first step of the series. So it's important to understand that and therefore if we understand that then now we understand that we have to input them in our list of inputs and our list of targets. So let's do this. First let's append the states to our inputs. So we take our inputs list and we use the append function to add the state which remember is the input state of the first step of the series and then we are going to append the target of the first step to our list of targets and to do this we take our list of targets and same we use the append function to append this first target. There we go, almost done and now we need to return the last things which are of course what we need, that's what we said at the beginning of this tutorial, the inputs and the targets that are now updated. So we're going to add here return, then we're going to get our inputs first but then that's the same, we need to convert them into a NumPy array first, then do a type conversion to make sure we have a single type with dtype equals np.float32, the same, and then we convert this into a torch tensor because of course we're working with PyTorch, so that's totally compulsory. And so I'm using the torch from NumPy function again and that gives us our inputs. Perfect, and now let's do the same for the targets. Now we're gonna use this trick, which is quicker. We're gonna stack the targets together, and to do this, we need to take first our torch library, because we're gonna use the stack function by torch to stack the targets. All right, and so this line of code basically returns the inputs and the targets that were just updated through this eligibility trace SARSA algorithm or we can call it n-step q-learning. And so now, congratulations, we are ready to do the final training because basically the training consists of minimizing the squared differences between the predictions of our inputs and the targets. So let's get our AI smart. It will become smart in the next tutorial. And so until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to this Python tutorial. So now that we are ready to train the network to minimize the squared distance between the outputs and the target, thanks to what we did with eligibility trace in the previous section, well, basically, we're ready to start the whole training by, you know, getting our inputs, our targets, our predictions, then computing the loss error between the predictions and the target, and then doing the backward propagation with stochastic gradient descent to update the weights. So we're ready to do all this, but since we want to compute the moving average on 100 steps, you know, to keep track of the average during the training, well, just before we do this whole training, we are going to make a class right now that will get this moving average on 100 steps. So no worries, we will do it quickly. We will make a class with three functions, but we will do all this in this single tutorial. So we'll do it quickly. We already did it. And besides, we want to focus on the training right now because that's the most important. So let's make this class right now in this single tutorial. All right, so we are going to introduce a new class, which we're going to call MA for moving average. And then here we go with our first function. So that's, of course, the init function that never changes init. And this init function is going to take two arguments. The first one is self for the moving average future object and size, which will correspond to the size of the list of the rewards of which we're going to compute the average. So this is going to be 100. All right, so we have our arguments for the init function. And now let's go inside the function. Now you know what to do. We have to initialize the variables specific to the object. And these are, well, first, the first one is going to be 
a list of rewards. So that's going to be the list containing the 100 rewards of which we're going to compute the average. So here right now we're just simply initializing this list with this empty list here. So list of rewards and then the second variable of our future object is going to be of course the size. And the size is going to be equal to the arguments we will input when creating the future moving average objects. So size here and already we are ready to move on to the next function which is going to be the add function and that will add the cumulative rewards. Be careful it's not the simple reward it's the cumulative reward and that's because you know we are doing eligibility trace and therefore learning every 10 steps and therefore learning with cumulative rewards and not a simple reward. So this add function that we're about to make will add the cumulative reward to that list of rewards. So def, we're going to call it add, of course, and this add function is going to take two arguments. The first one is self, because we're going to use this list of rewards here, because simply we're going to append the cumulative rewards to this list of rewards. So we need this self to be able to get this. So self and the second one is going to be the rewards, which will represent the cumulative rewards. All right, so that's our two arguments of the add function. So now let's go inside the function and let's define what it has to do. Okay, so very simply, the first thing it has to do is whenever we get a cumulative reward, a new one, you know, when we progress on 10 new steps, well, what we have to do is add this cumulative rewards to the list. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to write a line of code that will add this new cumulative reward that we're getting after progressing on 10 steps to this list of rewards here. And to do this, we have to separate two conditions because since we will be working with batches, well, the rewards will be in some lists, but in some other cases, the rewards can also be as a single element. And the syntax to add an element to a list, which is the list of rewards here, is not the same whether you're adding a list or a single element. So we just have to make this condition that will separate these two cases. And let's start with the first case, which is the case when what we're adding to this list of rewards is a list. And to do this, we're going to add is instance. And in parentheses, we input two arguments. The first one is our rewards that we're adding. So rewards. And the second one is list. And so if is instance rewards list means if the rewards are into a list. And so if the rewards are into a list, what we do is very simply self dot we take our list of rewards and we are going to add this list. Because since this is a list, what we can do is use a simple addition operation because we can sum two lists together. The rewards here is a list because this will be equal to true. I mean, if we're in this case, and so we can simply sum this list to our list of rewards. And therefore, we can simply add here list of rewards plus equals rewards. And by doing this, we're just extending the list by summing these two lists together. All right, and then second condition, so we can simply add else. So that's if the rewards is not a list and therefore if it's a single element. And so else, what happens in that case? Well, that's the same. We want to add the reward to our list of rewards, but we cannot use this syntax because rewards will no longer be a list. It will be a single element. And so what we need to use is another syntax, which is the append function. When you want to add a single element to a list, you cannot sum the two. You have to use the append function. And so this is exactly what we're going to do now. We are going to take our list of rewards of the object and paste that here and then add dot append there we go first one and of course in parenthesis we input the element we want to append and this is of course rewards but rewards in that case will not be a list it will be a single element like a single cumulative reward not into a list all right and then we want to do this but now we have to add something more it's what does happen when this list of rewards gets more than 100 elements. Well, in that case, what we have to do is delete the first element of this list of rewards 
to make sure that this list of rewards always contains no more than 100 elements. So exactly like what we did for the self-driving car when making the score window. And so to make sure of this, we're going to add a while condition specifying that whenever the length of our list of rewards, that is the number of elements in our list of rewards, whenever this number is larger than self.size, that is the size that we set here and which later will be equal to 100 when we create the object, well, as soon as the number of elements of this list of rewards is larger than 100, well, what we want to do is delete the first element of our list of rewards, which we can get by taking the index 0, that is the first index, of our list of rewards. This is the first element of our list of rewards, and we want to delete it whenever our list of rewards contains more than 100 elements. So that, with this, with this condition here, we make sure that our list of rewards never contains more than 100 elements. And therefore, now what we can do is make a new function to compute the average of our list of rewards, which will contain on the run 100 elements. And therefore, we will compute the moving average on 100 steps each time. So let's make this new function. It's going to be very easy because there is the mean function in Python, which is a function from NumPy, to compute the average of a list. And so let's introduce our last function here, which we're going to call average. And this function is going to take one argument, which is going to be self, because we're going to use, of course, still our list of rewards, which is a variable of our objects. So self and colon. And now let's compute the average. And so directly we will return the average because we can get it with the mean function to which, of course, we are applying, well, what we want to compute the mean of, that is our list of rewards. I think I still copied it. Yes, there we go. So we simply return the mean of our list of rewards. And the mean, as I said, is a function by NumPy. So here I'm adding the shortcut np dot mean self list of rewards. And there we go. We have our average on 100 steps. Perfect. So we made that class very efficiently. Now we get the instructions on how to obtain a moving average on 100 steps. And since we're going to use one moving average object when doing the training, well, let's already create this moving average object. And so we're going to call it MA. And simply MA is going to be an object of the MA class. And as we said, we want the size to be 100 because we want to compute the moving average on 100 steps. So perfect. There we go. We are now ready to train our AI to finally be intelligent. It's about time. It is from this point that our AI will become smart. So I can't wait to train it. It's going to be quite easy because this is something we already did. But this is going to be fun. And besides, after that, it will be time to have even more fun because basically our AI will be fully ready that is built and also intelligent. And therefore we will execute the code and then our AI will play Doom. And eventually we will watch the videos of our AI playing Doom and we will see if it manages to reach the vest. So I can't wait. Let's do that training. And until then, enjoy AI. Hello and welcome to the super exciting part of our AI creation, the part where we make it smart. So that's exactly what happens when training the AI. We will train its intelligence to reach the goal we want it to accomplish. And to do this, we're going to basically train the neural network to output the right predictions. And then everything is already ready because these output signals from the brain already have the right transmission to the body to play the final actions. So basically, now what we're about to do is something we already did before. We are just going to take some random batches from the memory get our inputs from these samples, get the outputs, get the targets, get the predictions, compute the loss error between the predictions and the targets, and then perform backward propagation with stochastic gradient descent to update the weights according to how much they contributed to this loss error. So let's do all this. You're going to see how it's going to be so easy because we already have all the tools to implement this. Not only we have the PyTorch tools like the optimizer and the loss functions, but also we have all the classes that we made before, like our brain, of course, which we're going to use to get the predictions, then our 
experience replay implementation, eligibility trace, and all these tools combined to the PyTorch tools will make the training super performant. And therefore, eventually, we will get a super powerful AI. So let's make this training happen. Let's make our AI smart. And the first thing we're going to do now is get the loss function that we'll use during the training when computing the error and an optimizer. That's the first thing we'll do. So let's create a variable for the loss function. We're going to call it loss. And this will be equal to the MSC loss function from the NN module nn.msclos. That's the loss function we'll use because basically our predictions are Q values. You know, we're predicting the Q values of the different actions. And therefore, since these are real numbers, well, we're kind of doing some neural network for regression. And therefore, the loss function is the mean squared error. That's the loss function we use in general for regression. All right. So now that we have our loss function, let's get our optimizer. So optimizer here, that's the variable we create for it optimizer and we're going to take as usual as for the self-driving car the atom optimizer that's a very powerful optimizer that will work wonders for the training so let's get this one optim dot atom and remember that's exactly for the self-driving car we have to input two essential arguments the first one is the one that will make the connection between the optimizer and the parameters of our neural network that is the weights of the neurons of our brain. And to do this, we take our brain, which we called CNN. That's the object we created for our brain. And so CNN dot, remember, parameters. There we go. And some parentheses. So that makes the connection between the optimizer and the weights of the neurons in the brain of our AI. And then the second argument is a learning rate. And that's given by LR. And so here we have to take a small learning rate because we don't want to converge too fast and we want to have some exploration. And therefore, a good learning rate that we can take here is a small one that is 0.001. That is 0.1%. I think that's the same we used for the self-driving car. All right, so now we have a loss function, an optimizer. So we are almost ready to start the for loop. Well, actually, we will start the for loop right now. But just before we do it, we're going to decide the size of the number of epochs we will be training the AI. And therefore, I'm creating a new variable here, which will correspond to this number of epochs. And let's set it equal to 100. That will be way enough to train the AI. And I even bet that the AI will manage to reach the vest way before 100, like 20 or 30. Let's see. But for now, let's take 100. And if we need it, we will increase it but I don't think that will be necessary. Okay, so now that we have our number of epochs, we can start to make the for loop, you know, this main for loop of the training when we train over the epochs. So for, then the iterative variable is going to be epoch, that's what we choose. For epoch in, now of course we're gonna use the range function to say that we want to go from the first epoch, one, to number of epochs, plus one, because remember, the upper bound of a range is not included. And therefore, if we want to go up to 100, well, we have to specify NB epochs plus one to go up to 100. All right, so colon, and now let's get into the loop. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is to do 200 runs of 10 steps. So each epoch will be 200 runs, one after the other of 10 steps. And to do this, we have this run steps function from our experience replay class and therefore to use this function which is actually a method because we will get it from our memory object which is an object from the replay memory class to generate these 200 runs of 10 steps well we have to take our memory object that i remind we created right here memory is an object of the replay memory class with n steps that is 10 steps and a capacity of 10,000. we created this object and from this object, we take, well, this run steps function. Run steps, and we specify 200 successive runs of 10 steps. So that will just, at each epoch, basically run 200 steps. And now, now that we have these 200 steps running at each epoch, well, it's time to sample some batches from these runs. 
And to sample these batches, we have another function from our memory, which is sample batch, and that will exactly generate some batches from these 200 runs. But remember, these batches are this time batches of series of transitions, that is series of 10 steps, as opposed to before where the batches were just some batches of single transitions. Here this time, there are gonna be batches of 10 steps, 10 transitions. And therefore now it's time to get from our memory these random batches, and to get them we use the simple batch function to which we have to apply the batch size. And for the batch size, well, we can take 32, or even 64, or even 128. Remember for batch sizes, it's a common practice to use 32. That's what you will see in general in the neural networks architectures when doing some batch learning. But this time it's quite different. We're just sampling some batches of 10 steps. So it's better to take batches with larger sizes. So that's why we can take 64 or 128. So we're gonna take 128. And actually this is gonna be inside a for loop because we want to take several batches and we're taking them in what is returned by this sample batch function. So this for loop for batch in memory sample batch 128 means that every 128 steps, well, our memory will give us a batch of size 128, which will contain actually the last 128 steps that were just run. We're just getting some batches of size 128 and the learning is going to happen on these batches. And besides, inside these batches, we will have eligibility trace running, you know, to learn every 10 steps. All right, so now inside this loop, which is still happening in one epoch, but now this time we are in a specific batch. And so now the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get our inputs and our targets separately. And that, as I told you, is very easy. We can do it with one of the tools we implemented, which is eligibility trace. As you can see here, this eligibility trace function takes a batch as input, and now we have the batch, and returns as output the inputs and the targets. So right now what we can simply do is create two new variables, which are gonna be the inputs and the targets, and do this. Input, comma, targets, equals exactly what returns this eligibility trace function applied to a batch. So we will apply this function to the batch of our loop, and so what we'll do is just eligibility trace applied to the batch of our for loop. All right, so that gets us the inputs and the targets. But in PyTorch, there is always something more we have to do. And of course, this is to convert the inputs of the neural network and also the targets into some torch variables. But no worries, there is nothing new. We know how to do it. We can do it this way. We take our inputs, then our targets, and, well, they will be equal to variable inputs, that's for the inputs, and variable targets, and that's for the targets. All right? So the inputs of the brain are converted into some torch variables, and the targets also are converted into some torch variables. So now we can get the input into the neural network, and why do we need to do this? That's because the next step is to get the predictions. We have the input, we have the target. Now, of course, we need our predictions because then what happens is that we will compute the loss between the predictions and the targets. So let's get these predictions. To get them, well, again, this is so simple now. We just need to take our brain, which is CNN, our convolutional neural network, and apply it to our inputs. There we go. The inputs go into the neural network and the neural network will output the predictions. Perfect, so now we have the predictions, we have the targets, so we can get the loss. And that's the next step. We're gonna introduce a new variable because right now we're gonna get the loss error, which is different than the loss function because we use the loss function to get the loss error. So loss error here, and that we will get it with the loss function applied to our predictions and the targets. There we go. See how everything is smooth now? Everything is logical. We get the input first, the targets. Then thanks to the inputs, we get the predictions. And then thanks to the predictions and the targets, we get the loss error. So very logical and smooth. And now what is the next step? 
Well, same logical path. Now that we have the loss, we can back propagate this loss error back into the neural network to update the weights. And we do that with stochastic gradient descent. And to perform stochastic gradient descent, we need our optimizer, but we already got it here, our atom optimizer. But now at this point, remember what we have to do? We have to initialize it. And to initialize it, remember we take our optimizer object and then we apply the zero grad method. There we go, we don't forget the parenthesis. That initializes it. And now next step is to back propagate the loss error back into the neural network. And to do this, well, we take our loss error and we apply on it the backward method. So that's exactly to apply backward propagation. And then finally, now that the loss error is back propagated into the neural network, well, we can update the weights with stochastic gradient descent. And to do this, remember, we take our optimizer and then we apply the step method. There we go. The weights are now updated. As I told you, not only we already did it, but now it seems so simple and so natural. So now we're going to do something fun. We are going to print the average reward every epoch. So you know we can keep track of how the AI is going, how the training is going. We want to see the average reward increasing over the steps, over the epochs. And uh, at first, of course, there is this exploration phase, so the average reward might not increase at the beginning, but then once it reaches the exploitation phase, then we'll see the average reward definitely increase. And it will increase up to a certain level, which is when it reaches the vest as fast as possible. So let's start with the print. You know, we are doing this in one epoch, so we have to go back to the loop here. Print, and then we're going to print, well, first epoch, a colon, then percent %s, because we're going to convert everything into a string, that's better. And then we're going to add the average reward, and then we add percent %s as well. Then we're going to close the quote, and then we add a percent and on the other side, you know, we input the variables that are going to be this first percent s, that is the epoch here, and this second variable corresponding to the average reward, which we will compute right now. So the average reward variable doesn't exist yet. We're going to create it right now. So we are going to use str epoch. Even if epoch is a number, we will convert that into a string. That's better. And we're going to add str, that's going to be the average reward. And so we're going to create a variable that we're going to call avg reward. And now we're going to create this variable and compute it. Okay, so let's do this. That's the only thing we have to do left. So epoch we already have. Now let's compute average reward and we need to compute it right here, still in the epoch loop, but out of the batch loop. Because now we have our batch sampled and we have our training happening in the batch. But now the forward propagation plus the backward propagation is done in the batch. So we are getting back into the epoch loop and we can now compute the cumulative rewards, which we can do with our nth steps object. Because our nth steps object contains this function, reward steps, that allows us to get the cumulative rewards happening in the steps, you know, during the nth steps run. So we are going to use it right now to update the new rewards of the steps and then we will update the moving average object by adding the cumulative rewards to the moving average object and then recomputing the average. And that's how we're going to get the average reward. So let's do this. The first thing we need is the rewards that are updated. So let's call them rewards steps. And then, as we said, we take our n steps object, which was, I remind, created here an object of the end step progress class from our experience replay file. So end steps object, then we add rewards steps and then some parentheses. All right, so that will get us the new cumulative rewards of the steps. All right, but then we need to add these new cumulative rewards in our moving average object. And to do this, we have a method, this time in the moving average class, which is this add method. So that's very simple. We take our moving average object, which we created here with 100 steps. Then we're going to use our add method. And then 
in the add method we input our reward steps. And this will add the rewards of the steps into the moving average. All right, and finally, we can compute the average reward. And that is, well, you know, that's the same variable here. So that's what is going to be equal to the average reward. And to get it, we just need to use the average method this time from our moving average object. And that is, we do na.average, just like that, because our moving average was already updated with the new reward steps that we just added thanks to the add method. Great, so now we have our average reward, so that will populate here, and this is going to be printed every epoch. All right, so we're done. So I'm so excited to see the results, and actually, I'm gonna have a surprise for you in the next tutorial while watching the results, so it's gonna be pretty exciting. And so now I guess it's time to play with the AI and have fun. All right, so prepare yourself a good coffee or a good tea. Now it's time to sit comfortably in our chair and watch some very cool videos of our AI playing Doom. So let's do that in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy AI.